Welcome, everyone. I am steadfast, and I am no longer muted. Uh, <laughs> smooth start to bring us in on the day. Uh, I am joined, as you can see, once again by Fear Dragon. Fear Dragon, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite wonderful today, Dave. I got the notice I was going to get to cast some European and North American StarCraft today. I also heard that I was going to be with you today. I tried to get rid of you by poisoning some of your food to make you sick. Apparently, you have so much passion that you showed up anyways. But, you know, what can I say? I tried. Yeah, um, I'm definitely feeling a little bit under the weather, as you alluded to. Uh, <laughs> the the poison only partially took, you know? It, it knocked <laughs> me out, but not completely. But that's okay, that's okay, because we have some great matches coming up for us today. Uh, as you mentioned, we are doing the... Or did I mention? I don't know. We, you can see the delirium's already kicked in. Uh, <laughs> it's a fun day, Dave. It's going to be so fun. Uh, we've already got a bunch of matches today, but I, I should, you know, intro the sponsors, because, of course, without them, we wouldn't be able to have this whole thing. So, big thank you, of course, to Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy... Uh, the U.S. Air Force, and the ESL Shop. Uh, so thank you to those sponsors. But yeah, we're going to take a look at the Skeddy for today and see what we got on the docket. Look so, at this guy, so hip, calling it the Skeddy. Like, I man, got, dude, I'm just so ready to, to commentate some 20-year-old, some young 20-somethings <laughs> playing StarCraft. And I feel like you're already getting into that vibe, man. Oh, Let's yeah. Get in, tell me about that Skeddy, Dave. Oh, I've got the skibbity, skibbity bop or whatever the, the kids say or something like that. Uh, so today's Skeddy <laughs> features a bunch of the middle players. And that's not to say they're better than, you know, the bottom, worse than the top. It just means that they have lost and won some of their series. Of course, the way the Swiss format works is it's three either way. With uh, three wins, you are in. And with three losses, you are out. And you can see with that handy dandy little green and red uh, circles. We've got a couple of matches starting off where it's players uh, who are, I guess, on the cusp of advancing. I was going to say threatening mm -hmm. to advance, but that's a that's a weird way of putting it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, we're starting I, off. In, oh, sorry. Go on. In a war scenario, threatening to advance is a very valid way of putting it, I guess. Actually, yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess it is like uh, it is a war simulator that we we kind of, you know, have the whole thing. Uh, these these warring factions going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, it starts off with Hero Marine Shadown. Uh, then we go into Gung Fu Banda Harstam. Then we follow it up with another one of the Shopify Rebellion lads in the form of Lambo Christianer, a Laser Mana, another PvP to follow it up with Goblin and Skillis, and then our, I believe, only elimination match of the day in the EU region in the form of Strange Battleby, which is one I'm really looking forward to. Uh, and then let's take a look at the NA region. Why don't you uh, Why don't you talk about this one a little bit? Yeah, so the North American region, we're going to be starting it off with two of, I would say, the top players in North America. we got Estrella and Trigger, those PvP legends who are going to be duking it out. This is actually going to be a lot of fun. I know they were even, like, Triggers went and spent time with Estrella in Southern California and stayed with him for a little bit. So I, there's a whole lot of stuff we'll be able to go into when we get into that. Dolan versus Cham is going to be another fun one as both of those players are sitting one and one. And it's also worth mentioning North America running a little bit behind compared to Europe. So Europe where I think are on round four, North America, we're still just entering round three. And that means that no players are getting eliminated today, but one of the players for Australia versus Trigger is going to advance. Outside of that, everything else is going to be just kind of advancing each other's, you know, wins or losses and stuff. So Eric versus Eggs, a little Latin American showdown. And then Special versus Maples, which I think may be a tough match for Maples, but we'll see. Maples has been cooking some stuff. He's already got one of those Ws on the board. So I'll, I'll, I'm excited to see what's going to be happening in North America as well, Dave. Yeah, we actually casted that one, and it was honestly kind of a banger. Uh, we had this very cool match between Maples and Disc, where I think both of us looked at that one and we were like, Disc is the heavy favorite here. Like, he's, yeah. he's, it might get a little bit scary, but he should take this one down. And uh, Maples, nah, he showed up guns a blazing and, you know, performed great in the macro game, was able to stave off the cheese from, or not even cheese, but like the, the one base all in from Disc in game three. And yeah, just very impressed overall. 
But let's switch things back up to our upcoming match right now, which is going to be Hiromreen versus uh, Shadown. And I yeah. think with that, I think we're we're just about ready to, to kick things off. Yeah, what do you say? Yeah, I'm definitely excited for this. I think we're ready to get started as soon as the players are ready. But uh, just to quickly note, we have already had a hot couple of rounds again for both these players. And it's worth mentioning that Shadown, everyone will probably look at this, including even Shadown, saying, all right, there's an underdog and an overdog. The underdog come into this is Shadown. He is going up against Big Gabe, the Gabekeeper. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is kind of slightly working maybe in Shadown's favor is that here Marine has played three of his rounds. All three of them have been versus Protoss players. Four Jumi, Goblin, and Spats. Uh, Goblin even managed to defeat Hero Marine. I'm not saying that just having three examples of Gabe's TVP is enough to dissect him and defeat him or anything, but Shadon has also been playing pretty well. He managed to beat DNS and Wayne. I like actually the idea that Shadon can come into this match feeling a little bit more prepared, having a little bit more to study from, and potentially be able to pull off a little bit of an upset here. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's definitely not a lack of source material when it comes to Gabe's yeah. TVP, but it is worth noting that, that that could play a really big factor. But we're going to get into things here. We're going to be following Mapu's camera right off the bat as we intro, spawning down in the bottom left for Mao Sports. It is Hero Marine. Map is awake and alert. He is. I, I threw a curveball there. We didn't discuss this beforehand. <laughs> yeah. Starting up here at the top right hand side of the map, we have our blue Protoss player representing Platinum Heroes. He is Shadone. I was uh, making a joke that Mapu is alert because Mapu, of course, he gets the notice that we're starting the uh, show and everything, and he can hear us, of course, in his ear. But. He doesn't actually have to do anything for the first, you know, seven, eight minutes or 10 minutes or something as we're just talking about the schedule and mm. talking about all the matches, talking about the sponsors and everything. So sometimes I wonder, I'm like, is there a chance that Mapu has just completely tuned us out as we ramble on about food poisoning and <laughs> big game and all these other things? And he's just completely forgotten that we've already hopped into the game. But no, he's, he's always attentive in there. Yeah. He is, he is a consummate professional, and obviously that, uh, well, you, you don't get to be one of the best observers of all time. You know what I'd actually like to see? Can we get a ranked observer list? I think that sounds great. I Oh, and look at that. <laughs> Map was just like, oh, let me just, let me just boost my <laughs> rankings right now. Yeah, that was beautiful. Oh, oh. my God. Can... Can we? Did we pay Shadone to build that proxy by the sponsor logo? <laughs> right. Oh my God, is perfect. Right next to the sponsor <laughs> logos. Right next to that like uh, drive-in where they've yeah, I feel got. Yeah, like he's uh... getting some kickback from those sponsors, man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh wow, this is great. I, I thought that was going to be uh, maybe a proxy Stargate, proxy Robo. This is very bold. Now Big Gabe will get in here. Should be able to get enough of a scout to see that there's a pylon missing. Bah, maybe not actually, no. That could just be behind the mineral line. That is not enough information, and it's two Robos. Okay, Ooh. one Robo, kind of wild. Two Robos, we are cooking. This is fascinating. I cannot wait to see how this is actually going to pan on out. Like you said, your Marine has seen enough information to maybe suspect that there is a potential proxy or something. If you're able to get in far enough, you can kind of identify that there's like a lack of pylons or something, but... There is a lot of the base in the main base that you actually didn't end up Ooh. scouting. So there's a chance that you might just be thinking, well, the, the second pylon is behind the main mineral line or something. So is he actually going to go around and scout? He is scouting around a little bit now, but not near the proxy just yet. Oh, man, he's pretty close, but he Ooh. doesn't see it. And you can have this subconscious thing in your mind where even though you can't tag that watchtower right away, you might just be thinking to yourself, I, you know, I, um... My opponent will never put it beside the proxy. I think this is actually a full wall off, though. And I think this is actually going to affect pathing around the structures. But I don't think Big Gabe has necessarily noticed yet. Let's take a look at his base and see what he's got. He's going for a Widow Mine. He did open up with a quick Cyclone, but I don't know. I think if you knew what this was, you would go Viking. 
you would absolutely not be going for that medevac. And this looks already very scary. Will Shadown spot this Widowmine if he can bait out the shot? Oh no, Ooh. that's gonna go in the wind. Oh! oh my God. It's a disaster day, but the, I think the one bright side is there's two Robos. You can still continue to produce more things like a War Prism, but these two Immortals are going to have such a hard time surviving. They have oh. to get the damage on SCVs, body blocking so that the Cyclone can maximize its damage. No repair on the Cyclone just yet, but the Marines are going to be enough to start pushing these Immortals further and further back into the wall. Really great target fire right there from Shadown. But yeah, Marines, they are very good against the Immortals. And oh, nice job right there with the body block. Shadown was able to turn this into some trades, but this has been spotted out. It did not get its first shock, like, huge value. Obviously, having to rebuild that War Prism is a disaster. That Widowmine, I mean, that's a Widowmine you put in a museum for Terrans. <laughs> that is truly the MVP Widowmine. If this game ends up one-sidedly for Hero Marine, it's going to be because of that one widow mine. Nice micro here with the immortal, with the stalkers. There's also an observer there to provide high ground vision, but also the war prism. So, Shadow's covered on that front. The shield battery is getting knocked down. The low ground hurts, and two stalkers end up dying over there. A zealot is also going to yeah. end up dying. And this is so unfortunate. I feel like Shadow's just losing too many units. He is losing a lot of units for a little bit there. That was starting to look real scary for Big Gabe. He lost the siege tank. Oh no, the stalkers are body blocked. Ah, oh. uh, that's okay. Well, th okay. That that really, really takes the wind out of the sails. This is obviously very committed with two robotics facilities on the other side of the map. Shadown is still, you know, he's still on a decent economy and he's still pumping probes. And it looks like even with him starting to mine out these minerals, he's gearing up to take a third base. But this is not done enough. Not even not even particularly close to doing enough. Yeah. I, I, I'm i really worried for Shadown here. Yeah, and to contextualize this, because people may look at, like you said, a potential third base or something that could come up from Shadown, and the fact that the economy isn't actually looking that terrible for a all-in for Shadown. 45 workers isn't amazing, but... Well, we'll see. Actually, hold on. Hold that thought, because it seems like we are going to have another pushing over here. Immortal's getting quite a bit of damage done. Picking off a couple more of these SCVs as well. Siege Tank about to siege up, though. And this is where those Stalkers are going to start falling so, so quickly. The Immortal oh. falls as well. The Stalkers are getting decimated. And Hero Marine finally takes a supply lead. I was going to say, Dave, to your point, the third base and everything, it makes it seem like maybe it's okay. But if Shadon gives up ground, if he has yeah. to evacuate and return home, he loses two robotics facilities. That is absolutely brutal for a Protoss player. It really is, and there's not a whole lot of production behind it, and he's got even that one gateway there. This is, yeah, and there's that stim finishing up. Th this was kind of a timing that I didn't get a chance to allude to. Oh, that's a big stim, but I, at this point, it doesn't even matter. Yeah, there's, there's not enough units to contest, and even without the combat shields, this will be, obviously, that production going down. Shadown lost so much even before this. Uh, what what can you possibly do if Hero Marine just decides to go across the map? I don't think that there's anything, and that's why Shadown's only option is use the War Prison to buy time. Honestly, maybe even you warp in aggressively over here or something, because that's yeah, you the have only to force the army if back. Marine, it, yeah, it, warping it back at home, that's not going to be able to actually help hold off that army right now. No, no, it's not. And uh, I actually think you are you are dead on right there. Maybe if your Marine doesn't go for it, or, or sorry, commits on the other side of the map, and then you, you know, you manage to go for that warp in aggressively. Oh, battery overcharge got depowered for a moment there. But there's there's just so many siege tanks here. Even with a lot yeah. of shield battery healing, it's just... If, the Marine count is getting pretty low. He does step up one of the siege tanks, but loses the Immortal in the process. Yeah. You know, there's like a moment there where you think, oh, what happens if he actually manages to kill the Marines off? The reinforcements are a little bit delayed because of the War Prison harassment that was happening earlier. But yeah, this definitely ends up being too much. Shadon's going to have to evacuate. The other problem is he doubled down on trying to defend the third base specifically. Yeah. So all the shield batteries are over there. Imagine if instead he had to try and defend like his natural expansion and he was able to get an aggressive warp in from like the uh to the side of the low ground came with some zealots on the left hand side while the rest of the army kind of pushed in from down the ramp maybe there's something there but i understand he felt like he had to secure that third base he felt like he could not give it up and unfortunately big game man that one little mine yeah 
yeah, that, that widow mine crushed his dreams right from the get-go. Like completely yeah. took the wind out of the sails of that attack and, and really, really just, God, that, that is the worst way to start a series. Like that is, you have this build, it goes unscouted. The setup is actually pretty good for you because like I said, there was no Viking. Uh, Widow Mine, yes, it was in a good position, but it was also in a good position where if Shadown had noticed it to bait out the mine shot with a dropped mm -hmm. immortal. And then, you know, that early factory unit ends up being null. Uh, the Cyclone, while it's good, it's against a War Prism kind of chasing it around and with an awkward SimCity, maybe that gets sniped. That game, that game kind of, not completely, because there were still opportunities, but it kind of ended for Shadown before it could ever really get going. Yeah, exactly. And it's so unfortunate there because, like you said, so much of the start went so well there for Shadown. And frankly, given how bad that start was of the Warp Prism and both of the first two Immortals dying for, I think it was like four SCVs and maybe a very, very small number of those Marines. At the end of the day, we ended up seeing a situation where Shadown still somehow made like a few kind of weirdly close moments happen. And then yeah. it's like, imagine if he had had two more immortals in that one war prism still alive added in for all of those little follow-up pushes all those little follow-up pieces of damage and everything it's a very i mean actually it would be potentially three immortals because you have to make another war prism with some of that robotic ability time you could have had an extra immortal and also the two extra immortals that would have been picked off like that's massive there was a, a real potential there yeah i i actually do agree um, and even, I, I want to continue and follow up on your point, because I, I want to explore the base trade option of what could have potentially happened there, but let's get into it. Let's talk about what happens, well, here on Dynasty, as we have spawning down on the bottom left for Mouse Sports. He's up 1-0. He is one map away from his punching his ticket into the playoffs. It's Hero Marine. And despite being disappointed that you didn't make Mapu wait until the two-minute mark to introduce the players, we're going to be moving up here in the top right-hand side of the map on top of the blue Protoss player. He is Platinum Heroes' Shadown. And a couple things I want to note. Um, Shadown has now opened up gas first in both games. So obviously that enables some interesting tech timings, and we saw it very much so in game number one. In game two, I wonder if this will maybe go for a Stargate which I do think is a really great way to play Dynasty uh, because there's so many little push avenues and just being able to, you know, keep tabs on that, whether it be with an Oracle for Revelation or Phoenixes and just being able to kind of outmaneuver these little weird valleys and whatnot on the map is really, really helpful. But yeah, I want to I wanna go back to game number one a little bit because I think you're actually onto something. Even with only two gates for the aggressive warpin, we looked at what Hero Marine had and pulled into that little army, that little counterattacking army. If there's a warp in aggressively, even like two zealots or two more, like a stalker and a sentry or something, I do wonder if he could have initiated a funky little base trade, given up the third base, and then actually had a chance to make that interesting. I think it's still going to be like a really low win percentage, but I think it's his best possible option from that spot. Yeah, may maybe it was, and I don't blame Shadown for not thinking of that in that moment either. Like, even if it was maybe the bus option, I'm not even sure, honestly. It's such a crazy thing to do after such an awkward start for the game where yeah. things are just not going the way that you wanted. Your shield batteries also could have potentially gotten up if you kept that War Prism alive. The War Prism also, I, I feel like I'm about to sound really silly, but I'm going to blame, like, the fact that this is the first game of the day and we're still kind of warming up. I don't think a War Prism dies with just a single Widow Mine shot. I'm no, not it crazy doesn't. on that. Like, it does not. So it was, it's even the fact that the the Widow Mine hit the War Prism and there was a little bit extra damage after that was just enough to kill the War Prism. Well, it's like what all happened, those little things. What happened is the Cyclone got like a single lock on and yeah. then the Widow Mine hit. So the Widow Mine got credited with the kill, but it was the Cyclone that was, uh, that should have won best supporting <laughs> actor on that one. That was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do want to talk about this game really quick because yes. we do actually have a fun opening here from Hero Marine. Of course, it's on Shadow's side, just a target opening, but we do have, and now we have four Reapers uh, as well as like the Cyclone coming across the map, or Cyclone coming out, I should say, and the Hellions coming across the map with those yes. four Reapers. So, going to be looking to get some good damage here because he saw the in base goal did not get taken. This is an amazing situation, though, on paper for Shadow, opening up Oracle first. Oh, he gets his ankles broken, though. 
Oh man, Hero Marine kind of baiting that uh, Oracle to the side, forcing the Pulsar Beam to get turned on. And Shadown doesn't get even a single unit for that. You you want to get, I think, at least at minimum one unit, if not like two or three, uh, because these units do pack a punch. Good job dodging the grenades. And of course, the wall plus the shield battery means that Hero Marine can't get in anyways. But whenever you turn on that Oracle's Pulsar Beam against units that can't shoot up, it is a it is a bit of a demoralizing thing to get none of those units on the kill. It's very, it very frustrating. It definitely sucks. He's gonna be able to at least pick up a single SCV kill over here, not taking too much damage on that Oracle. Confirms the sighting of the gold base. And I'll also say, it is a good thing in feeling that you have pushed back the Reaper Hellion push, because sometimes those units just manage to sneak their way in between your gateways, especially when your wall isn't exactly complete at that point. So uh, I, I think Shadown probably, yeah, it'd be nice if he would be able to kill something off, but I'm sure he's still happy that he's not taking too much damage or anything so far, but we'll see if that is going to stay true for the, the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think the emphasis is on so far in that statement uh, because this four Marine Cyclone drop into the main base is already going to kill a Stalker. The units that are still alive in the natural, even with the shield battery here, that'll get burned through pretty quickly. A lot of lost mining time, four probes going down. Honestly, could have been so much worse. So easily, so much worse. I, I still actually kind of like this for Shadown. Hero Marine is on a gold base at the moment, though. But Shadown's gold is only about 10, 15 seconds away from completing. Oh, can he get away with this meta back? Oh yes. My oh, oh my god, if that pylon were just a little bit further to the left, that would not have been a slow warp in pylon. And instead, now it's a dead stalker. Oh, he just before Blink, man. too. That's, that's almost unfair how magical <laughs> Gabe managed to make that happen. He was cornered in by like eight stalkers in between the main and the natural. He managed to bait the stalkers to the natural by kind of juking the medevac in that direction, then ran back up, unloaded two marines sacrificially. Shadow didn't take the bait, but he still ends up getting out and then, yeah, like you said, kills a uh, single stalker that's warping in. That was just incredibly well done by your marine, my god. Yeah, yeah, and good job from Hero Marine to recognize that it was a slow warp in pylon because you can mm -hmm. just see that see that stalker warping in and just be like, ah, I got to get out of here. But it's that little bit of extra attention that he shows that uh, gets a lot of value there. Now, Blink is done for Shadown. And as I mentioned, this is still a pretty good setup for him. Able to pick off a Marauder right there. We've got a triple Adept on the right side. That's going to find an SCV, force a little bit of lost mining time on the gold. And I mean, Shadown, I, I, he is going to obviously have to deal with this big push that is going to be coming in. Actually, hold that thought. These, these Reapers are still alive and they're still going to be a little bit of a hassle. Can I get more probes? No, it doesn't look like it. Blink, blink. There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if Shadon realizes what he's going to be up against at this point because he knows that there's just the gold base. There's no third base that's really seeming to be floating down or anything. He's seen the Marauder count. Oh, loses track of the stalkers for a split second. Those Marauders pack a punch, so you really don't have any time before you need to start blinking away. The mm. depths are going to finally get pushed back. He's going to end up losing maybe one or two more stalkers here. No, keeps them alive. Well, oh, oh Reaper those ambush Reapers. doesn't keep them alive. This is why I'm I'm like, these Reapers staying alive have gained so much value. And this is why I was like, ah, it's really annoying that he didn't get even one of those early units oh, to start things off. Isn't done yet. Charge is not done. Yeah, this is this is rough. Now, there's not a whole lot actually here for Hero Marine. And with battery overcharge behind this, oh, Stasis Ward? Even a single Marauder being brought out of the fight is kind of worth it for Shadown. But Hero Marine is going to have a lot of sustain with this push with that, that next set of reinforcements coming in. And can Shad Shadown can warp across this, right, with charge lots? Uh, you can, but do you really want to warp in yeah. to your opponent's face? Like, Because uh, the then you have to blink forward to, secure, or to support them. Yeah. What is Shadown? Is oh, he's coming in from the bottom side. There it is. That's what he was looking for. All right. And that is actually going to be a lot of medevacs going down as well as a lot of bio. Shadown gets himself a fantastic cleanup, even grabbing the Raven. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I was looking for from Shadown. And wow, he just uh, he just kind of crushed that. Oh, here, right. Oh, what are we doing getting into the medevac right there? He uses the doodad. Oh, that was a great, great use of doodad. Yeah. Here we're going to be able to get out of there with some units, but this third base is going to be a little bit harder to defend. Now, the Stalkers and the Zealots are in decent enough numbers that this is still kind of threatening, but Siege Tank up on the high ground is really going to change the numbers there. 
It is going to force Shadow back, and Shadow's going to at least feel pretty secure the fact that he managed to defend his three base setup. He's going to be able to rotate around over to the gold base rather quickly and potentially put on some pressure here. There's no Siege Shank over here either, so the bunker's kind of annoying, but I, yeah, still takes a little while to get that Ooh. Siege Shank up, and Siege Shank needs to be repaired. Oh, nice repair right there from Big Gabe. That, it looked like for a second he had sieged it just a hex or two too far forward, but with that mass repair, he's able to get the... Why well, he's able to get the repair and keep it alive and uh, hold the position. Even draws a couple of Shadown Stalkers in to their death. Uh, at, wow, three Stalkers for five SCVs. That's actually very expensive on the trade for Shadown, even though it's a gold base. Uh, we do have the Storm follow-up into very quick Robotics Bay. This is... This is... Talk about hedging your bets on this one. How many High Templar do we have warped in? None. No High Templars. Army is... Oh, okay. Seven Stalkers, 25 Zealots. For some reason, I had uh, face blindness on the Zealots on the unit tab, and I'm like, how does he only have seven Stalkers? I swear, I swear I've seen 20 Zealots on the map. I have. That is so much bio. Oh, that is a lot of bio. The Zealots, oh my god, are going to be obliterated for a moment there with the Widowmine connections, but the Widowmines, I mean, they are going to be able to take off the shields, but the shield battery overcharge does heal up some of them. This is just not large enough army, though, for Shadow, and he's going to have a very hard time defending this gold base right now, but the army is stimming up quite a bit right now. It is, and if the Archons get on top of this, this could be very expensive for Hero Marine. Target fire on the Metabax is going to be good. We've got the Archons being targeted down as well, but that means the Zealots and Stalkers really go to town. Hero Marine is still ahead in supply. Ooh, scan right there on the Observer. It does actually get killed by the Widow Mine, but did provide detection to get the kill first. Plus two weapons will complete in a moment for Shadown, but I think Hero Marine has kind of begun the snowball. There is one Colossus just now hitting the field, but uh, he needed that about 30 seconds earlier, and it would have been a very different scenario. However, Hero Marine will get the break on this position. He might not actually be able to kill the gold easily because he'd have to like fly some medevacs over, but at the very least, he's denying all the mining here. Yeah, and eventually he will whittle away at the hit points of that Nexus with those Marauders that uh, do have awesome weapons and everything. So it's kind of a weird situation. I do like that there's a counterattack of these Zealots on the south side of the map. The mineral ah. patches have also been mostly mined out, so the Zealots can actually get in on top of that Siege Shank, on top of the bunker, and get some good damage done over here. Some counter damage that he really desperately needs. Yeah, this repair on the bunker, oh, it is just barely going to be enough. That looked like it might have gone down, but it will end up surviving. Nexus on the oh. other side does fall. That's a huge Widow Mine shot. And it's actually... Oh, ha, that was funny. That turned it into a slow warp in Pylon by killing the Nexus. And then Hero Marine manages to get the cancel on the warp in as a result. Which is funny because it, it, I think it actually makes the Zealots get into the fight faster. Because now they can warp into a different Pylon that's not slow. Uh, very funny unintended consequence. But Hero Marine has definitely carved out a little lead for himself. Shadown is still on a decent economy though. Yeah, I mean, he still actually has, like you said, those three bases. Now, fourth still kind, kind of coming on up in the bottom right-hand side of the map. So, I don't feel like Shadon is down and out of this just yet, especially with the Colossus and the five High Templars that he now has out on the map. Ghosts are still out there for Hero Marine, and this is a very nice pickup. I also want to note, just look at the positioning of how Hero Marine can just push into the bottom right-hand side. It's actually, they're both scarily close to each other. They are very scarily close to each other. You know, we do have a lot of Marines in this army. They are very far back, but that storm is huge. Three ghosts just started up here for, oh, well, just popped out, I should say, for Hero Marine. And there they are. They're going to look to land some big EMPs. Storm does discourage Hero Marine from coming in here. I don't know that Shadown... Okay, well, now we should see the ghosts, I'm pretty sure. I think up until that moment, he hadn't necessarily seen them and might be thinking, I have uncountered tech. Now is my time to go, but... As he realizes there's ghosts on the field, he's going to be a lot more careful, gets those High Templar into the War Prism. Yep, that's going to help protect them against those EMPs for a little bit, but the Vikings in the air are going to be taking away some of the health points on those Colossus. Colossus getting some good damage done. Archons not able to get a whole lot done. The War Prism does end up falling. Uh, storms are blanketing this army, though, and it seems like just with sheer gateway units, Shadow may actually have enough to push on through a little bit more, just barely. Uh, it is going to be a lot of bio surviving. There's not a lot of energy on these medevacs, but it's just barely enough to push this army back. The Archons... The Archons pack a punch if they're able to survive, but those ghosts do so much work to them. That was a really dynamic fight. Uh, Hero Marine, I don't think he recognized 
that his main target maybe should have been that war prism with the Vikings. Because if he does <laughs> click that down, the storms never go through, and that fight looks a lot more one-sided. But Shadown was able to land some really big storms there and made that fight a lot closer than you would have expected. And he's still very much in this game at this moment. Yeah, I, this is... I feel like going to become like a tougher and tougher situation now. The Colossus looks oh. like it's going to get picked off. Another one of the High Templars gets picked off. The supply differential is starting to show its face. And I would say very importantly, Hero Marine kept alive this fourth base. This has been a game that has been chaotic. It's been kind of back and forth. But Hero Marine is going to start now getting the kickback from the economy. He's going to be getting his plus two weapons and actually finally going to be climbing a little bit ahead in those upgrades. And I feel like he's kind of hit this stabilization point. He hasn't really been able to for a while in this game. Yeah, uh, it's he got that plus one armor quite a bit later than we usually see. He didn't start it right up after the plus one attack. And as a result, uh, it has meant his upgrades have lagged behind a little bit. We are going to see Hermione trying to chase this army down and he will get that Colossus extremely mm -hmm. low. But uh, Hero Marine is a merciful god and will leave oh. it alive. Says, instead, I want the fresh one. Gets that one yeah. on an awkward rally. Vikings don't actually have a ton of HP and will just barely get uh, taken down before the Colossus falls. That's actually a huge deal right here. Shadow may be able to turn this fight as a result of that one surviving Colossus. Yeah, a lot of the ghosts actually the ghosts? ended up falling over there. And another two ghosts end up falling. There's only one ghost with this army right now. That was a massive set of pickups that I really think Shadow needed because he had lost so many of his tech units. He lost so many of his Colossus. He, all of his High Templars are gone from the map. I mean, whether they just turned into Archons or if they actually just got picked off. Shadon seemed like he was in a little bit of trouble there, but resetting the Ghost count and the Viking count for Hero Marine was really big. Yeah, uh, and not to mention the final Ghost that's on the field actually EMP'd the Stalkers and whiffed on the way out. So it's, it's basically just a regular combat unit. You see Shadon taking a great position on Hero Marine. Disruptor Shot gets a couple of units. It's not huge. This Disruptor Shot from the back will get dodged. The Colossus finally goes down. Shadown is still very much fighting hard here. Oh, that's a great Liberator on the uh, natural expansion to defend against those Zealot runbys. Shadown doing the, the classic Protoss uh, all, all or nothing upgrade setup <laughs> where it's only attack upgrades and he does finish up his plus three weapons. Vikings wandering forward a little bit here. We are going to see the bio forced to kite back, but Shadown, I, considering how much momentum... Oh, big EMP is on the army. But yeah, Disruptor are, will force it back. Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, those are very big EMPs. This counterattack, though, is going to be absolutely brutal because now Shadon has to win a big fight here. But at the end of the day, Bioforce against just pure gateway, if the Disruptors are not able to get their shots off, you see what happens. You see how your Marines take control of everything. And at the same time in the natural expansion, these Marines, these Marauders are depowering gateways. They're taking out probes. They're going to be able to take out tech soon. But Shadon can't afford to do anything but warp in at the front lines because if he doesn't, he's just going to end up losing his most important base. Yeah, this is this is just so difficult at this point. Shadon has really been fighting hard from a, a down position for a lot of this game. And he certainly created chances for himself. But Hero Marine, with that run by into the natural, has killed <laughs> so much of his opponent's economy. His bio force is so low on HP. Even one Archon Blast would be huge right here. But even if with that, yeah, it's not going to be enough. Hero Marine's army, his relentless aggression will win out, and he will make it into the next round. He is, he's heading to the playoffs. That is indeed what's going to be the case, as a 3-1 to one is enough to qualify for that next stage. And I want to actually say, like, of course, congratulations to Hero Marine. He clearly played that out really well and everything, but... Man, Shidon really impressed me. I know that it's unfortunate because if the people who look on Liquipedia or something, they look at the bracket and they say, oh, okay, it was a 2-0, kind of what you would maybe expect there for Hyrmine versus Shidon. But Shidon showed a lot of potential in that series. Both of the first games, cheese that almost could have been if the one thing didn't go wrong of the War Prison getting sniped off by the Widow Mine, it really seemed like Shidon, that could have almost been like a 2-0. There's a world where that was a 2-0 for Shadon instead of Hero Marine. I'm not saying that second game was going incredibly, incredibly well for Shadon at any particular point, but it seemed like he was doing really, really well in that game, and there was a potential he could have won that. 
Absolutely there was. I actually went back to, um, so there was a moment right around the 14 minute mark where uh, I didn't get a chance to click on the High Templar, but I, I saw that it had a fair bit of energy and I was like, I think that's ready to storm. And I went back and checked, it had 82 energy as snipes were lining up on it. There was a lot of low health Marines in that army. There was like three Vikings in the orange. If he lands that big storm, he decimates that army and considering how close the following like three to four minutes at the end of the game was, uh, maybe the next two minutes, that actually might have been enough to allow Shadown to really take control of that position. All of a sudden, he's denying the rest of the mining on the gold base. He's got disruptors set up on a high ground that is, Gabe is just really uncomfortable. The upgrades were not overwhelmingly in one side or the other. Like, I, I really think we were one storm away from that being a completely different game number two. And uh, yeah, game one, obviously, that Widow Mine was <laughs> pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but that was a that was a banger. And I got to agree with you, the 2-0 does not really represent the score, or sorry, the 2-0 scoreline does not really represent how well Shadown played. Uh, and he was just a couple of moves away from this being a much, much closer series on the scoreboard. For now, though, we are going to head to a little break. And we will be back after... Well, we will be back after this. Don't go anywhere. Just give me one moment, actually. We'll be back after this. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. After a banger of a game, no, well, banger of a game number two, I would say. Game one was game one was a little bit more sad than anything, I would say. Uh, I still enjoyed game number one because there was a lot of excitement leading up until the first moment where anything <laughs> happens. Once, once they once they got into each other's business. Yeah, then then the the excitement kind of was sucked out of the room by that widow mine a little bit, but it was a it very was, cool setup. Yeah, it was like seeing a trailer for a movie that looked absolutely incredible and you just get really hyped for that movie. Mm. But then as soon as you actually go see the movie, it kind of disappointed. But there was <laughs> oh, hi, so Mark. much potential based on that trailer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh unfortunately, they ran out of money after the trailer. Uh and so it got <laughs> it got like instantly shut down. Uh, reminder as well, by the way, you can attend the tournament that this is feeding into because this is a regional qualifier for DreamHack Dallas, ESL Masters at DreamHack Dallas. You can get your tickets today. That is taking place, I believe it is May 30th to June 2nd, I believe are the dates. Double check me on that. I'm sure someone will. Uh, but it is end of May, beginning of June. And if you use the code StarCraft, you can get your tickets uh, at 15% off for the live finals, so make sure to do that. Also, it looks good on us because they're like, oh, so people are here for StarCraft. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the honestly, offline crowd was electric in Atlanta. Honestly, the I, I do feel like being able to attend some of these Dream Acts and just be able to be in that crowd as you're watching some of the games, meeting a lot of the players, it's such a fun thing. It's the reason why I got deeper into all the StarCraft stuff, honestly. Yeah, no, for real. Uh, but uh, I think that we are getting ready to move into our next series. That is going to be Gung Fu Banda versus Hearthstone, a PvP between two players who are also sitting at a wonderful, wonderful 2-1 uh, scoreline right now. I think that it was Hearthstone who was had defeated... I'm trying to look this up again. Uh, he defeated Lambo, actually, which yeah. is really cool because in head-to-head -head matchups... Uh, Oftentimes, Lambo actually kind of does have Harstam's number a little bit, despite them being teammates, despite them talking about strategy a lot. Lambo's just seemed to kind of have the head-to-head. -head. Not completely, uh, but in especially recently, it feels like Lambo's kind of had that advantage. Uh, but Harstam winning a big match between the two of them is really nice. I, I will say, though, it's very fortunate that they got the team kill out of the way, and they aren't facing at 2-2 where it's guaranteed one win, one loss, and, you know, one player eliminates the other. So at least at least they didn't go that route. Yeah, there's definitely going to be the potential advance, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. The players, I think, are ready to play. They're, we have the, the waiting lobby music, I think, that's playing for these players as they're getting ready to get started uh, for map number one on Alcyon. But this is going to be a pretty exciting one because, again, winner advances onto the playoffs, Loser still has that shot in round number five. So it's mostly you have a lot to gain, like you were saying, Dave, but not as much to lose. It just becomes a little bit more dangerous. But I'm quite excited about this, partially because, you know, quote unquote, year of Hearthstone, all that stuff. But Gung Fu Band has also been a really fun player to see doing well. And I think that his matches were not necessarily, if you just compare them to Hearthstone's, they weren't necessarily the same, like, difficulty level, <laughs> just because Lambo and I think even like Rainer and stuff, it's really, really tough to go up against those players. Gung Fu Banda, I think he had to play Air Story and Bly, which can be very different, difficult in its own form, as well as Young Yakov. But uh, I think this is going to be a really, really big proving one for uh, Gung Fu Banda, whether or not he can make this work versus Harstam. Yeah, uh, and they have a really cool historical record against one another. Uh, we'll get into that in just a moment, but spoiler alerts, it's extremely even. Uh, and we are going to kick things off in just a moment as we get into it here on Alkyoni spawning down in the bottom left for Berserker Esports. It is Gung Fu Benda. And up in the top right hand side of the map, we have the blue Protoss player. He is Harstam, Shopify Rebellion. And Alkyoni. Alkyoni. I, yeah, as soon as you said that, I was like, okay, well, we have to match meme for meme. It's, you know, it has to, it has to happen. Uh, there's always Al Capone, Al Capone, uh, Al, Al, Al Yeah, Al C1. 
There's lots of there's lots of places you can go with that. Let's just figure out how to trigger every person in the chat. Everyone who's watching. Right? Yeah. It's it's so easy. It's so easy. Everyone's just like, but that's not how English is. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. See, Dave, and some people say that I'm a really big troll, but I feel like you you have that potential to out troll me when you want mm. to. It's I, I always like our troll offs. It's very there. There's a lot there. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of meta beneath the layers like you and I have a, a deep reach his, rich history. It's kind of like these two players. Uh, where they know each other pretty darn well, even though they haven't played the most number of series against one another. They are nine and nine in competitive series oh. and 24 and 23 in competitive maps. Just gonna check who has the advantage. It is Hearthstone by one map, but when it's that close, that one map does not matter too much. It is, th this is gonna come down a lot to mind games, to who can out execute the other and to maybe who makes more sentries. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, this has been an interesting time for PvP, but this is also already kind of a small, interesting start. We did have Hearthstone starting up a Zealot for a split second there instead of the Sentry, just because there's a chance that maybe your Nexus gets blocked on the low ground. You want to have that Zealot started on up, but I guess he felt comfortable that he didn't really need it, and he ends up going for the Sentry, Stalker Sentry opening instead. And Gung Fu Bandit is the one that I want to talk about here, because I don't see this nearly as often. A Depth Stalker. That is... I feel like it's usually double stalker. I see double adept. I see stalker sentry. I've started seeing sentry sentry. I don't see stalker adept that often. It's not super common. It's it's one that's relatively new to the metagame. And by relatively new, I mean like in the last, you know, maybe year and a half, year ago, it, it kind of came into existence. And what it allows you to do is still have the fighting power of that stalker, but you get the scouting of the adept and you can potentially force shield batteries to be built. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlikely that you're going to find the kind of damage that a double adept opener will. Almost, almost impossible, in fact. In which case, unless your um, sorry, unless your opponent really flubs the defense, in which case a double adept opening would have been really, really nice. Obviously, because you know, double the kill potential and shield batteries getting ignored. Blah blah blah. But it's it's an interesting opener. I don't know that I like it with the power of the new Sentry as much as it used to be, but it was already kind of somewhat rare as an opener anyways. Regardless, Harstam, very quick third Nexus on the way. And I'm not sure, did he actually scout the Stargate with that initial probe? Can we get a... Oh, well, never mind. He sees it now. That's that's the most important thing. He did see it. Okay. Actually, no, he saw it with a, an earlier hallucination. What am I saying? Wouldn't have been able to, to tell. Yeah. Yeah, when the Stalker Sentry went out to meet the first Adept, I think he hallucinated a Phoenix and got the scout out there. So. Yeah. Should have some information about that. And like you said, or I think kind of alluding to, the blink opening is going to be usually a pretty effective way to start opening up against someone who did go straight up into Stargate. You eventually are able to push back that uh, Oracle and potentially get the pick off there. But for now, the double Oracle can still try to poke around and find something. Oh, Harsim barely missing out on those Oracles to the Hussein Phoenix. That actually would have been a really nice scout. Just helps you uh, reposition your units even slightly better. Yeah, but uh, utilizing that new pylon vision range buff mm -hmm. and going to allow the pylons that are at the edge of this base to get that or provide that scouting information. Oh, this is cute right here. So <laughs> Gung Fu Banda has identified the very quick third base. Hasn't been able to find any value with those oracles. So instead, he is going to drop a couple of cheeky stasis wards and with the oracles not really being accounted for by Harstam here, even one or two units getting caught in that stasis trap could be big because I don't think Harstam can answer this with his full force. Yeah, this is actually really tricky because the oracles can now dive in behind the natural expansion mineral line if Harstam just sends all of his units over to that third base. And that third base doesn't even have a pile on there. Harstam can't even warp in over there defensively right now. He is building that pile on, so he eventually will be able to, but it looks like Gung Fu Band is pulling back or pulled back with his army for long enough that Harsim should have the tools he needs to defend this. Well, the interesting thing right here is that uh, Gung Fu Banda is going for, an, uh, well, he went for a very quick Immortal. He's going for a second one. He's actually going to have the Immortal showing up with this fight right now. Now, Blink oh, is wow. done. Nice job right there from Harsim baiting out the uh, the barrier on that Immortal. But this Stasis Ward, Harsim's got to be very careful. There we go. He does Blink forward mm. to trigger it. Guardian Shield getting popped by Gung Fu. Does Harstom? Okay, he One does. More. Oh, does he see it? 
I'm not sure if he did. There is the Oracles in the main base finding quite a bit of damage here. That is that is a lot of probe damage. Harstam has to be careful. Oh, I don't think he sees it. That's going to be a big one. I almost feel like... All right, that's obviously a very unfortunate one, but if Harstam can reclaim a little bit of ground over here, maybe there's a potential that that still ends up working out okay. He needs to keep these stalkers alive. He needs to keep his probes alive. Say, He's running his probes away, but he can't get through the wall. Well, I was actually going to say, I feel like a probe pull might be really good in this fight. Uh, units that don't really deal particularly well with probes specifically. Oh, please kill that immortal. Okay, he does get it. A uh, lot of probes go down, though. And that was not particularly well handled on the third base, but that is because there was the double oracle in the natural Gung Fu Banda really taxing Harstam's multitasking there. And the captain was, I mean, he was able to survive. And because he had such a quick third nexus, he's not as far behind as he could be. And he will, in fact, still have that blink timing a lot earlier. He's got an, an extra gate, he's quick into charge, and he's got a faster plus one weapons. Honestly, actually, with all that in mind, I. I still don't hate his position. I think he's still kind of fine. I, I don't think Harstam's in too bad of a spot at all because he still has some tools available. I wouldn't mind if he was getting a little bit more aggressive with his stalkers since he does just have 12 blink stalkers to say four for Gung Fu Banda. And again, Gung Fu Banda doesn't even have his blink upgrade just yet. So I wouldn't hate that, but I understand that he's also being a little bit wary about the oracles. He's also trying to expand and take his fourth face and everything right now. So maybe he feels a little bit uncertain that there's going to be maybe some big swell of units coming across the map soon or something. One thing that's really nice for Harstam here um, is the fact that he's playing two... Well, actually, he does add the third gas at the third base, but he's he's putting an extra emphasis on charge lots. And Gung Fu Banda has gone very quickly into quite a few Immortals, which is obviously great against Blink Stalkers, but will be pretty ineffective against those charge lots. Like, if... Harstam can find the army of Gung Fu Banda in a bit of an awkward position. Harstam could take a really good fight. The, and the other side of that coin is that if Gung Fu Banda doesn't move out to do something about this gold base, he's going to fall pretty far behind economically. I actually really like this from Harstam. And the main thing he wants to watch out for is this exactly from Gung Fu Banda. When or if does that Templar Archives come down? Yeah, but I think Harstam's timing is going to be hitting before that because the War Prism has now popped out. That's usually the signal for a Protoss player to start getting a little bit more aggressive. Goes through a hallucinated War Prism. It's going to send out that along the bottom side to potentially force some units to maybe even like force a recall back into the main base or something. That would be absolutely massive. But Harstam is going to hit before that hallucination, I think, is going to be arriving in that main base. I would almost like to see him wait just a second just yeah. to try and force that reaction. Uh, looks like Kung Fu Banda does have a good, a good understanding of where his opponent's army is. He's already building. Oh, that's a really nicely placed cannon. Nice little wall for it. Ah, and it does force the warp in. Zealot, only one of them getting caught by this stasis ward. Great force fields from Gung Fu. And there is an Archon in this, this fight for Gung Fu. So I think this is going to be just totally fine for him. At least in the initial wave. Harstam, though. Maybe it might be an opportunity for him to wait for plus two weapons, but instead he is going to continue teching up, continue expanding, and going to try and find maybe, uh, well, he's not going to try and find a win, but might try and find a, a little bit of a different angle at least. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very tough to make it work from that angle, especially with more Archons being made. I think that Ooh. almost ended up working out as a little Double bit of a choke point with the Nexus and everything else there. So I actually like that Harson just kind of backing off and trying to tech up. Oh, that is so huge for Harstam right there. He finally kills one of the Oracles. Those are always a threat to just gun down probes when there are two of them. One can still technically do it, but two is, of course, that one-shot potential where shield batteries can't, uh, you know, protect. Nice little blink forward from Harstam, but Gung Fu Banda on the micro. It ends up being a one-for-one -one trade. Stalkers spot this real War Prism now, but it is plus two weapons versus plus one, and that is, of course, an advantage for Harstam. Yeah. Shield Battery is going to be able to protect those uh, probes against the little stalker run by there. War Prism gets spotted out again, but the Zealous drop out and actually take care of these stalkers. The War Prism gets sniped off by the stalker warping in the main base, though. Nicely handled there by Gung Fu Banda. Yeah, nicely handled by Gung Fu, but also Harstam still able to get some value, at least with those Zealots. And I am still liking this position for Harstam quite a bit, especially with Disruptors hitting the field and Gung Fu Banda not... Not really knowing about it. Gung Fu Banda has not been able to get any relevant scouting information of his opponent's main base. 
Uh, nice Blink Forward does find the Observer, and that's big in these fights, particularly with Disruptors hitting the field. But if Harstom can keep these Disruptors hidden... Actually, did Gung Fu... Do you know if he uh, tagged the Watchtower at all here? I you know he didn't tag the Watchtower while the Disruptor was making his way forward, but I don't know if he was just on the, vi uh, the edge of vision, but now the Observer sees it. Disruptor number one gets a couple of Zealots. Not terrible, but the kind of surprise factor Ooh. is gone there. Nice Stasis Trap. It does catch a lot of these Zealots, but... Ooh. Even after the stasis trap expires, you still have to have the units there to deal with that. So Harsim is going to try and continue the pressure forward and be as annoying as possible during all this. Absolutely. Now, I do want to note that, uh, oh, this is a nice nice set of units here to deal with this for Gung Fu. That is really going to shred this army. Uh, I do want to note that the sentries just went down for Harsim. And mm -hmm. that means that he will not be able to hallucination scout the way that he has been. Uh, we are going to see phoenixes being utilized it looks like Ooh, disruptors looking for an ambush but not able to find it harstam is walking into a potentially dangerous surround right here he's gonna try and blast through the one side recalling the disruptors out oh this is a weird who's flanking who situation oh my god i that was a really scary spot for harstam and i know that that was not ideal for him but the way that he handled that was actually incredible incredible when mm -hmm. he recalled the disruptors because he knew that those were going to be the least mobile units he had the zealots leading the charge and they were able to get in from around the other side and he was able to blink the stalkers across the army of gung fu banda and he somehow managed to make it out of there with a surprising amount of supply i actually think there's a lot of players who would be in that situation they feel like they just have to commit over there and they get surrounded and actually potentially picked off yeah i i actually do agree with that the crisis management for a very awkward situation was very good for harstam uh, even if it looked a little bit ugly, it could have been so much worse. Now, it is very important to note, Harstam has really lost hard in the Observer Wars. It is three to zero right now. And specifically trying to find value with Disruptors is very difficult when you don't have that information. He will... I, the, the interesting thing is you do get information with the Disruptors, but it's not as though he's got like eight or nine so he can just throw them out constantly like four disruptors you don't want to be using them for scouting and there we go we do see that observer speed as well as a couple more observers getting fired up here for harstam yeah i'm actually really interested not only by the dark shrines that are coming out for both these players around <laughs> the same time but plus one air weapons going to be finishing up over here we are going to have double stargate production picking off soon for gung fu banda but he is currently just supply capped he's at 198 supply so these couple of Phoenix are going to be able to do some lift ups on those disruptors, but is it going to double down even more into that? In the meanwhile, we are seeing some pretty nice zealot run bys over the top left hand base. Yeah, actually finds a fair bit of static fence damage. We are going to see a skirmish still happening in the middle of the map. It's weird to say where the main armies are because they're both so big on each side. But they're, they're constantly trying to out-position and out-maneuver each other. Okay, once we saw the Fleet Beacon, I was wondering if we were going to see this, the carrier transition. Mm -hmm. He obviously got that Anion Pulse Crystals, but <laughs> PvP turns into a very different scenario. This is quite funny. as we, <laughs> We've got so Harstam cool. stealing a base and setting up some really nice static defenses against Gung Fu. Uh, but Gung Fu's much quicker into the air transition having that plus one air weapons could be a big deal in the future if it ends up uh if it ends up going into a carrier versus carrier war but we mm -hmm. are still a ways away from that potentially happening yeah because like you said or kind of are alluding to harstam is not really doing that same transition himself and that is also in some ways going to put a timer oh. on harstam harstam going to get caught with a lot of his stalkers out of position the zealots are going to get hit by some of these instructors but Gung Fu Banda picking up some very, very nice kills on that stalker count. Yeah, that was a big overcommitment from Harstam here. And he he has been finding a little bit of value, but it feels like he's really trying to force the issue. And he hasn't been able to... It feels more like he, he's trying to force the game to come to him as opposed to kind of letting and taking the opportunities as they arise. And I, I do get that. Mm -hmm. Gung Fu Banda is a really strong defensive Protoss. But I kind of wish he had started his own fleet beacon transition a little bit earlier. Gung Fu Band is actually moving through the middle. Oh, and that's a lot of DTs that are going to go down for very little gain. Carrier does get intercepted and killed off, and another one almost going down. Mm -hmm. But Harstam's just Harstam's lost a lot. He definitely has, and we have a funny situation where Gung Fu Band is actually taking his gold base, which is now kind of isolating Harstam's hidden base that he's stolen from his opponent. Well, 
see if when he actually ended up discovering that. But Parsim kind of has a very clear idea of what's going on in terms of the tech choice here for Gungfu Banda. And now it is really a question of can he find a way to put the pressure on and find an actual opening on Gungfu Banda's oh. army before that carrier army gets a little bit too large. He's doing a good job of these structure connections, able to soften up a lot of those units, but not actually knocking out the immortals, not, not actually knocking out a lot of the power units there. Yeah, uh, Gung Fu Banda doesn't know about this base, right? Like, there's there's no, no. way. Uh, we Otherwise, he would just kind of pick it off there. We are going to see another aggressive move coming in from Gung Fu. Harstam forced to use Disruptors more so defensively than anything. Oh, no, he does see it. Oh, wow, that's very funny. Okay. Uh, but, okay, now uh, maybe maybe he just saw it. Yeah, yeah, so he warps yeah. in some Zealots. We'll send him down here. Battery Overcharge plus Cannons plus DTs plus a small Zealot warp in is going to complicate this. I think Harstam wants to draw more army of Gung Fu Banda over to deal with this. He is going to go for a big rotation on the right side. DT will get revealed in a moment. He does force a recall. Oh, that's a nice recall, actually. Just recalling the Immortals, getting them right into the fight. Really nicely done. A lot of times you see Protoss players just recalling kind of willy-nilly, but that was a, a truly strategic recall. Ooh, that walling in over there for Hearthstone actually ends up working out quite well because the Zealots and the DTs hold the line against a superior number of those Zealots for Gungfu Banda by enough time for more Warpins to come on out. Remember that there is still a timer here. Hearthstone, he has been doing a great job of doing these one-two punches, hitting on the left and the right-hand side, or I should say defending on the right-hand side in enemy territory. But yeah. the carrier count is going to continue to build up. Hearthstone has to keep resetting it or doing something about it because ultimately there is a really difficult pill to swallow if your opponent just gets enough carriers it feels almost impossible to just take the fight you can have as many stalkers as you want but it's just very difficult to take the fight against a superior number of carriers that are well upgraded they just start devastating your army a little bit too quickly so harstam has to get something done i will say that the the upgrades for harstam stalkers are amazing and that can mitigate that timing a little bit but eventually you do hit a critical mass now, Gung Fu Banda is going to be able to defend this gold base. Uh, this base in the bottom center almost feels like a bait. Now, there is an Artosis <laughs> pylon, and that's a problem. But now we're finally going to see a, a truly significant amount of army go, and that is Harstam's opportunity. He will draw this entire army over. Recall has been used up. I would love to see Harstam, yeah, kill this base maybe first. But now it looks like he is a little bit worried about that number of static defenses. Oh, and it looks like Gung Fu Banda. Th this is actually not as much for Harsim as I thought it would be with this army. Eventually, these stalkers will tear down this base if Gung Fu doesn't react. But, ah, that's a lot of Zealous Warping on in. No ability to cancel them. Depowering the two cannons. But on the other side, we are going to see Gung Fu Banda say, screw it and start to move forward with this. Very nice static defense yield field here for Harsim. I'm going to slow that down a lot, but... I, I'm not even sure who I favor right now. This is such a weird situation. Uh, I'm fa I'm really favoring Gung Fu Banda right now. Although oh! the structure hits are pretty massive. Killing off all of these immortals right now. The carriers are still going to reign supreme for now. But uh, the stalker count for Harstam is there. Most of them are on the top left-hand side. They're knocking out these fresher bases and everything that Gung Fu Banda has on the left-hand side. But Harstam is also losing his own economy. He still has a bit of a bank to work with. He can still warp in a lot more stalkers, but... I think there's still going to be a question. Can Harstam win a direct fight? Well, I think he can now after he takes down all those Archons and uh, mm. and so much of his opponent's army. Harstam has had a huge bank and a really... Well, actually, the economies overall have been not too bad. But he's he's just been making less expensive units. Oh, now this is a big overcommitment. Those Phoenixes have provided so much more value than I would have ever expected. A lot of Stalkers mm -hmm. getting caught on move command. Oh, man, that was painful. We do see Harstam finding the gold base, but I, I don't even know, man. This is just such a chaotic game between these two. It really is. I, I think there's one big fear that I have right now, which is Gung Fu's army. I would say a lot of the firepower is coming from three things, right? It's carriers, it's Phoenix, and it's Zealots. Mm. Right now, Harstam's army is the Stalkers, which, of course, is going to be important. It's like his necessity for dealing with the Phoenix and the carriers. But the Destructors, unless they catch the Zealots at a weird angle, the Zealots are going to complicate things so much because the Stalkers can't just blink underneath these yeah. carriers. They can't just pick them off so easily. So I feel like Gung Fu Bandit is just continuing to take better trades whenever they actually end up skirmishing a little bit. And I think Parsons' main advantage is he's just so mobile right now. 
he is super mobile but that's where those phoenixes really shine is when the stalkers mm -hmm. kind of probe forward i mean once a stalker is lifted it's dead you know assuming of course that it's that hit and run tactic that we see from harson which is what we've been seeing pretty much uh maybe the last like 12 minutes or so uh, this has been such a such a neat little game uh plus three shields will be really beneficial oh nice disruptor <laughs> shot right there able to take down two archons the other thing is the archons make it so you can't uh even more so than the zealous i would say can't blink in but that's a huge couple of disruptors it does come at a hefty cost to that disruptor count as we're gonna see i don't think there's any detection for harstam right here these dts these zealous these archons are really getting big damage done harstam actually blinked forward at the tail end there on that army uh, it's even now it is still so close in terms of supply carrier count is nice but it's not at that critical mass yet i think yeah five carriers is a lot and it can do pretty well but i think the important thing is that gung fu banda needs to make sure that it's supported by a lot of these zealots on the low ground so that he can at least prevent the stalkers from just blinking underneath the carriers getting those big pickoffs like you were talking about and that the phoenix can also help support mothership is there as well disruptor count being reset there for harstam really makes things quite complicated i feel like because there's one disruptor that's it and it's about to potentially get lifted over here if these phoenix manage to secure enough space for it uh this is yeah the one disruptor just got lifted it's just basically a stalker army for harstam now yeah and he is kind of getting pinned down a little bit on this side we do have a bit of harassment there it is dt's mm -hmm. on the base that harstam originally went after and look at this they're matching blow for blow once again dt's now coming in we will see harstam denying this base on the right side and that's a that's a very important pickoff because gung fu banda's economy that is his biggest issue in this game it's not the strength of his army it's the fact that harstam has used that mobility so effectively and is really starting to whittle down Gung Fu Band. And actually, this DT is going unanswered in the gold base, finding a lot of value. Gung Fu Banda just, you've said it already, he has to keep his whole army together. And it's its making things so difficult for him. It really is. Oh, pick up on an observer over there that Gung Fu Banda had. DT is maybe a little bit more effective with that, but the Phoenix pick off Harstam's own observer. So he's able yes. to keep his uh, observers alive. Harstam still has four observers out on the map. He kept that base in the top left-hand side alive. And he's continuing to shut down these bases. Gung Fu Banda, I I'm actually starting to wonder, like, what is the right choice in this situation? Do you just make your big death charge and start taking the, the Ls in terms of losing some of these fresher bases? Try to just knock out your opponent's production instead of going for all the, the extra expansions? Like, I, I actually don't know. This is such a tough call for Gung Fu Banda. It is a really tough call. Uh, the, Harstam is starting to really take advantage of the size and spread outness of this map. Nice blink forward there, able to kill the Nexus, no cancel, which normally isn't a big deal, but Gung Fu Banda is flat broke. Um, and also able to trap a couple of Zealots. Gung Fu Banda, for a little bit there, was not mining any gas whatsoever. He yeah. is also, he, he's on a gigantic army, really powerful army. But how do you keep Harstam from base trading you? Anytime you go in, that's the thing. You you kind of can't. Harstam finally going to go for his own Stargate and Fleet Beacon transition. At this point, normally I'd say Tempests would be a good answer, but with so many Phoenix on the field, and those are 3-1-2 Phoenix, I, I don't know. A, a Fleet Beacon transition from Harstam feels scary with such poor upgrades. Yeah, that is a very interesting point. It, it, it's kind of this one weird complication. Harstam is doing an incredible job shutting down the economy of Gung Fu Banda. At some point, Ooh, Gung the trap. Fu Banda the is going to get fed up with everything. Ooh, nice pickoff on a couple of those Phoenix over there. But eventually, Harstam is, unless he's able to just gradually chip away at Gung Fu Banda's army slow, so slowly that he's able to eventually overpower it with just sheer economy. At some point, he's going to have to take on the army. So yeah. what do you do? <laughs> well, at the very least, I really wish he would have started up the um, the air upgrades a while ago. He could have been on, like, plus three weapons by, by Ooh, now, but he's going to go for a blink forward. Kills one carrier. Does lose a lot of stalkers. And those phoenixes, they know that the stalkers blink is on cooldown for a little bit. So they're able to get a lot of pickoffs on the chase. Harstam, though, goes for his own carriers now. The thing is... Huh, I wonder how many carriers Harstam needs to
to just be able to win the fight despite the air upgrade differential because the mothership complicates things. The phoenixes will shred interceptors very quickly and the carriers are just higher quality for Gung Fu for a while in terms of those upgrades. So I'm actually, I'm not sure what the magic number is that Harstom would need before he reveals that. Gung Fu Bandit with a lot of zealots on the top side. Battery overcharge. Is that going to be enough to bridge the huge differential? Well, with a DT there, the answer is going to be yes. Yeah, he's going to have to back off over there, but this is a nice one-two punch from Gung Fu Bandit. He's actually shutting down two, or at least sh shutting down the bottom right-hand base and at least forcing some more units in the top left. So that kind of means that Harsim can't really defend the bottom right-hand base. He's not going to be at risk of losing a bunch of his carriers over there. And at the same time, Gung Fu Bandit, he's been able to get up some mining in that bottom right-hand base as well. He's able to recall some of these zealots out. I feel like Gung Fu Bandit, he's getting closer and closer to actual max out. Mm -hmm. If Gung Fu Bandit hits a max out point, I know that Harsim is gearing up for a carrier versus carrier battle as well, but Gung Fu Bandit, he will still win if they just fight head-on versus head-on armies right now, I feel. Yeah, and he'll win pretty hard because that carrier transition is mm -hmm. in such its uh, an early stage of infancy. I, I want to explain... Oh, okay. Oh, Harstam. Okay, he's going to kill off some of his own units off screen uh, so that Gung Fu Banda doesn't realize necessarily how much Harstam is transitioning. I want to talk about that trap, by the way, on the Phoenixes from a little bit earlier. Uh, Harstam had been sending small amounts of stalkers to that natural, and Gung Fu Banda had responded with just Phoenixes about two, maybe three, maybe even four times. So Harstam anticipated that and sent over a few ex well, not just a few, like 20 extra stalkers. And that was why he was able to get a couple of pickoffs on his opponent's Phoenixes. Very nice move uh, from Harstam, and that's why I was like, ooh, the trap! It was a, it was a cool setup. But uh, we are going to see Gung Fu Banda finding quite a few stalkers on this top side again. Another thing that we haven't talked about, because there's so much to talk about in this game, is the fact that the observers have made it, so, or pardon me, the Phoenixes have made it so that Harsim just can't have observers yeah. in most of the fights. With, with range on the uh, Phoenixes, it makes things so difficult. Yeah, I, Harsim's lost nine observers because... Like you kind of were alluding to, there's no other air units until, you know, very recently there's carrier production and stuff for Hearthstone, but there's no other air units that the Phoenix will naturally just attack. So naturally, the only unit that Gung Fu Banda's Phoenix will just attack without having to lift something is just observers. Mm -hmm. So Hearthstone just Ooh. ends up losing them in almost every single one of these fights. And here we go. It seems like Gung Fu Banda is finally pushing on forward. This is not even a mining base which kind of signals to me that Gung Fu Banda is not just going to stop over here. I, I think he may actually continue to push forward. Ah, there is strong potential. He knows where a lot of Harstam's army is. And like you said, I think he knows that his army is quite a bit stronger. Harstam is getting in towards those carriers in meaningful numbers now. He's about to be on nine carriers, get up, about to get his own mothership. And he has finished up plus two ship weapons. So it's maybe not a fully grown uh, carrier transition, but it is, you know, in its awkward teenage years now. And it is starting to become more meaningful. Yeah, I mean, eight carriers is definitely nothing to, to sneeze at. Nine carriers now out on the map right now. And like you said, those upgrades are still coming along as well. Phoenix are going to start knocking out some of those interceptors. Time warp's coming down for both sides with the time warp for Gung Fu Banda. He's baiting Harsim further and further into his own time warp. He's having to retreat back, though, as Gung Fu Banda falls in supply. Harsim remains maxed out. The Stalker reinforcing warping. And Harsim has bought enough time. He made that transition happen. And I feel like he just sees control of this game. I think he did. You know what? I said it was a teenager, but it was much more mature than that. It was ready to go. It was, you know, 23 years old. It had a blog. <laughs> that carrier transition was full of gumption, piss, and vinegar. And that will be enough, I think, to maybe take this one down. We are going to see Gung Fu Banda jumping on this army. But as the carriers, oh, man, they are just going to reign supreme. Harstam is able to take an absolute banger of a game number one. Wow. Uh, that was a wild, wild way to start that uh, series. But yeah, I, I think you were talking about this earlier. I really want to point out how important this is. The carrier transition and the upgrades, the weapon upgrades for those carriers is so crucial. The fact that Harson was able to get up to plus two air weapons and actually, at the very end, I think we were maybe 10 seconds away from plus three air weapons finishing up there for Harstam and kind of maxing everything out on that regard. Carriers up or benefit from upgrades more than almost every single other unit in StarCraft. The reason why is because each carry upgrade 
improves the attack damage of the interceptors by one but it's one damage and the interceptors attack twice every single time and there's eight interceptors so every upgrade is basically so one volley of interceptors it's plus 16 damage for each upgrade that adds up so quickly so plus two weapons is plus 32 damage for every single one of the interceptors attacking once plus three weapons is even more, which I'm not going to do 48. the math for because I'm already, it's too early in the morning for me mm -hmm. to do that simple math. I got you covered. It's 48 damage there on that one. I've been doing all these little brain training games to make myself <laughs> age slower because that's where I am just now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning 35 this year. I'm, I'm not a young, I'm no spring chicken, as they say. Uh, not like these, these young, young pro gamers who <laughs> barely in their late 20s. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're grooving. Uh, but that was, that was such an interesting thing. And I'm really glad you made that point because if Gung Fu Banda had been able to find an opportunity to push across the map when it was plus three, I think it was three, one, three on the carriers of Gung Fu versus mm -hmm. two, zero, three of Harstom's carriers or, or sorry, at one point it was one, zero, three. If he yeah. gets in there when it's one, zero, three and you know, there's only maybe five, six carriers on the field. I think Harstam just gets caught, but he did such a good job of keeping his opponent guessing. And by the time Gung Fu Banda finally did feel secure to move out, it was too late. It was too late. And that carrier transition won the game for Harstam. Really, so not just an intense multitasking war between the two of them, because it was, and it was a good one, but it was also a really smart, calculated game from both of them. And really, really cool stuff. Harstam. While he's spawning up the top left for the Shopify Rebellion, he's up 1-0. And over the top right-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. He is Gung Fu Banda. Yeah, I, I really do want to actually credit Harstam a lot for that game, because I will say, if you're a, pro, if you're a Protoss player at almost any level, all right, I don't actually even think that you need to be a Grandmaster or an EPT European top-level pro to appreciate this. Try just playing a PvP where your opponent is on like five or six carriers and you're just playing Blink Stalkers. Mm, mm -hmm. And you're trying to play the I can't take a direct fight route. It is so difficult to actually pull off. It is mind-numbingly difficult and stressful because you feel like I have to constantly avoid my opponent's army. I have to constantly find damage and constantly expand and try and do all these uh, things to exploit the, you know, the ridges, the edges of the map where I'm taking out bases, but also re-expanding and sneaking a base into one of your uh, bases on your side of the map so that you draw additional units there so that my stalkers can run it. It's like there's so much extra yeah. effort and work put in to just avoid your opponent's army and gradually get your own stuff up. So I, I really have to credit Harsum with that. That is a stressful game to watch but an even more stressful game to play. And he pulled it out really, really beautifully. I, I fully agree. Uh, I also do want to give a ton of credit to Gung Fu Banda as well, because that was also an uncomfortable position when Harstam knocked out those two bases on the left side. Mm -hmm. His influence on the map shrunk so much. Up until that point, he'd been answering toe-to-toe -to -toe with Harstam in terms of like the multitasking war, the zealot runbys. Things were very... Uh, kind of, it was very much, it felt even, even though it was, uh, you know, they were going for different unit compositions. Things were very much kind of in flux a little bit in terms of like, oh, it's kind of hard to tell who's ahead, blah, blah, blah. But they were, they were battling quite a bit for a position. But once he lost that, those two bases on the left side, trying to contest an opponent who has taken as many bases as Harstam has becomes so difficult, but... I don't know. I'm just super impressed with both of them. Uh, we are going to be yeah. seeing a quick expand, by the way, from Harstam. Gung Fu Banda will get into the main base and will scout that it's a robotics facility follow-up. He is going for his own Stargate. We're going to see an expand behind this from Gung Fu, but Harstam is going to have a significant worker lead. That Oracle is going to have to put in some work. Yeah, it was Ooh, certainly going to have to do something, but there's also, you know, the four Stalker opening over here, which also gets scattered out by the Lucian Phoenix, so... I really don't hate when the Protoss player who goes for 4-Stalker is just a little bit more aggressive poking forward. It gets maybe a bit scary when now there's so many sentry openings and stuff coming on up, but this is a, a cute little pro that we're seeing mapping showing us off over in the top bottom left-hand side. So 
Maybe it's looking to throw down like a proxy pylon or something over here. No, actually just scouts out a uh, hidden pylon there from Hearthstone. Nice. Yeah, that is pretty nice. Um, meanwhile, an equivalently great scout for Hearthstone. He finds his opponent's uh, Phoenix, or part of his opponent's Oracle with the hallucinated Phoenix. We are going to see Gung Fu Banda drag that hallucination back in. I don't think that hallucination saw the second Oracle, but oh, he actually turns around with the other one. Uh, Harstam behind this. Oh, he canceled his Robo after it was scouted and goes for the quick Twilight, so it will be Blink once again. That is a very neat little mind game here from Harstam. Gung Fu Banda getting Ooh. caught by the sentries. The force field on the ramp is very good, but now the Oracles get into the natural. It will be uh, a lot of probes going down here. Oh, and Gung Fu Banda is going to find more in the main base. Good, clean Oracle Micro. Grabbing eight probes in total, and that is the kind of damage that Gung Fu Banda needed to find. Yeah, what a crazy set of uh, 30 seconds, I would say, in this game, where we ended up seeing, like you were saying, Gung Fu Banda kind of getting caught with a bunch of his actual core units, but then still finding all the damage because if all the units are Hearthstone are chasing down these stalkers and mm -hmm. finding good damage and picking them off, that means that there's actually not that much protecting the mineral line. So Gung Fu Banda able to do the nice micro on both fronts, getting that Oracle uh, to micro around and keeping them both alive is just going to be a continued threat. Even as Blink finishes up, those Oracles can still find some value, even if it does become a little bit harder to find it. You got to be so careful with those Oracles because their, their big value is keeping them alive. Speaking of which... Oh, even though that was calculated, I'm still always scared when I see like an Oracle on that low HP turn around to cast a spell. I'm like, is that yeah. the right move? Are you, you sure about this, bud? And then the Oracle <laughs> pilots just like, he screams, you know, some kind of vague profanity in, in Protoss. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. But I mean, I love that he was able to get into that position now because even with Blink, it's really annoying. You know that those Oracles are there. You're wondering, do I have to leave some Stalkers over there? Will I just rely on the defensive oh. warp? And it looks like the Stalkers are left there. They catch the Oracle. That he is didn't put it on really, hold position. Yeah, exactly. It, it's This is the purpose of the Hallucinate Phoenix. It's not just to keep vision. It's to force the Oracles to automatically move forward. So after the spell got cast, the whole position was like no longer there on that Oracle. And it got pushed out. That is really, really nice heads up play from Harsim. He tried it initially. Gung Fu Banda was on top of it, but as Gung Fu Banda was microing the oracles to, you know, go for revelations, try and keep track of his opponent's army. Hold that Ooh. thought. Big force fields. Very nice find for Harsim here. He's going to kill both immortals and with Blink off of cooldown, Gung Fu Banda is going to take some big losses. He will find all of his opponent's sentries. So Harstam loses out on that scouting potential, but very good trades for Harstam. Oh, if he can find that last Oracle, he does! Look at the Stalker count, it's 14 to three. Oh, this is so good for the Dutch Protoss. I'm actually really concerned for Gung Fu Banda right now. Gung Fu Banda is still waiting for his big gateway floods to finish up. He's getting a couple of these gateways up. He's waiting for charge. But like you were saying, the stalker count is so massive right now. Gunfu Bandit doesn't even have a Zealot on the map, much less charge actually finishing up to make use of it. He doesn't have a third base. Person can put pressure on and continue to try and snipe off more of these immortals. He may be able to go for a kill move. Even if he doesn't kill him, if he finds any damage over here, this is actually still going to be nice for Harstam because he has a third base behind this. Exactly. He's got that third base. He's got that gateway explosion coming on in. It is, I guess it's less of an explosion and more of like, a, you know, those fireworks you get from those those weird places on, I don't know, for Americans, 4th of July, whatever, whatever you celebrate. <laughs> They're like uh, a shipping container. But he will be able to still find some good trades. Like you said, Gung Fu Banda committed hard into gateways behind this. And he is going to need basically a miracle at this point to be able to find anything in this game. Harstam knows there's no third base. He knows how committed Gung Fu Banda is. There is that DT shrine behind this, but this first attack needs to get big value. Yeah, just the fact that Harstam was able to trade out against so many of these immortals means that Gung Fu Banda is already in a much weaker spot. Zealot's already in decently large numbers over here for Harstam. There are some force fields available here for Gung Fu Banda to try and negate the power of those Zealots. But shield batteries, four of them coming on up for Harstam is going to be so, so oh, much. Prism. Oh, the War Prism. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, Dave. Oh, Dave. And now the Zealots might just scout the Dark Shrine. We're even going to see the Immortal getting caught a little bit on the backside. If the Blink Forward finds it, that would be huge. Can he get that? Oh, yes, he does. The Zealot, the Hero Zealot. That's the one with the scar, scar over its eye. 
that led the charge in the Legacy of the Void cinematic, providing that high ground vision to get the last shots. And with the scout on the Dark Shrine, Harstum, all he needs to do is not take critical damage to these DTs. And I think he is kissing... Wait, what? I don't know. He's going to make it into the playoffs. <laughs> I was like, he's, he's going to kiss the, something. kiss something goodbye. Like, no, he kissed the group stage goodbye. Yeah, it's... This is so tough. Oh, There's four of these DTs over here. The Observer is... Chrono still boosting out. Not out. Yeah, it's still coming out. It'll get there eventually. Oh, there's no Loki cannon. Yeah. Uh oh. This, this is so much to ask for. It. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's too much to ask for. We are going to see the observer finishing up very shortly. Battery overcharge getting popped. It will get targeted down very quickly. But there is the observer. Blink forward grabs Gung Fu Banda's observer. GG gets called. And Harstum, he can kiss the group stage goodbye because he is headed to the playoffs yep i committed <laughs> there we go we found it we found the plot we found the plot guys uh very very well done there game number one absolutely hectic crazy crazy game game number two harstam just looked like he was able to get that little kind of advantage and he took that all the way to the finish line he looks so so solid and so in control from game number two um really really well executed and really well done gung fu banda i mean it's always really tough also you're coming in off of one of those 28 30 minute games of these pvps that are hectic it's crazy there's constant run buys and everything and resetting and getting yourself ready to play your absolute best for the next game it's tough that experience definitely showing through there for harstam and uh i'm happy that despite this as harstam is going to advance gung fu banda is still going to have one more shot in a final round number five, the next round, he's still going to have a chance to try and advance. Yeah, he is. And uh, that is that is nice because he played that game one in particular extremely well. Uh, and I do want to echo your sentiment quite a bit there because that is really, really tough to come back after a loss like he suffered in the first series. Ah, uh, man, that that's... Or sorry, first game and just be able to refocus. Uh, now we are going to head to a quick little break. Uh, we will be back with the next series. It is going to be Lambo versus Christianer. Don't get it, go anywhere. This is the ESL Masters Regionals for Europe.
Welcome back, everyone. We are live once again for the ESL Masters Regionals. This is our third series of the day. It is going to be Lambo versus Christiana, a classic ZVP between one of the smartest Zerg players, one of the smartest players, I think, with the best understanding of the game, and a player that is really good at what he does. Christiana is a player that really likes to narrow down into one specific strategy, not all the time, but really likes to perfect his style of play. I think this is going to be a fun one. Uh, I also think it's worth mentioning that Lambo is going to be the more well-known player for most people. I mean, he's been a player that has been at the top of the European scene. He's been one of those players that has made very much a name for himself, not only as a player, but also as a content creator and like a streamer and a YouTuber for a little bit and everything. So he's He's going to be a player that I think most people look at these two names and say, yeah, well, probably Lambo wins this. And I think that that's not an unreasonable assumption. It's worth mentioning, though, that despite that, and despite the fact that Lambo still very much so has a winning record against Christiana, Christiana has only won two, or sorry, four series against Lambo, two of which were literally just the last two times that they played back in March, as well as November of last year. So the last two times they played, Christiana actually got the better of Lambo. So I do not think that people who are just saying Christiana is going to get bopped over here. I, I don't think that that's an entirely reasonable just assumption to make. I think that both these players do actually have a good shot at it, even if I do, despite that stat, lean a little bit more toward Lambo. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see how this one's going to turn out because normally I would say... Normally, I actually, for, for these kinds of situations where it's a relatively short amount of time that you can prepare... I don't think the prep time comes into too much of a factor. There's definitely obviously prepared builds and whatnot, but I think somebody like Lambo is going to benefit a lot more from even just an extra 48 hours or 24 hours, uh, especially mm -hmm. in a map like, matchup like CVP, where he's probably feeling like Christiana. He probably feels like he has a pretty good read on what he'll be doing this series. No, that's entirely fair. Yeah, actually, uh, it's... It's worth bringing up that, as you're kind of alluding to, that the matches that I was talking about where Christiana was able to win, they were EPT weeklies. They were matches where you're facing off against eight or nine or something opponents all in one day. You don't necessarily know who you're going to be playing next. You're finding out about all of it. There's no time to prepare. Unlike this format, where this guy is going to be coming in in the top left-hand side of the map into a match where his opponent is going to have prepared for him. Can he handle it? It is going to be... The Red Protoss, Christiana. And his opponent spawning up the top right for the Shopify Rebellion, looking to join his teammate in the playoffs and kiss the group stage goodbye. It is <laughs> Lambo. Oh, Lord. And uh, <laughs> I'll just really quickly, because I, I did not mention it, and I always like to at least make mention of it once during the series. Uh, Christiana going to be representing Starlight Twinkle. Team. Mm -hmm. I double checked the name. I had a brain fart for a moment. It's funny. It actually, the logo looks just enough like TSM where I was like, what? <laughs> I know that he is a part of Starlight Twinkle, but I'm like, I don't see it often because we don't, I, I don't use the logos mod. So I don't see that like full, for, full size version of it. I was like, oh, that's yeah. quite interesting. Uh, but yeah, it is going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens here. Oh, Christy Honor. Uh, a rare little misstep right there, where he actually lets the probe mine with its very first harassment trip. Normally, I would basically never even bring that up. But that is something that's, like, maybe indicative of, like, a little bit of the tiniest bit. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend like, oh my god, he's gonna lose the game. He let the probe mine right oh away. Oh my god, oh, he's mentally over. defeated. <laughs> but it's like... Yeah. It's one of those things that when you expect the most from yourself and you make that little misstep, you're like, crap. It just doesn't feel great. Yeah, not not the best feeling because you want to be able to just continue to use that probe to deny mineral mining since only one worker can mine from those mineral patches at a time. So it kind of bounces the drones around and everything. It's kind of annoying. But, oh, uh, a lot of lings coming yes. out over here for Lambo. This is always a fun thing for a Protoss player to deal with, and you can see that Lambo's trying to hide some of those lings for now. Fun is a, a word that I don't know many other Protoss players would describe it as, but it is... It's type 2 fun. It is type 2 fun. 
Uh, it is real difficult to deal with, and Lambo is continuing to commit to this. I think he's going to pull drones with this attack. He's sneaking around the map with a bunch of them. Ghost River, of course, a very short rush distance and also a very wide open natural. Adept so far really has no idea what is happening. I don't think the Shade saw the lings. It only saw the right side of the mineral line as well. All the information Christiana has seen so far has just been shy of what he needs to see. Is he chrono boosting out anything? Is he getting a quicker gateway or a quicker wall? I don't think so. This is looking uh, real the rough. Lings, they made their way into the wall. The pylon's gonna get depowered. The pro pool is way too late. There's no additional adept coming on out. There is one gateway on the map right now. The How recall many? comes. I just, yeah, this is so tough. It is brutal. He did recall both of those adepts, but only a little bit of HP. There's that lane speed completing. Lambo is continuing to pump lanes. He's not going to get baited into going into the main before he has an overwhelming number. Massive probe pull for Christianer, but I talked about prep, and Lambo has come prepared if ever there was preparation. Christianer knows there's not a whole lot he can do, and he just taps out right there. Lambo, well, he was cooking. And he cooks himself up a game number one victory. Oh, that's brutal, man. That is just not the way you want your series to start. You're already kind of coming in against a powerhouse like Lambo, and game number one already slips through your fingertips just like that in a very frustrating kind of way. As I think probably one of the most frustrating ways for Protoss players to lose to Zerg is there's a big Ling flood and your wall is just open. You just didn't see it coming. And if there's like a Ling or like a probe pull a little bit faster or something, or you notice you see some of those Lings that are making their way across the map, you can get the full wall in. You have a chance at trying to hold on. You could play that kind of chaotic re-walling game while you get out more units and try and get up a shield battery to heal. It's No, you don't get a chance for any of that. Yeah. None of that gets to happen. You just lose the power to the pylon. And then you just feel like, oh my god, it's over. Like, you're pulling the probes, you're hoping that maybe you can make some miracle happen, but you kind of know and deep in your heart, no, it's it's already done. Like, that one moment already sealed it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Lambo managed his opponent's vision so perfectly there, and he did mm -hmm. something even a little extra, where he only showed two of the first six links instead of four, which is, yeah. like, even more... Like, that has you thinking, like, oh, did he cut the corner? and not actually build four lings. Can I drop a pylon on this third? <laughs> ah, maybe I shouldn't do it. That's a little bit greedy. You know, maybe he's hiding the other lings. And you're just thinking your mind is, is very much trapped in this really simple mind game that Lambo could have been playing when it's in reality a completely different all-in mind game that totally catches you off guard. And I just, I got to give kudos to Lambo for the build order choice to start things off. And we have spawning up in the top left for the Shopify Rebellion with a great start to things. It is Lambo. Down here on the bottom right-hand side of the map, the red Protoss player from Starlight Twinkle. He is Christianer. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is also like adding in and it's an intentional decision that you were talking about Lambo making, but even just having the drones mining on the closer side of the mineral patch to where the adept would scout in so if you yes. get some vision yeah it would just see the drones mining it wouldn't see the empty side of the mineral line as much like even small little things like that i don't know if that was a uh, hundred percent intentional or if that was just kind oh, of i how think it was worked out but, yeah i think it I, was a hundred percent because you have to manually micro to get a a, a stack in yeah. the natural to, to have that i think that was a hundred percent intentional and i think that was actually a direct result of the design of the map too, where the mm -hmm. it's just a little bit further back. And so you it's very easy to kind of cut corners on your scouting and not do something like go all the way into the mineral line. Because if he goes all the way into the mineral line, only sees four drones, sees everything, then he's probably building that second gateway quite quickly. He's probably prepared for that attack. There's a very good chance at the very least. But Lambo really sold that brilliantly. And I'm just... Uh, well, I'm impressed because it did mean that the, you know, the my, my little theory about the minerals was very clearly correct, right? I was, uh, you let those minerals mine and that was game over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we are going to move into game number two and Lambo is not going for the same kind of cheeky play or all in it looks like so far. He's going to have two lings being made and everything, but he's got the double queens on the way. Next Overlord and Zergling speed and stuff starting on up. But this is a... Uh, a new start here for Christiana, an opportunity to try and turn things around and play a more normal game. And 
he's gonna get to go for a similar kind of opening as he did last game he goes for the adept adds on the stargate is gonna go probably into an oracle i imagine and actually have a chance to play i, I mean not to like discredit like a, a game of cheese and everything but that last game when you play a game like that as a protos player and you lose that way it can feel like i didn't get to play a real game in starcraft you know what i mean it's it yeah. is a real game of starcraft it's a very valid win there for lambo but it feels like you didn't get to play the game that you wanted to no it feels like you've been cheated a little bit uh and and that's very annoying and you're just like oh like ah, i didn't see it like god that's and, and it's a frustrating <laughs> way to start a series um to what i was talking about earlier by the way lambo does go for just the two lings here and will take that third nexus or that third hatchery uh, no denial attempt from Christian or not not in earnest. And Lambo, so he kind of gets away with a little bit of greed here. Will looks like lose this one tumor. That's a little bit annoying. Christian, though, is a player that very often likes to shade his adepts forward. But as we can see here, maybe a little bit scared of what happened in the previous game. Uh, Going to elect to not go for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, full wall up will come up there for Christiana as he will now be able to deal with any kind of lings that would try and make their way across the map, but not going to necessarily be the case this game, as those lings are just sticking around back at home to deal with the adepts and make sure that they can't shade forward and pick off any probes, but just the one oracle made. Uh, not actually going to bother to go for a second oracle or a third oracle, just going straight into a Twilight Council and a robotic facility, looking to get up into that kind of mid-game tech more than really worrying about early game damage. Yes, what Christianer, and I alluded to, to this in the pregame, he loves single Oracle into very quick, oh, nice save right there from Lambo, mm -hmm. into very, very quick uh, Double Gas of the Natural, full, uh, Twilight Council, Robotics Facility, and a Templar Archives. This is a super old school build that used to be really popular around the beginning of Legacy of the Void, maybe like 2017, 20. Um, I guess that's not beginning, but like 2016, 2017, even I think towards 2018. But it is a very quick Archon drop to follow this up. Lambo's defense so far has just been perfect. He hasn't lost a single I drone. Yo, Lambo is absolutely just trivializing that one Oracle, even with the awkward position between the bases. And now we are going to see Lambo getting into the main base. He beelines it in there. We'll find the Templar Archives. And he is, of course, going to know that this is, well, this is the MO from Chris Honor. Always good to confirm what you were expecting already. This is such a good start for Lambo. No, it's a phenomenal start. Literally the one kill that Oracle has gotten is a larva. <laughs> like, yeah, it's yeah. Something that truly had no opportunity to do anything. And frankly, I think if there's one unit you're willing to lose, it's probably a larva. <laughs> yes, there are very few op very few situations where you're you're like super upset about that. Oh, Ooh. he even finds the double adept. Obviously, Christianer wanted to pair this with the double Archon drop and get a little bit annoying with that. Lambo scouts out not just the Adepts and kills them. He also finds the War Prism, so he knows where to position his Queens. This is so freaking good for the German Zerg right now. Yeah, this is this is brutal. This is actually a little bit brutal to watch. Queens are going to start taking some damage there. They should have enough energy for a transfuse relatively soon. Oh. But Nice uh, focus fire there on the War Prism. Gets it very, very low. And that means that suddenly Christianer has a lot less room to play with with these Archons. He can't really be as aggressive because that War Prism simply is so close to dying now. This is a ludicrously clean start from Lambo right now. He is already on 68 drones and counting. He built four roaches just to keep him safe. Immortal on a really bad, awkward rally right here. I think the Oracle finally, yeah, finally getting its first two drone kills here. Oh my god, that Immortal, it, it needs to get recalled, because if Lambo finds this, that is... Oh, that's quite interesting. I wonder if he put it in that position on purpose, knowing that it's there. Uh, one Queen finally going to go down. Christiana finally able to get a little bit of damage. But Lambo's economy is, is just so superior to that of his opponent. Oh my god, okay. Well, he clearly did not notice that initially, but he mm -hmm. will notice it now. Lambo, ooh, does he see that with the Ling? I don't think so. If he had, yeah. does he have enough Lings to punish it? Kind of. But yeah, even I, then, I, I think there was a recall available, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's recall available. I think the Oracle could also probably help out if it's just, you know, 14 Lings moving mm, across yeah. the map or something and trying to pick it off. So should be fine and won't be punished for that. But I think it's all a testament to what you were talking about, where Christiana, it's when things are not going well, other things kind of start to go worse. You, yes feel like oh i'm getting uh, uh, things like that happen and it causes more mistakes it's what i almost kind of 
call like the DDR effect, where it's like you miss a step in a game of like Dance Dance Revolution or mm. Step Mania or something. You don't just miss one step. It causes you to miss like three others or the next four or something because you're trying to play catches. You're trying to get your grip. And I feel like that's maybe a little bit what's kind of been happening for Cristiano where things have not been going well to start. And then that's kind of just causing a cascading effect where you don't necessarily get to play your best game of StarCraft afterwards when you already feel like you're not playing that well. No, I, I think that's a really valid point. Uh, Christiana is going to be going for Storm. Starts out that plus two weapons, but Lambo's going for Roach Hydra. And he's doing it off of a pretty decent economy. He has Roaches in the natural to deal and manage this uh, Zealot drop slash warp. And unfortunately, he does kind of lose track of this Warp Prism, but... Queens at the very least going to be able to get on top of it here. Storm is going to finish momentarily. Lambo, is he going to be able to drop a uh, contaminate on it? That overseer was real close. Oh boy. Oh, he's well, just Storm shy. Storm is finishing up just in time for this push, but there are a couple High Templars that are there. We got three High Templars out on the map. There's one Storm. I mean, he has to get magnificent Storm to hold this off. Guardian Shield also being popped. Immortals trying to hold the line. This Zerg army is trying to push forward. That's three storms all used. I don't actually think there's them. any storms left over. Yeah, there is none left over. There are a lot of immortals and that guardian shield is going to pump. Uh, well, it's going to help the units pump, but this looks so scary. We do have a counterattack on the other side of the map, but I don't think it's going to be able to find the value necessarily. Nine drones have fallen. Lambo is somewhat committed to this, but pure immortal against Hydra's. Well, I mean, it honestly, like if you can keep mm -hmm. them alive, they will do very well. And actually, this is a lot of damage on the other side of the map. Lambo's going to feel kind of compelled to come back. There is a Warp Prism on the top side still, like very top left. Oh, okay. It is very crowded. I saw it like flashing on the minimap, and I'm like, it should be able to get hit from there. Uh, Ravager's morph on in. I wonder if that'll be to try and kill off the Warp Prism. But Lambo down to just 58 drones. He kind of to, has to kill his opponent now. Yeah, I mean, this is like a stellar first hold there from Lambo. Now, the second attack over here, this is actually such a good force field. The Immortal is going to end up falling over there, but he actually buys a lot of time, and now he's going to be able to take care of some of the units that were starting to make their way forward. Storms are now available yet again. Oh my god, is Christianer with double Immortal production up still at eight Immortals? Is he starting to make this work, or is losing oh. the double Robo going to be a little bit too much for him to take a loss of? That is a huge Artosis pile on right there. We've got a recall literally across a small, <laughs> tiny move. I actually really like that recall, though. I think it's very intent er, uh, intelligent, but it will mean it costs him a couple of those Immortals. And the pylon just now about to refinish. And these Hydras actually really cooked. Unfortunately, clicking the, the rocks there in the natural means that the probes won't be able to contribute to the fight, but they still, this is held. And Christy Honor, he's on plus two weapons now. He is still on six immortals. He has made this hold happen. It's and incredible. Lambo, oh, th this, the counterattack damage was too significant and he wasn't able to break through. He's going to go for Overlord Speed. I don't know if he's going to try and go for like a creep highway and one last ditch attack, but he put just about everything into that first push and it did not kill. No, it, it didn't. That was incredibly well done by Christianer. I mean, those Immortals, like you were saying, versus Hydras, it's so tough to make that work. But he just had really good positioning up on that high ground. The Storms, they weren't absolutely killer every single time, but they were continuing to do just enough damage to try and gradually pick away at Lambo's army. This, like you said, is not over. But I would also say just the Zealot run by went so so uncontested. Lambo just yeah. did not notice it for such a long time. He pelt, killed off 16 or something workers with a very low commitment on that counterattack. That has given Christiana this opportunity here in this second game. Can he make the most of it? He has so many High Templars, so many storms available. He's going to storm oh. the Overlord. Not something you see every day, and that will make things a little bit awkward for Lambo. Big storms on the ramp on those oh Hydras on the right side, and there's still so much storm energy available. Lambo... I uh, can he do this? I don't really think so. He does do a pretty good job of mitigating that one storm there, but there's still so many immortals. Christy Honor's army just looks, it just looks so powerful. Yeah, he just has so many power units. He's doing a nice job controlling it as well. He is going to lose some of the wall in over at the natural expansion. So maybe there's a potential for Lambo to run straight on in, but that's also a death trap because Christy Honor has such a powerful army. Game number two. 
a frankly incredible hold there from Christianer with the counterattack damage really securing it. Man, Christianer truly, truly earned my respect to that hold in game number two. It was a very impressive hold. I. Uh... It feels like when you're when you're like the Zerg attacking in that situation, it feels like you're starting to break through because you're like, oh, it's just immortals left. <laughs> but it's then it's like five immortals and, you know, their barriers are kind of coming off and on and off of cooldown at weird different times. and You're not necessarily sure which one has it, which one doesn't. And you don't have, like, lings to get on top of it. Even if you did, they could pull back to the static defense on the high ground. Christiana managed that defense extremely well. Yeah, just, just a great defense. And we're going to see what happens here as we get into Alcyone for game number three. Lambo, he did not need to all in, of course, with that. But he decided he was going for that Roach Hydra push. And obviously, it did not work out. And I'm really curious to see what he's going to bring to the table in game number three. Yeah, I'm I'm actually very happy for Christiana in that game, just in, in the series so far, because picking that up, remember that second game started off really poorly for the most part for Christiana. You were talking about how he was potentially playing a little bit more afraid or a little bit more scared after game number one. He wasn't finding any damage. His one Oracle literally found a larva kill for the first like couple of minutes that it was alive his yeah. adapts were being found and picked off he had a bad rally with his immortals that were moving across the map. so many things were going wrong the archon drop didn't find much despite that he managed to turn that game around with that kind of defense he's picked up a little bit of momentum as we head into that game number three that you were talking about steadfast i really actually think that was so important for christiana to be able to do to have a shot in this next game oh 100 percent 100 percent uh, and it's going to be a real confidence booster for him, too. But let's see if this man can refocus after that game number two. Spawning up at the top right for the Shopify Rebellion, it's Lambo. And down here in the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. He is Christy Honor, Starlight Twinkle. Yeah, that's a, that's a frustrating game to lose as Lambo. Because you feel like things have gone so freaking well for you. And, and it really, you said it, it was a dream early game for him. He started off with the Oracle getting no damage done. Obviously forced a couple of Spore Crawler morphs, uh, Extractor morphs, but didn't find much. Uh, the Eventually it did fall. You mentioned the Rally to Mortals. The, war, the Archon drop almost got killed. The War Prism actually got dangerously low on HP, and there was a little surround on one of the Archons. Uh, it just, everything went very poorly there. Uh, I do want to talk about a little bit what's happened here on Alcyone. Christianer hard anticipated a gold base first, and he actually got there right when the hatchery would be going down on a 16 hatch at about the 48 second mark. But Lambo just took that, that ex uh, expansion at the natural, and <laughs> Christianer just kind of ends up looking like, oh, okay, like, eh. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I guess that's life. Yeah. Took, took a risk, didn't pay off. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely cool to see that Christiana is trying to play a little bit of prediction game with Lambo, trying to at least anticipate a little bit what he could be up to over here as he heads into this next game. And, uh, well, I mean, Probe getting a very, very clear scat out on kind of what's going on to start things off with. So he knows that he isn't going to be dealing with a massive Link Flood immediately off the gate or something, trying to repeat game number one, which I think is going to be a little bit less likely. But yeah, Christiana, I, I think you were making to mention this also in the pregame that he really is a big believer in finding a style or a build. And he kind of just sticks with it, perfects it. We see that Stargate coming up yet again. We see the double adept being made yet again. And if what you're saying is true, I won't be surprised to see a single Oracle again. And I guess we'll see if he can make things work a little bit better this game than it did the last game. Yeah, I mean, it. that's the thing that's got to be going through Lambo's head right now is with such a great start, uh, well, there's probably two things going through his head at this point. He's probably thinking, A, why the hell did I go for that Roach Hydra attack? What was I thinking? I threw away such a great early game. Uh, or he's also thinking like, man, with that that start, I still lost. Like, ugh, this feels <laughs> bad. I feel like it's probably more the, the first than the second, but it's still going to be something that is not going to feel too great. Good job right here from Lambo. Actually, 
mitigating their sp these first two adepts, but they will shade forward. Ooh, can they get that one drone? Yes. That is going to be at least two, make it three drones. That's a really nice find for Christiana. Lambo, of course, does clean up the adepts, and he only loses one Ling in addition, but losing your first three drones, that is a massive juxtaposition to what happened in game number two. Yeah, I mean, exactly what you were saying. It is very different from the last game, and I think that already is just going to give Christiana a little bit more confidence in this. The Lings are also across the map. The Queen's going to be pushing back this Oracle. Oracle is going to find a drone. I mean, this is already more damage than it got in the last game. It, it got two drones. I guess that's how much damage the uh, Oracle got entirely in the last game. Yeah. But the Oracle's still alive and is still around to help out and continue to harass, find stasis traps, help deal with Ling runbys and things like that when he secures his third. So beautiful start here for Christiana relative to the last game. But overall, just like a kind of nice, normal start here for Thoros. Yeah, uh, it's it's you. That's about the damage you would expect to probably grab. Usually, the yeah. first oracle is like a couple drones. Uh, if you commit in with the adepts, you're usually getting two to three drones. But it's still gonna slow the zerg down a ton. And trading out adepts to slow down the zerg is is a really nice thing. Compare. Uh, let's compare where things go. For for just for anyone who's like a little bit less sure of of the knock on effects of StarCraft Two and specifically Zerg droning. Let's see where Lambo's drone count is at about the six minute mark. Uh, because it was, I think it was, he was at like 68 drones at that point. He was at the very least at 66, like full three base saturation. I, I think he's gonna be struggling to get to that same number around this time. Uh, oh, but as I say that, nice little find for Lambo. Getting two probes right there is, that is not insignificant. Yeah, nice little pickup there. It's going to be definitely a bit annoying as we definitely have to chase those back. Here comes that Archon drop you were talking about. And Lambo, I mean, he's starting some Roach production to help deal with the Archon drop this game. So it's going to actually, even the last game, he basically Ooh. dealt with it with, I want to say, almost entirely just the Queens. This game, he is going to be mixing in his Roaches a little bit earlier on and pushing them back alongside the Queens. Well, he made he made four roaches in the previous game as well that we just didn't see them actually come oh. into the fight because he because the queens yeah. jumped it so hard he didn't even need them to be yeah. utilized. Uh, now in this game, Lambo has actually built quite a few more roaches, going up to eight roaches here. And mm -hmm. I wonder if this is a function of the map if he's thinking like it's easier to get into the the main base from that triangle third, so he wants four and four or or what the the thought process is. But either way, it's it's gonna be. Well, it's going to be Christian or not going for it. Lambo is on just 58 drones right now. Of course, he's droning up and will get up to that that three base full saturation I was talking about right about now. But it's about 30 seconds later. Yes, the roaches are later, blah, blah, blah. But it it does show that this is a much more uncomfortable start here for Lambo. Oh, nice transfuses. Barely gets that queen back onto creep to transfuse. Keep them all alive. 13 more drones in production and a spire oh. being dropped down in vision of the Oracle. Is that intentional or is that unintentional? Well, mm. I think it started not in vision and then kind of became in vision yeah. after a little bit there. Uh, Christiana is really good, by the way, of utilizing this Archon drop at the edge of creep where Queens really just don't have a good time dealing with this. He's actually going to be able to find, I think that's two drones on the right side. Transfuse will keep these Queens alive, but... Archon drop finds a little bit of value. Stasis ward in the natural. Good job from Lambo dealing with it. Not going to let that ruin his day, but I, I am really curious if the the mutas are a hard mind game here. What the concept is? Ah, forcing the recall kind of nice, but still. Oh, I like that revelation to see like, okay, are you going to cancel the spire? What's your thought? What are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, there is actually, I was wondering, is there any respect being shown for the Mutas? And there wasn't for a while, but he did finally start up a single Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And like you said, keeping an eye on that Spire, making sure that it does complete is also going to just be uh, kind of nice to make sure you know that you're not over committing or under committing to the Mutas. That's always the trick, right? The Muta or the Spire play in general, you're always afraid, or am I under committing or over committing? Yeah, and you got to be so careful uh, because there are players out there and I mean, most of the top level Zergs are capable of this. I, I still think of like Dark and Solar as the ones that do it more frequently, but just about every top Zerg is mm -hmm. capable of just flipping the switch and going mass Muta. And not just like, you know, eight, 11, 15 Mutas, but going for that plus one uh, flyer attack, 
just really doubling down on the mutas as the composition they go for. But in this case, Lambo's, nope, he's not going for it. He is going to be instead going for a very quick hive behind this. Might use that for a greater spire and try and go in towards those broodlords. Oh, I think Christianer just realized he didn't have charges, that zealot. Very slowly splitting off from the main army. Oh, that's really awkward. I mean, he got it up his prism. He had up basically this nice army composition and actually put a little bit of pressure on the other side of the map to maybe at least poke forward, but... Oh, he can't uh, go without charge. No, no. He's not... Okay, he's chrono boosting it out now, but it's still going to be another like minute or so, even with chrono boost before he actually has that. This is kind of a dangerous maneuver. It even makes it harder to retreat back if you don't have charge. Yeah, it's going to bottle up and like really cause your other units to be stupider. Like, they're not going to run away. So, so it's going to be harder to land storms. It's going to be harder for your immortals to get in position. I am really worried about Christiana being here. He's got a lot of firepower in this army. And at the very least, he's forcing defensive maneuvers out of Lambo. But Lambo's going to have road speed. He's got a ton of Ravagers to deal with this. Christiana, I'm really scared about this as a concept, just committing in here until charge is done. But the storms start off very hard, and ch charge will complete shortly. Oh, that's a big storm. Yeah, charge is finally finished as he disengages there, but those storms were massive. Really nice combo play there with the uh, force fields as well. It looks like we do have a, a quick pause over here as uh, Lambo's asking, are you in fact a beta? Um, <laughs> I got a massive lag. All right. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see if these players can get all of that resolved. But also we had a uh, very, very short vision of the Greater Spire, I think, also being made there for Lambo. Yeah. Oh, Christiana saying, I didn't control my units for like six seconds. Uh, That's impressive because he was getting some really sick storms off. And I, I think he dis maybe he's talking about the seconds where he disengaged or something. But yeah. Yeah. I. Okay. Well, oh, they're asking okay. for an admin here. Uh, Lambo was very generous with Uthermal earlier uh, when there was an issue with um he was very generous when there was an issue with uh you know things struggling a little bit for euthermal uh but it was very obvious you know euthermal got caught unseaged uh, i can understand from lambo's perspective a little bit this time being like wait a minute like you stormed me like it i i like he might be thinking that christiana did in fact do stuff uh we are gonna be well, we're going to be seeing what happens. This is just a uh, an issue where the admins will have to sort things out, and uh, I'm sure they'll come to a resolution. But for now, I think it's just a discussion. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I guess we can just kind of talk a little bit more about the game and stuff. And as the players are looking like they are just going to end up resuming oh, anyway, okay, we're going to so get right back good. into it. Yeah, yeah. But we are in a kind of funky place now, where Christy Honor he has charge now, so he managed to. Uh, like oh. mount that defense over there or like guess mount the offense without losing everything he bought the time despite not having charge for uh, quite a bit of time and he's still in now a position where i feel like he could actually go for some kind of attack or he could try to commit because those storms actually kill off so many units just there yeah <laughs> yeah i think it's a chance that we may not be resuming right now Yes, I think that there, we're we're seeing some negotiation on exactly all the details of that, but we'll we'll just update you guys when we know exactly <laughs> what's going on. Not like the hypotheticals of what might happen. Yes, but yeah, I'm. I think it's a very interesting position now because there's two things happening. One is that Christiana has his army. He is kind of at that uh, place where he's maybe about to finish up charge or he just finished up charge is taking these kind of interesting fights with the force fields and the storms that were really big. But now it's the kind of question like, okay, do I go now? He used a lot of his, uh, his actual psi storm energy. So that's mm -hmm. one thing, but there's also this kind of timer. Now there's the greater spire that's going to be started up there for Lambo. And that is going to put a timer on Christiana to get something done with this zealot immortal composition that is not really going to be able to do anything against the broodlords yeah um it's i, I don't i don't want to talk too much about it just just for the sake of yeah. no one even questioning 
uh, competitive integrity. Uh, we actually have now the referees are going to evaluate the situation. And we've got to say this is important because, yes, these players are still 2-1 and one in their, their scoreline, but this is a really important, specifically, game for both of them. Uh, we're 1-1 one in the series. Winner advances to the playoffs. Loser has to play a, another match on, I believe, Sunday. That's going to be do or die Sunday. This is really important that they get this right. So I I kind of do applaud the admins for like taking their time with it a little bit and being like, look, because because the players were actually ready to go. They were actually about to restart and the admin was like, hold on, don't like, let's let's take a beat. Let's get this right. Uh, yeah, I'm really I'm really curious about this one because even down to specific, like a couple of seconds could make the difference between who advances and who doesn't in this particular situation. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And we'll let the admins kind of figure out and decide whatever's going to happen over there. Um, I am kind of curious how things will end up panning on out. But like you said, this is definitely an important match. We do have a situation where the winner of this series is going to end up advancing on forward. And I don't know. I, I, we still have some great other games coming on up, Dave. We're going to be killing some time while the admins figure things out. And even then, we know that we're going to have to resume from replay at some point. So we have some time to kill, man. Uh, we, want, we can even just go over some of the other games that are going to be happening after this. Because this is only the third series of the night. We have actually a lot of StarCraft ahead of us. We we have a ton of StarCraft ahead of us. Uh, let's take a look at, yeah, the upcoming series for now uh, in the European Swiss format. We've got, right after this, another ZVP. Uh, as you, as we have already discussed, almost all of the matches in Europe today are uh, only, I guess, only beneficial. Like, you can only advance from them, except that very final match of the day, which is going to be Battle B versus Strange. And for me, that is the match that I have my eyes on the most. Uh, obviously, a Laser Mana is very cool because that is a classic matchup. Couple of very strong Polish powerhouses. I'm so used to saying Polish Protoss player that saying another <laughs> alliteration that has Polish in it feels wrong. Like it feels like I'm cheating on the, the Polish Protoss player alliteration. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a laser mana for that one as the next match. Uh, but like I said, I'm really, so if, if we were talking about, you know, like, uh, stocks or trades or whatever. I am bullish on Battleby. Is that right? Is that when you like the stock? Yes, yes, that is when you you like the stock. Okay, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm diamond hands on Battleby right now. Yeah, uh, Battleby has definitely been an exciting player, I think, for a lot of people to watch. And I feel like he's become easier and easier for a lot of people to just cheer for and root for because he's been just one of those rare up-and-coming players, I feel like, that's broken out not just from the middle of the pack to like the upper levels but he's broken out from like the lower levels of europe in the last like couple years into the middle of the pack which i think is a little bit more rare to see these days i feel like we've seen a lot of the same names for the most part in europe in the ept european regionals and not many new players have broken in battle b has been one of those great players to see rising on and up i am actually personally quite excited about goblin versus skillis I'm mm. really excited about that because skills, I think, has truly earned a place in my heart as just this potential Protoss legend, I think. I really think that Skillis has gotten to that point where he's so close to ascending to a point where I think I would equate him to almost being where, like, a Showtime or something would be. Yeah. I think he's still, in my mind, just missing a little bit more of, like, stability and long-term abilities to continue to show that consistency. But I think he's gotten quite close there. And Goblin has really been actually playing some really impressive StarCraft to me. Uh, I know that he did have like a little bit of a disappointing loss the other day where he got a little bit sad about uh, how the series went versus Clem. He's saying, oh, I tried so hard on Twitter and stuff. But I really think that he's done an impressive, impressive job taking down here Marine 2 to 1, taking down Mana 2 to 1 so far. I'm actually really, really excited about that PvP. Yeah, I mean, so am I, to be honest. It's. The, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, the format, blah, it's so many games. How can I track it all? And it's like, yeah, it is a lot of games. But we used to play every single matchup. Every single player used to play seven best of threes. And you would have, you know, like on the, the final day, 
you'd have Serral at like 6-0 and or something going up against some poor lad that was 0-6 with one map win. And it's like, okay, that's a little bit tough to get excited about. But when you see players like Goblin and Skillis, who are both, you know, playing extremely well, Skillis was one map away from advancing 3-0 three, uh, three and in series, I believe. Goblin, like you said, had that really impressive game one versus uh, Clem and also took down a Battle Bee who I've mentioned is surging. It, wait, is that right? No, 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 he hasn't. No, he took down Hero Marine. What am I talking about? He took down Hero Marine. I was looking at things wrong. I was looking at Clem versus Battle Bee. Uh, he took down Hero Marine and a veteran in the form of Mana. Like both of these players are really playing extremely well. And I, I do have to echo what you're talking about with how well Skillis is doing. Yeah, so it looks like um, it looks like just to clarify a little bit, they went into the replay and saw when was the last notable action Christiana took. When was when when did he do a uh, meaningful input last? Which I actually I would never have thought of that, but that is really intelligent to like check for that. I would I would have just been like, uh, pick a number from one to ten, and that's how many seconds it is, and that's why <laughs> I'm not an admin. Yeah, and I'll even mention, like, I did check actually during the pause. The APM for Christiana, right at, like, the moment for the pause, it was zero. So I think there was, there's, like, some sense of what all that uh, came out from. So I'm glad that the admins were able to check in on that. And, well, we're just going to have to hop into that wonderful resume from replay. Do you remember the time when we didn't have resume from replay, Dave? Where oh. things like that would happen or something, or, like, there'd be a disconnect? And... This is like way back in the day. We would just have to regame. Like there, that, yeah. it was either regame or you just make a decision as an admin on who was ahead. Do you that remember that? Was, yeah, I, I remember a couple of big, well, one really big match where it happened. And I'm sure you're, you're thinking of the same one. Um, and then I remember it actually happened in something called the CSL, the corporate, or sorry, Collegiate Star League, um, not the CEA. The Collegiate Star League, where it actually happened to uh, a team where I, I was of the opinion that the game was completely over. And it was like the ace match. Uh, and it, I think it was like 175 supply or something of Roach Hydra versus a Protoss player that was trying to transition into Colossus, but was down like 55 supply or something. The Roach Hydra was like at his third or fourth base or something and was like actively about to kill him. And... Mm -hmm they went with a regame and it was like, dude, he just needed a move. That's all he needed to do. Uh, but it's always tricky because you can't say for sure that someone will convert a victory, even if it's a 90, 10 situation. And that just kind of goes back to what you're saying, which is that we are so fortunate to have resume from replay now. Yeah, we really, really are. It's uh, it changes everything. And it's just, it's nice. It's a li nice little bit of Starcraft history, I think to go back and remind people that we didn't always have this kind of stuff and very grateful that we have it now. <laughs> it's made things a lot, a lot simpler, but yes. Yeah. Uh, we're getting ready to move into the next game now as they are finally in the recovering stage and everything. It sounds like that they are rewinding back about like seven, eight seconds. I'm actually very curious because of course this is going to matter a lot for where we end up resuming. We're, or are we resuming before or after the storms and the force fields and everything were happening? Because that is the one really tricky thing I think about this game is that the resuming point may be during the fight. It might, might not yeah. be like right before the fight or after. It may be in the middle of it. And that also, I mean, that is also like a bit of a skill set. Like, can you jump into the middle of a fight and start microing your heart out and getting your force fields down and storms and everything else? Yeah, it, there's there's a couple of things that happen during a pause like this. Uh, one, players obviously, they have a, check, a chance to, you know, uh, reconsider the strategic situation and be like, okay, what do I need to do here? And that's obviously an advantage. But then there's the other side of that coin where, yeah, you might just suddenly be thrown back into an inferno and just have to do your absolute best to get out of it and just kind of just hope against hope that you can rejoin after taking that that little, I guess, hiatus uh, where you've cooled down just ever so slightly. Oh, hold on one second. We got to... Oh, my God. Can I? Okay, I can. 
Oh, we're getting into it right now. Yep. Cut. Go. All right. We are back, and it looks like we're resuming in right after the four seals were expiring. The charge has finished up, and it looks like Christianer is, in fact, going to continue the aggression over here with charge finishing up. I do see a lot of storm still available, though, and this is going to really make things difficult for Lambo because he has to be able to take a good fight. He has to buy time. Yeah, and Christiana really going hard into the uh, into the paint here. There's still mm -hmm. at least one, maybe two storms available. Roachworn is going to go down. Lambo has a ton of units in production, but they are not out yet. Army value is massively ahead for Christiana. A big storm on the Ravagers. Plus two missile will complete in a moment for Lambo. Okrosa Biles not going to land. Lambo not able to snipe down any important units. That War Prism staying alive for the moment. And this is looking really, really scary. Lambo supply is plummeting. Yeah, this is looking so, so dangerous. The Zealots are getting into overwhelming numbers. The War Prism finally got enough space to actually go into phase mode. It can actually start warping in some additional reinforcements. And those Ravagers are getting so close to that War Prism, but instead they go for the Coastal Vials. Almost get an Observer, but not quite. Four Archons being added into the mix, and Christiana is continuing to just buy space. The Greater Spire may be finished, but I mean, Lambo is so far away from being able to make use of that. He needs to just power out Lings, Roaches, Banelings, anything he can muster. He does not have time to get up Corruptors and Broodlords. No, he does not, but Lambo did manage to buy enough time right there in order to get the Roach Warden back online. Banelings were not able to get the most meaningful connections, but there's actually no Zealots here. We're going to see the attack coming in from Lambo trying to crush through this army, but he's not able to do it. Oh, if he could find out War Prism, it would be huge, but it's a little bit out of his vision range. And Christiana will get the opportunity to just reposition. This is still so close right now. Oh, lose the Observer. Also, by the way, currently Lambo is up one to zero right now as uh, this is going to be game number two. And this no, this is, is game three. I'm oh, sorry, game three. Oh my God, yeah, you're right. It's one one. Oh my God, you're right. All right, this is decider match here. As we have big Corrosive Vials on top of so many of the Immortals there. Archon's getting locked behind the Immortals as well. Is this a turning point? Is Lambo actually starting to make a little bit too much damage happen? That is a good question. Ooh. Immortals, they are still going to be able to survive and regenerate shields. Lambo able to go and gun down both Phoenixes here, which means no lifts on Ravagers here. Drone's going to try and pull into the fight. Corrosive Vials. Will go in on top of this army. Ooh, pushing the Archons out of the way, but he actually Ooh. does still eat those Biles. Good job from Lambo to reapply them. Ravager count is very high, but against this Immortal count, it's really scary. There's oh, the, the warp, forces. and there oh, Lambo the gets the Corrosive Biles. That will mean no more reinforcements into the fight. Lambo is bleeding out so much supply. He's so down in drones right now, but can he find an attack before the reinforcements cross the map or find a fight? That, that is a very good question as another War Prism is being made. Another Mortal or two is being rallied across the map. Christianer finally backing off as he realizes he doesn't have the ability to warp in a lot of Zealots offensively. So he pulls back. That gives Lambo that opportunity to make some more units. I almost wonder if you have this time bot, would you make even just like three or four Broodlords? Just because there's nothing to contest the Broodlords right now. I mean, even one. Even one Broodlord. Yeah. I don't think you can afford three or four, but can you yeah. even afford one at this point? And can you afford not to make one Broodlord with so few, ar so few, so little anti-air on the map? We are going to see Christianer not adding more Archons. He's in fact gone for a bunch of High Templar. So he wants to storm the living crap out of Lambo off of this three base push. We are finally seeing a fourth base taken for Christianer, but he has found a lot. Nice job right there. Does clip the Immortal, but there's still so much survivability in this army for Christianer. Yeah, this is going to be so difficult for Lambo to try and make this work. These Immortals all have their shields off of cooldown for the most part. Gold base is going to have its mining denied for a little bit. The hatchery is going to go down very quickly without many Immortals in the mix. And Christianer, he has finally started transitioning. He's gotten up a Nexus or he's getting up a Nexus behind all of this. I really like that decision because so far, he's been able to do so much damage, and Lambo's been sitting on that low worker count, low mining amount for such a long time. Christianer doesn't have to end the game anymore right here. He can just start getting transition set up and continue to just be threatening with this army. Yeah, and uh, you talked about it a little bit earlier. We are going to see a couple of Corruptors sneaking out here. There are quite a few Spines on this high ground, and that high ground is going to be difficult for Christianer to breach once again, but he might just go for it here. 
There is enough money for two Broodlords. There they are. Actually, technically three Broodlords. Now even four. But can he buy that time he's looking for? Christianer is looking to outmaneuver this army and maybe carve a path into the natural banelings. Oh, they're trying to get a flank, but the storms are so scary. No, oh! he hit so many on one immortal. Oh my god, an absolute blunder there for Lambo. It's so many of those banelings could have detonate on the immortals set off a bunch of their hardened shields as a massive group maybe taking out a bunch of these high templars but now all of those storms are available this might even be enough storms to act as anti-air against the broodlords he could literally storm the broodlords to death he might just be able to do that the broodlords need to be targeting down those high templar manually christianer is way ahead in supply but he is a little bit struggling to deal with this broodlord tech and he's not really Landing big storms on the Broodlords. This might allow Lambo to hold. He is so far down in economy. And there is the Stalker Warpin. Plus two Blink Stalkers going to find one, two Broodlords. Third one is going to go down for sure. And I think Christiana is punching his ticket. He absolutely is. There it is. GG. Christiana takes the 2-1 against Lambo. And is going to qualify himself for the playoffs. Absolutely well done there by Christianer. Found a really beautiful timing there. I think really all getting set up with that kind of earlier engagement where things look scary. I mean, this is even before like the resume and everything. So this is like at the very beginning of that. Christianer took the fight where he didn't have charge, which looked like such a scary decision to make. But he got the four seals on the storm. Then we had, of course, the whole resume for replay and stuff after that, and he managed to continue the aggression and everything. But I really feel like before that pause, Christiana made a very, very bold decision, and it really paid off well. Yeah, it was... Uh, he went he went back into it, and we were wondering what was going to happen right out of it. But yeah, he just kind of yeah. ran right up the gut, right at his opponent, and Lambo was not able to deal with it. He kind of got knocked off guard and or knocked off balance and Christianer continued to keep his core army alive that whole time. It was such a long sustained siege. Lambo, even though he did get those Broodlords out, he never really felt comfortable, it feels like, to, to get them at a meaningful time. And with that, yeah, we're gonna be heading to a quick little break and we will be back with a laser versus mana in about five, six minutes. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, everyone. We are now getting into another series, our fourth series of the day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah fourth it's series of the been day. Yeah. a pretty hectic day in a lot of ways because we've had, even though there's been a lot of two zeros, yeah. everyone in this series almost has had some absolutely wildly long games. Yeah. Yeah, it's... uh. Yeah, there's been some real, real long games, even even in the two O's, like both Harstam's Harstam Gung Fu Banda's first game was 30 minutes. And then it feels like it's already been so long since we <laughs> since the other series. Who was that first series? Here Marine Shadown. Yeah, Here oh, Marine Shadown yeah. game two was pretty pretty long as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. But that is maybe going to set us up into an interesting spot for this one because this could also still have long games and everything, but Mana versus a laser, a PVZ, as we head into that one. A laser is a player that I look at, and I feel like, especially stylistically in the past, and from the few games that I've been able to catch of a laser playing ZVP in the last couple of weeks, I feel like he's been playing a little bit more of a fun, aggressive style of Zerg which is something I always love seeing out of a laser. Mana has also been doing his kind of like cool thing where Mana always takes whatever the current meta is, has like some slight adjustments to it or slight twists on it, and also brings something really unique and interesting to the table, especially for all these really weird and cool maps that we have in the map pool. I'm actually quite looking forward to this series. Yeah, I'm really interested uh, too, because I, I do expect, I think probably both of them will still advance to the playoffs, but things get really scary when you go to that that do or die sunday and they are they're, they're not in the group with lambo but there are scary players uh battleby i think is one of these players that could absolutely be a, a really difficult one now i don't think mana could play him again but a laser might have to uh gerald of course is very good particularly and actually he's really good in pvz and pvp i would say there's a lot of players that you would like to avoid but Enough of that chit chat. Let's get into the game and we can yap about it a little bit. Let's do it. We have spawning up in the top right for Team Liquid. It is a laser. And down here on the bottom left hand side of oh. the map, we also have the red Protoss player, also from Team Liquid, and with a pylon in his main base, it is Mana. Yes, it is. Forge. And this has to be a cannon rush, right? That was like I mean, uh, it's weird because even you know, normally with a even normally with a cannon rush, you do go for the for like the wall in. You go for the wall in over oh. the ramp, but He's building the pylon before the forge. Wait a minute. What is this proxy gate? Is it? It is a gold base first, and Mana, I think, has sniffed that out. I don't know if he's actually checked the gold base. No, he has <gasps> not seen it. But yeah, this is gonna be, oh my God. This is going to be the proxy forge and gateway. That's a full wall. I love it. Oh, wow. Mana is coming in with some very super spicy play. You know what I, you know what I am really looking forward to? The <laughs> drone transfer from yeah. a laser. Yep. As he sends those drones and they just go to the edge of the cliff because they can't, it's fully walled in. He's gonna see this, and now it's like, okay, what do you do from here? Are you going to contest this? Do you cancel? You your don't even know it's base? a cannon rush yet, though. This yeah. could just literally be a little pocket for a depth to hide in. This this doesn't oh, even necessarily yeah. have to be a cannon rush. Like this could actually just be like something regular. And now he's <laughs> like, oh oh, uh, hello, sir, sir. It's too late to pull against this now, though. It's too late. It's, you can't it pull is. your drones against it. You need you need like. 10 and you're going to lose at least three or four. The beauty of this positioning, by the way, on the gold base cannon is that normally you you would want, if there's like lings or something being made from the larva, you kind of need two cannons to guarantee and secure, feel comfortable oh, about that kill. He's going to take the other gold. <laughs> oh, that's really cute. But I mean, this is, this is also going to be interesting because this is still a big investment of how long and how big of a delay it's going to be before you can actually start mining from that. And Mana's aggression is going to kick off way before that point. Yes, it will. Cybercore is about to complete. I Now, my big question is, 
Okay, it's good. Oh, it's going to be double robo right away. That makes a lot of sense. What I was just about to say is where does he build the first gateway unit? Do you put it on the bottom side or do you send it in towards the main base? By going for double robo immortal into warp prism, you get the best of both worlds. Mm, this is going to be really, really fun and interesting to see. Now, it is kind of funny because with that gold base hatchery, even if it doesn't get a chance to mine, remember there's no wall off for mana. There is an opportunity for a laser to force some uh, extra things back at home. Oh. Mana hasn't invested in a photon cannon in his mineral line either or anything. So if a laser is able to sneakily get some units out from that hatchery over into Mana's main base, that could be a problem for Mana. It certainly could. Uh, first Immortal is started up. Shield battery is already going to be depleted of energy. How many Ravagers do we have here? It's going to be three Ravagers to start. And that will start taking off hull damage or putting mm -hmm. hull damage on. Actually, in fact, the next set of vials might kill that cannon. Is there? There's no other cannon, is there? No, there is. Uh, oh, but he doesn't go for it. He's microing the roach. Oh, he could have actually killed that cannon right away and jumped the entire production. I think there's only one pile, and that was actually a huge opportunity potentially missed there for a laser. Yeah, it definitely can get dangerous if you lose like your your foothold there. But the cannon's gonna go down regardless. The, the problem okay, is the immortals are popping on out anyway, so I think that he still should have been able to with good micro hold this army back, even with the cannon going down. Yes, what I was more worried about is if the the robos got depowered before the war prism popped. But there was a backup pylon anyway, so oh, he was yeah, actually yeah. fine. Uh, a laser did lose how many drones? Just one drone uh, on that gold base. But that is you know that's a lot of drones relative to his total economy. Already a couple of units going down, and this is only going to get more difficult for the Zerg to deal with over time. Yeah, Mortal going to get picked up, dodged out of the Cross of Vials, but one of the shield batteries, the forward shield battery, does end up falling over there. This is kind of a tricky thing also, is when you're going for this double robo play, you do have a lot of Immortal production, but you also oh. are using a lot of your minerals on these Immortals. So you don't actually have a ton of extra minerals to throw up like crazy numbers of shield batteries unless you're cutting your immortal production which you can even see there's like a short period of time right now where mana is investing in more shield batteries because he kind of needs them but he's not making a second immortal right now no he is not uh we we do see a lot of damage actually coming in on that one immortal mana he's got to be a little bit more careful with these units does snipe down another ravager and he's actually got an immortal harassing the other gold base queen versus immortal not something you see too often of course the immortals barrier are going to help out a fair bit there there are going to be Lings popping out, and actually Ling Speed is about to complete. This could get very scary for Mana with this little force. I think he killed off enough of them as they popped out. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Meanwhile, it looks like the one Roach that came into the main base was also morphed into a Ravager, able to cross a down a bunch of probes. And this is actually starting to get very scary and very chaotic. Honestly, I think Mana's in a lot of trouble right now just yeah. due to the counterattack. He really is. I mean, this is what I was talking about, that ability to just try and put the pressure on. And that's, I think, normally why we end up seeing the wall ends over there. So I guess Mana was hoping that he would be able to see if there was, like, a extra unit made and running around. Because then you could throw up, like, a defensive cannon, maybe, or try and hold the line a little bit. But ends up backfiring quite a bit. Six workers lost when you're already on such a low count is tough. Now the Lings are going to be able to pick off this one Immortal. This is going to also allow the gold base mining to kick off. And Mana is now put in an awkward position. He's got such a strong timer that he has to deal with. And I don't know if he can break through in that time. Yeah, I will say as long as he gets the freedom to micro those units, he can continue to make forward progress into the main base. But by a laser forcing action on the other side, Mana doesn't really get to do... Wait, did he re... He had he to recall something to deal with the links, right? He didn't, or like, if there's any potential roaches or ravagers, any other run by Oh, that's one of the immortals that was on the aggressive attack. I was like, we saw that immortal yeah, yeah. die, right? We did. Uh, this is, yeah, this is now a laser making forward progress on this position of mana. Mana's in so much trouble in this game, and a laser is really handling this well by creating so much chaos for mana to deal with. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that immortal should not have been out on the map. That's really unfortunate. That actually may potentially seal the deal here because Mana, he's going to have trouble defending on his offense and he's going to have trouble defending back at home with his actual mineral line. Oh, kill yeah, the pylons, please. please. Yeah, I think the Ravagers are all getting in range to cross the bio down the pylons and he's going to target fire each one down. And with that, there's no more production here for Mana. He actually cannot make any units outside of anything besides his 
single gate. No, his gateway is also proxied, so he, in fact, cannot make any units right now besides Pro. Nope. Uh, I like the decision to go into a Stargate very much. I think that's a really wise decision. The problem is he needs such a long time for that to actually do anything here. Mm -hmm. And with Ling's reinforcing, this Raptor is going to be covered against a surround. Obviously, you can pop battery overcharge, but even if you do, well, actually, this pylon might just go down. Yeah, I think this game is completely over at this point. It, it almost doesn't matter how well Mono Micros the Immortals anymore. Yeah, but you know, sometimes it still feels good to just pick off a couple of these Ravagers of the War Prism Immortal Micro. You know what? There's fewer things to macro. There's less There's less macro happening right now, <laughs> Steadfast. So that means you can focus all of your attention on your War Prism Immortal and just get a little bit of a confidence boost before you potentially have to head into game number two. He might not realize how much, how, how far behind he is at this point because it, it won't kind of show itself in normal ways for a while. We are actually going to see this immortal finding a few drones that are just kind of on their lonesome. And it is worth noting as well that, okay, never mind. There's the GG. I was going to say it is worth noting as well that the laser doesn't have any layer. He doesn't have any tech behind this. This is still like, this isn't like a laser's, you know, on a three base economy with roach speed on the way and aspire about to complete or even not even a three base economy just a two base economy with like 35 drones and like yeah aspire that's about to pop out four or five mutas and end the game like it was still a situation where even a laser might not have been feeling super super duper confident as much as like the supplies would show but very fun game number one. And uh, Mapu saying in the chat, amazing clown fiesta. And it really was. I got I to gotta applaud a laser's decision making to go for that other gold. The counterattack really dislodged mana. Because if you're, if you're able to just micro immortals in a war prism against Roach Ravager indefinitely, you can kill almost infinite numbers of Roach Ravager. Like it can be real gross feeling. Yeah. I, I really would love to see that game almost like replayed in that same way. But with a wall off there from mana, because mm. it's not that the wall off completely stops all potential of like a counterattack or anything, but the low commitment of a single roach or like a one ravager or something moving across the map and just suddenly wreaking havoc and causing your probes to all stop mining and everything, that stops because now there's a wall and you have to get something back in at home to warp in. You have to recall a stalker or an immortal or something, or you can get up a cannon eventually but you have the time to react and get something up. I feel like that actually would have changed the nature of a lot of that game. Just literally having the wall there instead of doing the wall at the mineral line. I actually think that's a really cogent point and I, th I think you're definitely right about that one. Uh, but regardless, cool play from Mana. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Great defense from a laser. And we are gonna be heading into game number two on Amphion, spawning up at the top left for Team Liquid. He is one map away from punching his ticket into the playoffs. It is a laser. And down in the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player from Team Liquid as well. He is Mana. That was a bit of a goofy game, but it was a fun one. Absolutely oh, yeah. fun. Uh, and sometimes we need a little clown fiesta in our lives. We are going to see Mana electing to go for the hatch block this is something i am so surprised we haven't seen more of on amphion because there is a little feature to this map right above the third base that's not even what i'm thinking of that is one of them but there is a feature above the right uh the third base yeah right there that reaper jumping point nope to the left marco to the left to the left oh there we go yeah so you can park an adept right there uh and you can threaten like five <laughs> mineral patches from that position it is really frustrating to deal with uh for zerg and I i'm surprised once again that i haven't seen more protoss players kind of utilizing it you can theoretically micro your way through it and and we'll see if a laser is able to do that and do that successfully but it is quite annoying to deal with i do want to point out by the way mana getting a 21 nexus which is well normally it's a 20 nexus so that's maybe maybe a little bit like um Maybe just still thinking about that previous game and a little bit, like, uh, a little bit uh, distracted mentally. Yeah, it might be some small little things like that or just the probe being sent out so early on for the, the hatch blocks and everything. Whatever mm -hmm, it is, mm -hmm. it is going to be 
a very, very slight delay, but nothing too significant. Uh, what do you think about Amphion? Because I feel like when, whenever I look at either one of these two players, I do think that they are both players that consider the map quite a bit. I know that most players will consider maps when they pick their build orders and everything, but I especially think Mana and a Laser are players that really do enjoy the strategic thinking and the strategic build order choices for StarCraft. I mean, there's a lot of features to Amphion that uh, we haven't even talked about. Obviously, those minerals in the back that uh, Mapu was alluding to, uh, they allow for you to potentially expand as the Protoss. You, you can actually full wall the natural as the Protoss player and go for that. Oh, Probe going down. Nice little trap there from a laser, but Mana going a little bit too deep, looking for that third hatchery timing. And a laser did actually delay the third hatchery a, a decent bit. Not getting into that 30 supply. That could cause Mana to maybe overreact a little bit. Uh, but yeah, you can take the pocket third as the Protoss if you are so inclined. And oh, we've also got a little pool. Hot tub? Hot tub? Is, Is it a pool or a hot tub? Yeah, no, that's that's got faucets. That's a hot tub. But it's so big. And it's made of stone. There's fish in it. What? Oh, there, there, are, like, there are like hot springs and stuff that are made of stone. But they don't have faucets generally. Well, how, how do you fill up how do you fill up the hot spring? Oh, that's a good question. I with a hose? Wait, are you serious? Wait, no. Hot hot springs are usually natural occurring. I know, I know. I know, Ruby. Okay. I'm, Dave. I'm like, Dave, Dave, I'm trying to be dumb right now. You're supposed to correct me. No, right, no, no. This, I was I was going along right with the ride for the dumb. That was that was Oh, wow, that's so informative. <laughs> wow, naturally forming faucets in the wild. <laughs> that's so cool. Oh. Where does this hose? Right, well, where does the water come from in this hose? Well, it's in the hose, idiot. <laughs> the hose naturally forms with the water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we do have a void rate coming out over here very early on from Mana. Yeah, I I want to say normally I would see this, and I feel like in the past I've always said, oh, it's kind of a sign that you're either looking to try and be a little bit safer, or you're trying to do something maybe a little bit cheekier. But I feel like I've seen these void rate openings from so many Protoss players the last couple of weeks that I'm starting to wonder if maybe the meta is just shifting and Protoss players are just be being more comfortable with Void openings as opposed to going straight to Oracle or going into like Phoenix or something. I feel like certain Protoss players just like it. They're just like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fond. That was a really nice save right there. He just uh, simultaneously dropped both, both Spore Crawler Morphs and transfusing the drone, a laser with the wow. baby sitting on that defense. That was very nice. Oracle able to get one kill, but considering how many drones were exposed with no spore in the natural and only one queen there, that is very good for Miko. Speaking of a laser, by the way, that is one fast Hydroden, if ever I've seen it. Yeah, it really is. Also, how, did he how the, the heck did these lings get into the main? I mean, there's an adept wall. <laughs> how did these lings get in? Yeah, we're, we're like doing the investigation right here. Ah, uh, there was no sign of forced entry through the minerals. Uh, was the adept <laughs> bribed? Hmm, is the adept actually a changeling? And then they like the zap it with corrupt. a taser. And they're like, no, he's not a changeling. He's a little pissed at me now. now. <laughs> Zapped him right in the face. Uh, oh, man. This is a very old school style of playing. And you, you've you alluded to this a lot. You were pretty sure that a laser was going to go for something very aggressive on like a mid game timing and you could not have been more correct because this is this is going to be hyper aggressive but he doesn't need to go right away you can sometimes go with like you you get hydra range and you still go into like hydra speed behind it but if he doesn't go right away then blink and plus one are both going to be done as well as a significant number of gateways and that is going to significantly improve the ability for Ooh. mana to mount some kind of defense he does get a revelation out, sees a handful of these Hydras, and I mean, even just the timing of these Hydras is already a little bit alarming here. We're starting to see Shield Battery being thrown up inside the natural expansion, sentries being warped in back at home for Mana. I actually like a lot of the decisions he's making right now. Is he's, yeah, he really is just preparing for the big attack. Yeah, this absolutely is a significant attack coming in here from a laser. Uh, a laser. Not getting Bane Speed, by the way. He did out on the Bane Link Nest, but this is going to be a very bare-bones attack. Blink will complete now, and that's a very fortunate timing for Mana. He's trying to get in towards that Robotics Bay. Love the Stasis Wards, by the way, and good defensive Blink Micro so far. Oh, but Stasis Ward only getting a couple of Lings, and a Laser's got a lot of Hydras here. Battery Overcharge will get popped. I think a Laser should probably back away from that, but he's going to try and blow it up with Banes, 
and he will get through. Mana just doesn't have enough. A laser yeah, just it, blasts this... the third. Simply did not have enough. A wonderful recall. Oh my god, did he get out with the prompts? He got out with a lot of them, I think. Oh my god, yeah. softened up by a single baneling, but not quite killed. I still don't know if it's going to be enough. You, I think he can still stabilize somehow. Wow. If he's able to get a really clean defense off, you can lose the third and still make this work. But just does he have enough to actually stabilize? That's the thing. Battery overcharge is already on cooldown. There's nothing at the natural. Ooh. We are going to see these gateways getting depowered at the front. And Mana is just going to have no choice but to fold in the face of that relentless Hydra Bane attack. Very well done by a laser. And he can now kiss the group stage goodbye because he has made his way into the playoffs. I don't know why I've fixated on that. I like uh, the people who have basically woken up or tuned in a little bit late for the broadcast. They're like, why does he keep saying that? <laughs> they missed the very beginning if you do. Yeah, I mean, just this. being real awkward and like being like, oh, I've painted myself into a corner. How do I get out of this? <laughs> uh, but that is really great news for a laser. He's going to be real happy with this one because, I mean, nothing is a given. And especially when you have Clem Spirit Hero Marine, Mana, Skillis, Wayne in a group, like going out 3-1 or advancing 3-1 is a really nice scoreline. For Mana, he is going to have to come back on Sunday and try to qualify for that last opportunity, uh, do or die Sunday as I like to call it, where everyone is either eliminated or advancing. But uh, for now, we are going to head to a little break. We'll be back with another PvP between Goblin and Skillis. Don't go anywhere. You are watching the ESL Masters EU Regionals with NA to follow up after.
Welcome back, everyone. We just finished up a very aggressive ZVP from a laser. A laser came in hot and heavy with those uh, Hydras. Just kind of blasted right through Mana. Mana just seemed to be very much caught off guard by it. I, I, I looked at his defensive setup and I'm like, you know, he's got a decent number of cannons, decent number of uh, at least like, I think it was like two cannons, two batteries maybe. And a couple of well set up stasis wards, but unfortunately the stasis wards really got like nothing. The first round of blinks, kind of he lost like one or two of the stalkers right away, and a laser was just he was just going for it. He was he was full send on that attack, and gets his way through. Uh, now, what do you think at about this next match we've got coming up between Goblin and Skillis? Yeah, I think this is a fun one. Uh, Goblin has been a player that I think has been hyped up for a while, is like one of these potentials, and I think he's actually playing quite well right now. He was able to take out Mana, he was able to take out Hero Marine, really only has had his lo single loss to Clem, so I think Goblin has had an absolutely killer season so far. And in the meanwhile, Skillis is on the other end. He has defeated a laser, who we just saw as actually good enough to defeat Mana. Um, Defeated spots and lost a spirit one to two in a very, very kind of weird series. Um, but I feel like Skillis has just been that player that I feel like if you were to name a European Protoss player who is like the next below Showtime, maybe even competitive with Showtime in terms of being a top Protoss player below like Max Packs and stuff, it would be Skillis to me. Like if you say remove Max Packs and Showtime from the European region, who's the top Protoss player, my kind of head would just go to Skillis. So yeah. I'm quite excited to see how this is going to go and to see if Goblin on this kind of hot streak is going to be able to take down Skillis, if Skillis is going to continue to power on through and kind of prove that he's the top player. Yeah, this is a fun one for me. Honestly, for me too, uh, this is going to be really intriguing to see what happens here. Uh, Team Liquid, of course, already sending one player to the playoffs, but they, they didn't actually have a choice. Uh, one had to get through between Mana and a laser. But this is an opportunity for them to go double and, you know, really make things nice for them. Spawning down on the bottom right for the aforementioned Team Liquid. It is Skillis. And up here on the top left-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. He is Goblin. Representing Platinum Heroes. Affectionately known as the son of Roddy. I don't know if that nickname still really applies, but he plays enough Phoenixes that I think it should absolutely apply. And he, he plays them well enough as well. Uh, now, and he plays them in most matchups too. Like he'll, he'll play them in PVT. He'll play them in PVP. Not so much in PVZ these days, but I remember back in the day playing against someone named EG Disruptor RC oh on the NA ladder. And he used to do this cheeky little three Stargate Phoenix play off two bases. And I tell you what, he was real good at it. And it turned out that it would be Goblin. Man, can I just say, so I used to run a tournament where players have to register and they like play on the ladder to qualify for matches and they'd like earn money and stuff. It was called Ladder Heroes. I remember when Goblin emailed me to register for my event. And it, he re tried to register under the name EG Disruptor RC, <laughs> which is a reference back to Evil Geniuses when they had a sponsor by the name of Raid Call, and it'd be like they added it to the name. Yeah. And I'm like, this sounds like a troll. And I, I genuinely, for the following, like every single day for the following like two to three weeks, I was checking his account and being like, is this guy like cheating somehow? Yeah. Is this guy like a troll or something? I'm like, no, this. It's actually just like a legit good player. And it's, I'm so happy this man has changed his name into something more respectable, like Goblin, which is not a sentence <laughs> I thought I would say. But Yeah, that is actually a really funny way of putting that. Like, thank God he finally became a dis uh, respectable member of society, a Goblin. Like yeah. the, like the, the, one of the first, you know, like, I guess, fantasy villain type critter <laughs> critters, like way yeah. before even Lord of the Rings became a thing. I think goblins were were invented by something but that's going into deep lore and we are getting into game right now as we've got a stalker sentry opening versus a double adept uh goblin should be able to of course get the wall here okay i was gonna say as long as he's paying attention with that probe which he is and passes the first very early skill check 
Uh, we do. We did see something, by the way, that I just want to point out that just was cool that I didn't know you could do. So you can block, block projectiles by jumping in a gas geyser. A probe's zap actually got blocked by that earlier on. Like, it just didn't connect. I didn't oh, know that really? that was a thing. That is... That's a 99% useless fact if ever I've heard one. No, I have to take a look at the replay for that because I always thought that uh, there was... Is that a project? I know in... Yeah. I think it was in Brood War it was a projectile. Whereas the other units... I could be wrong about this. Nick Tasteless Plot somewhere out there just is like shit like a shaking awake in his sleep is like someone's spouting wrong things about brood war but you know <laughs> i think as far as i can Ooh. recall i think that uh probes were actually like ranged units in brood war but i don't think it's the case in starcraft 2 that's a surprise yeah i didn't think it was either um but just a, a weird neat little thing it, it's entirely yeah. possible that the damage actually did go through and it was just the animation that got like mm. weirdly funky i would have to take a look at things uh by the way we this see an attack. extremely fast third nexus out of Goblin. And Skillis, he built a quick robotic facility. He made so many sentries, six of them, is building a war prism, and he is going to tickle Cannon, that nexus, unto death, unless his opponent can out-tickle Cannon him. Yeah, I mean, the Immortal is walking its way across the map as well. I think that's something that's kind of... I thought he was going to wait for, but he's just going to go for it, potentially... Baits oh. out two force fields of his opponent without really taking too much damage outside of just a single adept. Two oh, or three of the sentries nice are fields. also getting locked in. This is an amazing start for Skillis. Yeah, that is really nice. And the Nexus did complete, which is a big problem. A lot of sentries getting popped here for Goblin. Still Skillis battery. really getting a lot done here. Battery overcharge gets popped and promptly taken out. Oh, but that War Prism is in some danger. It cancels the warp in by the skin of its teeth. And now Goblin has his own War Prism. There's double Guardian Shield because what else are you going to do with the energy, I guess? Goblin is going to make an unreal hold on this base. That snipe on the War Prism was like 0.2 seconds away from getting the Stalker Warp in. That truly was the difference between Skillis having a significant lead in this game versus what is happening now, which is Goblin has a significant lead in this game. This game has completely changed uh, the course of how it was going. War Prism, like you said, is also out for Goblin, which he was using defensively for Micro. Now he can use offensively as he moves out across the map. I mean, these two Adepts are looking to try and buy some time, but one of the Adepts already getting picked off means that a shield battery alone will help just deal with that single Adept. He doesn't have one in the natural, but I mean, he can just wall out the main, the third base. Oh, the shield battery did get uh, never got rebuilt there, so at the third. So maybe there's a little bit more that can happen with that Adept. Oh, Unfortunately, the Adept Shade actually uh, was Miss Micro there. It could have gotten into the pocket between the minerals. Instead, he's only able to get one kill. That could have actually been a lot of damage. Meanwhile, the uh, Adepts that were warped in aggressively, able to pick off three probes in the natural. I thought that was actually going to be a defensive warp in, in order to just deal with that, that one Adept that was warped in aggressively. Skillis, it is worth noting that even while he was attacking, he was taking his own third Nexus. So economically, he's still keeping pace with his opponent just fine. And Goblin is in a good position, but with Skillis getting a quicker blink behind this and holding his own third Nexus, Skillis is certainly not as far behind as I expected he would be, considering the difference in the resources lost. It is big. What I thought was going to happen was actually what is happening now, which is I thought Goblin was going to take the Warp Prism. I thought he was going to warp in offensively and he was going to mm -hmm. go for a big attack. If these units force field in those immortals oh. i actually th i don't know like can skills actually defend anymore and one of the immortals gets killed off through the shield battery overcharge a second immortal gets killed off and now there's just a single immortal left over just look at the army sizes right now and you can see it is double the army supply there for goblin he's got two adepts also drawing three stalkers into the main base as he continues to attack that was a perfect timing for Goblin right there. Uh, he caught those Immortals completely with the Force Fields. Sentries have gone through the biggest glow up you've ever seen in your life. Great War Prism <laughs> Micro, by the way, from Goblin to make sure that the probes really can't, really can't even slow this game down enough to give a real realistic chance to Skillis. Skillis is going to take game one, and he is going to be one map away from qualifying into the playoffs. This is very impressive right here out of Skillis. Oh, Big League 40 snipes the War Prism, and he grabs an Immortal. Yeah. Nah, not a chance. Goblin's looking so good in this game. Yeah, I think Goblin is going to be 
likely to take in number one now nearly not quite fully doubling the supply of his opponent but nearly doubling the supply for a little bit there a couple of force skills going to be thrown out he's going to end up losing actually a handful of units on the retreat there but there is just such a significant lead reinforcements are going to be coming in now that the war prism wasn't there he had to wait a little bit longer but he still gets them and all goblin has to do is hold on he has a fourth base coming up right now it's steadfast after having killed his opponent's third yeah and he's gonna have blink he's gonna have plus one weapons it's now two immortals to zero as they trade one for one there uh skillis is migrating these units very damn well mm -hmm. but it's gonna come out to a point where he just cannot continue to rebuild and cannot continue to match his opponent's production i think we're actually already hitting that point uh goblin was basically just waiting for additional gateways to come online skillis uh, he's gonna even lose this shield battery that was quite far forward in the natural so he won't really be able to make a defense off of that. And I think this, I think this warp in should probably do it here. Yeah, I like the attempt there from Skills. He said, "Okay, well, if I could just continue to buy time, snipe off the warp prism with a blink forward or something with some stalkers from behind, he knows it's not going to be enough." And Goblin taking game number one. The hot streak continues. Goblin just cannot be stopped right now. No, he cannot. He is cooking. He is, uh, he is killing it right now. Uh, there was one moment, by the way, wh basically when Goblin got the break and killed those three immortals, if Skillet had survived Skillis, if he had survived even another 20 seconds without losing those immortals, maybe 30, then all of a sudden, instead of being on two gateways, he's on eight because he had six yeah. gateways in production. That was that was the moment I was looking for. I was like, well, Skillis is actually in a pretty damn good spot. But you, you very poignantly pointed out that... Uh, Goblin had still a timing open in front of him where he was on four gates. He had all those sentries available. Skillis did not have warp prisms with that army. If he even had a warp prism realistically with that army, that, that three immortal, like two sentry army at his third, and he's just literally able to pick the immortals up from behind the force fields and just keep them alive until that, uh, until those gateways came online, then we're looking at a completely different scenario, I think, and we were probably still in that game. We might even see Skillis have made such a good defense that he actually is now winning the game. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I mean, to put it even another way, that shield battery was nearly when overcharged, nearly keeping some of those units alive for like an extra entire volley or something. If four seals were even just like slightly different and pushed a few stalkers further out of the way or something, if another one of the immortals of Goblin weren't quite in range of, uh, you know, the immortals that he was trying to target fire down or something, maybe that shield battery keeps units alive a little bit longer than the shield battery actually survives for a little bit longer because you can't just push in as easily then those gateways come online like small little things making big differences also let's rewind all the way back to the initial thing that put goblin ahead in that game the attack there from skillis which is a very bold large sentry based attack and everything the war prism being sniped off just seconds before that warp and everything like that was absolutely massive so many really small things deciding that game, I would say. Yeah, I really would love to have rewound from replay or just have like a, another existence of reality where the war prism <laughs> still gets sniped, but just those two stalkers warp in yeah. and see how different that fight would have been. Because my read, my, my thoughts are that it would have been quite significantly different. Like maybe not to the point where Skillis, you know, kills the third base and he comes out massively ahead. But at the very least, I think the trades are quite a bit more even maybe even skill is favored it's it's really hard to say but regardless of course that snipe comes in 0.2 seconds faster and he gets the gets the cancel and then the fight goes the way that it does and as a result now this man spawning up at the top right for team liquid is down zero to zero to one can he climb back it's skillis and down here in the bottom left hand side of the map we have the red Protoss player currently up one to zero. He is Goblin. Also, yeah, I think I misspoke. I think I said Skillis is going to win this game, but yeah, obviously yeah, yeah, I no meant worries. Goblin was going to win this game. He was way I far ahead. I think we'll in be supply. able to forgive you, Dave. You're dealing, <laughs> you're dealing with some health stuff during all this, and I think that most people could see that one of the players was up about fifty supply. Yep. And that you were probably talking about the player that was up fifty supply, not the player. Yeah. I, <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna give you a pass on that one, Dave. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I you know I, 
I like to think that I can read numbers and see that <laughs> one with three digits is higher than one with two digits. Uh, because we were at that point, it was like 117 supply to 71 or something. Like it was, yeah. it was a big difference. Uh, I am actually impressed though that Skillis held on even for like an extra two minutes from that point. I, I was surprised when we didn't see a tap out like shortly thereafter, but obviously once, once one player is that far ahead in a PVP, it's pretty much just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely very tough to, to bounce back from that kind of situation, but I like that Skill still gave it an attempt and still mm -hmm. made it look kind of interesting. I think you were even pointing out how he was still taking some surprisingly decent trades with his Blink Micro and everything, despite the fact that he was so far behind, which I think in and of itself is already quite impressive. And sometimes, you know, you never know. You can make some magic happen. I will say, as an enjoyer of Nina, who is a wonderful mm. Protoss streamer, mm -hmm. who has mounted many, many comebacks with just seemingly impossible situations through Blink Micro, I've become a believer that truly there are, in fact, some games that are redeemable. Maybe it's because your opponent makes some mistakes, but if you micro your heart out, sometimes you can force those mistakes out. So I, I don't hate that skill is stuck in it. No, I don't hate it at all. It's it's warm up for the next game. It can sometimes shake your opponent's confidence if they get such a huge lead and they can't close it out. Let's say let's say even Skillis drags that game on for another another extra like three four minutes. All of a sudden, Goblin's like, "I'm on four bases. He's on two. How am I not like? How has he still mm -hmm. been alive this whole time?" Uh, yeah. Obviously, it didn't pan out that way. But to to just paint a scenario, a specific scenario that you're talking about, let's say. Goblin picks up two Immortals in the War Prism. Skillis blinks forward and snipes the Prism with two Immortals inside. All of a sudden, you know, now it's like maybe 10 Blink Stalkers to, to eight against Goblins. Goblin isn't able to warp in. Skillis warps in defensively. And all of a sudden he get, he like carves himself out somehow a 10 army supply lead and then has a meaningful counterattack that maybe only has like a 5-10% chance of winning. 5-10% is a hell of a lot better than dead. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's definitely some kind of weird worlds where things can end up working out quite well. Uh, I do want to quickly talk about the state of this game, as we mm -hmm. did have Skillis going for uh, not only a Twilight Council for a fast flank, he also went for the gold base, but a lot, or not a lot, but like a little bit later a little bit than later, Goblin. Yeah. But Skillis is also setting up with a proxy gate in the bottom right over by the, like, the area of that gold base. That could be just for a little bit of like offensive warp-ins and stuff for this pressure and also setting up for like adepts and stuff when goblin eventually takes that base but man this this really feels like it could be a very scary timing as the first immortal is not even out just yet yeah i do like that goblin goes for the quick immortal off of this it is going to help him a lot with this particular play because once blink finishes skillis is going to blink across here i do want to point out goblin though putting the probe on patrol that is going to give him so much more advanced warning and skillis even with this aggressive move, well, Goblin's going to be able to answer it pretty quickly. Skillis will take the ramp because the sentries were not there just yet. But with the Guardian Shield popped with the Immortal out, I don't think Skillis can find a whole hell of a lot. You know, a really underrated thing. I like that that shield battery is actually so close to the, the main base because that shield guard battery on the low ground, the Immortal could actually run back to it right now. Yeah. I think that if the Stalkers decide to blink forward aggressively, they would be... Maybe I've actually been able to kill that off. I actually... I actually am a little bit surprised he didn't just blink forward aggressively for it. I think he would have if it was the old sentry. On the other side of the map, by the way, Double Adept does get a lot of damage done. Oh, there's the blink forward now. We are going to see Guardian Shield getting popped. The second Immortal does pop out, and Goblin is going to crush this attack. Ooh, that oh, did oh. so little. Oh, man, oh, man. Well, you, you were asking for the blink forward, and uh, he, he did it at about the worst possible moment. I, I wonder if he would have gone for it if it wasn't for these Adepts in the back. But Goblin is now up 15 workers, has better units fighting than his opponent. Skillis is in huge trouble. Uh, this is a unbelievably terrible spot now for Skillis. Sitting down 0-1, he's gonna look to try and get some damage on. This is a three stalker run by, so they can't even one-shot workers. Are not even able to get off a of volley on the workers anyways. It just softens up a single stalker. The gold base is also where Skillis took his uh, mining or took his uh, expansion at. So that means that these adepts can continue to deny mining for a little bit. They are eventually going to get found out. They are eventually going to get picked off. But Goblin is going to be feeling so comfortable oh. right now. Even finds an extra worker right before his blank finishes up. And Skillis is going to lose map control now. 
Yeah, this is so well done from Goblin. Goblin is playing out of his damn mind. The kid is actually just playing some of the best StarCraft I've ever seen him play. And that is saying a lot because he's he's put up some good results against some really great players. We are going to see the Stalkers of Skill is trying to force Gobbo back. Nice little pickoff on one of those sentries, but it's going to come at the cost of a Stalker. I think if Goblin can just find a way to outmaneuver these Stalkers and get across the map, that gold base is in massive trouble. Ooh, a blink onto the War Prism would have been huge there, but unfortunately, Skillis was not able to find it. Yeah. Skillis tries to go for a little bit of harassment, but it is going to get pushed back as Goblin has some Stalkers defensively warped in. And now Skillis, his mining has been reduced back down to a single base, if that, as we're at like seven minutes into the game, and we're already starting to see some of those mineral patches getting very, very close to mining on out. This is going from bad to worse as Goblin's even thinking about a third base right now. He's force fielding in the workers to try and snag those kills. So even if, even if he starts getting cleaned up over here, as long as he doesn't lose literally everything in the most one-sided way possible, he's still just going to have such an economic edge that he should still be able to recover. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was going to point out that the gold base does make up for a little bit of a probe difference, but not this much of a probe difference. Yeah. Skillis is trying to be annoying on the back line with those stalkers, but they finally get tracked down by Goblin stalkers. And Goblin takes the 2-0, and he is now in to the playoffs. Very well done from Goblin through a really tough set of players. Yeah, absolutely phenomenally well done. Goblin truly earning his uh, spot there. It's like you said, beating a lot of very, very good players. Not only Skillis, who, again, like if you take out Max Pax and Showtime, Skillis is probably just one of the best, if not the best, European Protoss player after those two. And Kira Marine also, just like Big Gabe, one of the best Terran players in Europe. Mana also a mainstay who's been doing quite well for himself in this group stage as well. All very, very strong players. The only loss being to Clem. I think a very excusable loss right now. He's basically one of the kings of Europe, if not the king of Europe at the moment. Uh, just stellar performance there by Goblin. And I'm happy that Skills is still going to have a shot in round five to try and qualify for the playoffs because I still expect a lot from him. But man, so happy for Goblin to sh get his kind of day in the sunlight. Yeah, and I'll even uh, I'll even amend one of your one of your points there. Kira Marine is not just one of the best players in Europe. He's one of the best TVP players in the world. Like, this yeah. is a guy who takes down top Koreans on a pretty consistent basis at offline tournaments. Goblin really showed up for this, this tournament, and I am very excited to see what he can do in the playoffs. But for now, we are going to switch gears a little bit. First of all, we're going to take a five-minute break, but we will be back with a the first and only elimination match of eu today uh it is going to be battle b it is going to be strange and we will be back after five minutes stick around
Welcome back, everyone. We are once again live with the final match of EU. This is going to be a banger, I think. We've got a few players, a couple players, that are on the ropes, verge of elimination, but have... Well, at least one of them has had a really strong showing despite being one and two. And uh, we talked about this before, Battleby looking like he has taken a huge step forward in his competitive journey. Yeah, it's going to be a very important match for him because, of course, this is, like you said, an elimination match for both these players. The loser of this is going to be knocked out of the EPT regionals. I think this is especially... I always feel like it's a little bit more poignant for me when I think about the European regionals when it comes to an event that leads into a North American event because, you know, it's like things like the extra travel and all that stuff. Like, even if you're not necessarily earning one of those top four spots to have your travel and everything secured, earning a little bit more money to help justify to your team or even just send yourself out to like a North American event and stuff. All of that stuff can be really, really helpful, especially for up and coming young aspiring players like Battle B and stuff. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Battle B and as well as even Strange as well to try and get something done over here and make sure that you do not get just eliminated in the group stages over here. So I'm I'm very, very interested to see how this series is going to go. Battle Bees had some tough opponents that you hinted at before, Dave. And I think this is going to be probably one of the opponents that Battle Bee, I think if there's anyone in this group that he probably has a decent shot at compared to his other opponents, I think someone like a strange is someone you expect. Yeah, you have to be able to beat if you want to advance out of groups. Absolutely. And that's not to discount Strange as a player because Strange is quite good. He made mm -hmm. it into the regionals. He was able to take down DNS. But I, I think the, the quality of players does have to be regarded when you're you're comparing these two players. Uh, and that's not to say losing O2 to Spirit or O2 to a laser is, you know, some huge black mark on your record as a player. No, those are two top tier players from Europe. But Battleby took a game off of Clem. And 2 old Wayne, who with Cyril not competing right now, is the fourth best Zerg in this particular tournament. Like, Battleby, yes, he got 2 would by Mana, but he is, he is looking damn fine. Now, it will come down to who shows up better today. And that's the thing, when you, you aren't as experienced, maybe... It is worth noting that even, even though I feel like Battleby is the favorite right now... He's still got a ways to go. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're going to find out how things will go as we head into Oceanborn from game number one. Starting up in the top left-hand side of the map. Top of the red Protoss player. He is none other than Strange, representing Mystery Gaming. And his opponent spawning down in the bottom right. Known as the Battle Booty by Roddy. It is Berserker Air's Esports Battle B. Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right about that in kind of how you sort of portrayed Battle B's position. I do still actually have some decent expectations for Strange. I think he's still been one of those relatively consistent European Protoss players where it's not necessarily that he's risen up to the ranks of Showtime and Skillis and Max Packs and all these other top Protoss players. I think he has been a very solid kind of middle of the pack Protoss player in Europe, mm -hmm. which I don't mean as an insult. I mean, in a very competitive region like Europe, being in the middle of the pack is actually in and of itself a pretty significant achievement. So I do think that Strange is going to act as a still very strong gate for Battle B to try and overcome. And well, I still have some good expectations for him in this game. Yeah, so do I. I. I think Strange can definitely go toe to toe uh, on his best day, but I think the best days we've seen from Battle B have been maybe some of the best days of his career. He's really hitting and hitting hitting a new power spike in the last little bit. He's really hit, yeah, hit a new power spike in the last couple of months or so. Um, maybe not a full on MMR peak, but getting up to like six point five k on EU ladder is really freaking good that is an insane achievement for ev anyone uh despite some of the you know top european players being like well you know like oh he's just a 6k protoss or like oh he's just like a 5.8k whatever it's like no nah, man you're 7k like that's really good that like being like hitting 6k on eu 
that puts you in a pretty elite number or uh, elite uh, company. But hitting 6.5k, that is an even smaller club. Yeah, most definitely. Now, we are going to see a pretty normal looking opening over here from both these players, but we do have a Robo first coming out there from Strange. So he's going to get oh. this adept out, try and get a little bit of scouting information or anything, but not going to go for, you know, a Twilight Council or Stargate or anything like that. Just went straight up to the Robo. Yeah, that is, uh, well, that, that is him living up to his name a little bit here. That is quite a strange move. Mm -hmm. uh, Battleby, yeah. oh, looks like his Reaper might have been on a shift command. Did get kind of caught there for a second, and Stalker will be able to shoo it away. Uh, the th There's no wall on the high ground Reaper jump point, so if Battleby wants to actually get the scout, he is going to have to, well, he's going to have to commit into the main base at least a little bit with that Reaper. Uh, nice little find from Strange Over. with his first Adept. And that should be able to shade out before the Cyclone can get the kill. Honestly, I'm looking at some of the early game micro, and as much as I've talked up Battle B, like, it's not as sharp as maybe I was thinking it might be. Does ultimately get the kill on that Adept, but, you know, didn't, didn't go in right away. Maybe he was uh, focused on the Reaper a little bit more. Ultimately does get the Scout, and that's the most important thing. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's too early to say how strong these players look. Yeah, I think all those little early game moves and everything, there's small little things, small little edges and stuff, but I'm not going to read too, too much into those. As mm -hmm. I think the bigger decisions and stuff are going to be coming a little bit down the pipeline as we do have Battle B getting up his siege tanks, getting up his combat shields before stim. Yeah. And robotics bay also coming up there for strange. This is a very interesting little setup here from Battle Beat. This is such yeah. a fast shields here. Uh, Scout will come into the main base. We'll see that it is a very quick robotics bay. And you know what? If Strange tries to take this third Nexus, which is exactly what he's going to do, Battle Bee is going to have a really strong push timing. How many siege tanks do we have so far? Just the one, but a second one is in production. And Observer mm. will see an SCV moving out, but I don't think it saw the actual army. There is not a whole lot to stop this. He went for three Observers, no Immortal. Strange is going to have a very difficult time holding this, I feel. Yeah, such a strange push, too, because the combat shields, you can get that a little bit faster than the stim. It means that your army is also a little bit more endurable, so you don't actually need the medevacs either as much. Like, the combat shields kind of compensating for the medevacs. Even building a bunker over here, this is such a difficult third base to defend. If there was a shield battery over here, even then it would maybe be a bit tough because you wouldn't have overcharge available with the Nexus not finished up. A cancel forced out. Colossus finally pops out, but I mean, it's too late. And even then, Comet Shield Marines, they can actually maybe absorb a little bit more of the damage from the Colossus if they really found an opportunity to. I don't even think he has to take this fight. He could just return home. He did the damage. He absolutely did. He forced the cancel on that third Nexus. That was a huge opportunity cost for Strange. He committed into that third Nexus with the intention of keeping it alive. And Goblin, what am I saying? Goblin Battle Bee. I got Goblin mm -hmm. on the brain. Uh, Battleby is able to retreat out. He even got the kill on the sentry with that siege tank before it went down. So he's able to even let it do its thing. Didn't try and save it when it was realistically never going to be saved. This is really nicely done from Battleby. And I, this feels very much like Battleby is like, okay, this is what you're doing this game, Strange. You're going to take a really greedy third base in terms of tech. I'm going to craft this build. It's still going to have a really nice stim timing behind it but I'm going to set myself up for an amazing position in the mid game. And Battle B, if he doesn't take any damage, he's going to be in a pretty amazing position going into this mid game. I think it's worth mentioning that there is something that Strange has going for him. And that's the fact that medevacs are so delayed with the choices that Battle B went for. Battle B was not yes. able to do all that for absolutely free. He is not going to have medevacs. So even with Stim finished up, every Stim is going to actually be quite costly. He still is not started up the first two medevacs so it still even has a little bit more time and there are two colossus out with a third colossus about to pop is there a potential for strange to get out an additional warp in of units or something he's only got two warp kits so it doesn't seem super likely right now i was wondering if maybe he could deny the third base for a little bit and kind of compensate for the economic losses of the third base that he took but i think it's going to be pretty tough for him right now and he is going to just return home yeah, uh, I think he was looking for maybe an opening slash a mistake from Battle B. Uh, Battle B didn't really make one. 
A uh, couple of things happening. Unfortunate scans right there for Battleby. Obviously, he... Oh, God. Oh, God, that Colossus. If he notices, he can kill it right now. Uh, He's like, I okay. saw it moving in this direction. Where is it? It should be showing up here any second. Okay, so Battleby scanned the original... Th First of all, he scanned his natural for the Observer. Didn't see it. And then scanned the original third base location. So Strange is a player that will do two base all-ins. And that is why Battleby spent that extra scan and was a little bit worried about what his opponent was doing. Uh, we do see Battleby, by the way. He went double engineering bay off of this two racks, no starport setup. Went for a very fast third command setup, very fast double engineering bay. And a really nicely timed armory is going to allow him to start up 2-2 pretty much right away. But Strange, can he get anything done with a defensively set up Terran and a couple of siege tanks? Mm. I, I don't know. It's going to be tough, but, you know, we do have Temple Archives to finish John up. Archons and stuff can be made very shortly. There is going to be kind of like an interesting window over here. He's going to be attacking in from the angle where the bunker isn't quite, but he's going to be attacking into the bunker regardless. Siege tanks get taken care of. Hallucinated Archon's also going to be trying to absorb some damage on those Colossus on the back lines. Absolutely putting in work. Is there enough gateway units to actually buffer for the Colossus, though? That is the question. Uh, we did have the warp and use. There's still three Colossus here. I thought there was no way this was going to break through, but Strange just absolutely pummeling through and will be able to make it happen with the Archon mm -hmm. Colossus timing. Those hallucinated Archons take so much damage. Oh my god, that was very unexpected. Looking at that, I, I thought for sure with two siege tanks and high ground advantage, I yeah, I was not expecting that to work so well. I really want to rewind it back to, again, there were decisions that Battle be made in order to get that early game damage done of canceling that Nexus. And again, it comes back in my mind to how much he delayed the starport which delays the first set of medevacs. And once you have simply, like, you want to have at least two medevacs. You need some degree of healing out. But that also means that we were at a point where three Colossus were out on the map and there was not a medevac. Now you're making the choice, do I make medevacs or do I make Vikings? Because I'm going to be so delayed on this. So even just the three Colossus there being completely uncontested, the only thing that could have gone super wrong there is if Strange had lost his gateway buffer a little bit too quickly by just overwhelming numbers, and then his Colossus get overrun. But he was able to get out enough units off of those eight gateways. He was able to create just enough of a buffer with those charge loss and everything to push through while the Colossus dealt out the damage they needed to. I mean, just really, really nicely timed there by Strange, because I think as you were kind of alluding to, if there was any more time that Strange had waited around, or maybe if he'd even gone a little bit too early there, I think he actually would have been overrun. Very possibly. Uh, so there's, I, I like to think of Battleby as Hero Marine Jr., as Big Gabe Jr. Uh, what was missing there? What Hero Marine would have done in that situation? I think he would have pulled the SCVs into that fight, and I think that would have made a huge difference in yeah. that one and without him doing so he just didn't quite have the front line to blast through those gateway units as quickly as he needed to because even even just a couple marauders getting on top of that those colossi and battle B will hold and he'll hold with a really good army supply but that doesn't turn out the way that i was kind of thinking it might have we have spawning down in the bottom right for mystery gaming it is strange And over the top left-hand side of the map, we have the blue Terran player. It is Battleby from Berserker Esports. Well, that actually does put Battleby in a very tough spot. His back is up against the wall as he is now down 0-1. And he is in an elimination match. Like This is do or die now. He's got to win both of the next two games or he's going to be out of the EPT European Regionals. Yeah, and one, once again, I really have to express how, and not, not to take anything away from Strange, how much of a shame that would be considering how strongly he started this group with a 2-0 over Wayne and a uh, one, or a, yeah, like a really hotly contested series against Clem. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that Battleby still has a lot to be proud of so far with his mm -hmm. performance in these EPT regionals, but it's a little bit tough. The... Like performance and stuff and how you do definitely ends up affecting like how, what opponents you end up getting you end up getting some pretty tough opponents so 
He's got to find a way to turn things around. That last game, he went for a very, very kind of cute style build. Mm -hmm. And this game, I mean, we do have, looks like a more normal uh, kind of looking opening so far, but it wasn't at this point that we started seeing all the weirdness coming out from Battle Beast play. It, to me, at least the first thing I noticed was really just the delay on the starport and the hacking up for the combat shields over Stim. So we'll yes. see if he's going to find something similar again. Yeah, the, the first the first real tell there was the second barracks. Uh, and we're not going to see that quick second barracks here. We are, we did see Battle B, unless I'm mistaken, his orbital command was a couple seconds late. It was not crazy late, but started his first Marine, started his uh, orbital command just a little bit later, and he is going to follow things up with a completely different build. That is going to be a really fast third command center. And interestingly enough, we might actually see another delayed starport off of this. Yeah, uh, that's... I think the nature of it will be a little bit different, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it won't be. It won't be the same style, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll we'll see how things go. I am very curious how Strange is going to be playing this out. If he's going to be doing something similar yet again, because with that first like one gate Robo kind of style again, off we'll the expand, if he's going to go into another one of those Colossus plays and everything, is he going to identify and like scout out what Battlebee's up to and say, all right, well, maybe I won't go for that kind of same style push out and everything if he's going to play a little bit more defensive secure his third base and chill back a little bit more i would not mind that at all i actually just want to go back in time just a little bit as well if that scan had hit the observer in the natural i don't think strange ever tries the attack that he did because strange mm -hmm. if he doesn't have vision of that position then i cannot imagine you ever going for an attack like that kind of blindly up a ramp into a bunch of stimmed bio with 1-1. One, one. Uh, that's that's just something I wanted to mention that, once again, StarCraft II is a game of inches where little differences make such... They, they have such a profound impact on the game. Uh, we are going to see the Observer coming on in. Did it see the third CC? It did not. No. But he sees the... Hey, he didn't see it. He sees the... Uh, Delayed Starport once again. And look at this. Strange actually throwing down a second Forge off of this. This is... This gives me uh, vibes of the player Ashbringer, who loves to do, like, <laughs> really low probe count, super fast upgrades, and, like, just make, like, a really big one-punch army. Yeah, it's a very, very intriguing setup here. That is such a fast 1-1 one -one setup as the engineering base starts for the Terran. Yeah, and I mean, you double that up with Chrono Boost, the effect of that, and just the fact that this is like 1-1 one, one starting up with the Colossus coming out and out before a third base has actually even been thrown down. It's pretty wild, actually. Yeah, this is this is a bit of an insane person's build. Uh, this is like, <laughs> this is really crazy coming out from Strange here. Uh, We're going to see that Hallucination Scout confirming the third CC. And Strange will need to take a third Nexus. Battlebee is already up a worker, which is... I mean, economically, that's a problem for the Protoss when there's already three CCs and finished orbital. But yeah, I wonder if he can start to bully with the first couple of Colossus on the map and maybe keep his opponent I, from landing the third for a while. Surely that's like that's the game plan, right? Is it, if you're yeah. gonna go for one one this quickly, that has to be the game plan. Otherwise, you would maybe be thinking about grabbing your one one after your third base started up or something. You wouldn't delay it that much. But so I, I imagine he has to do some th kind of timing like that. But I think Thermal Lance uh, it may, may be finishing up a little bit before 1-1. One, one. But I think all three of those upgrades are going to be finishing up around a similar time. He's even knocking down the rocks right now so he can have a quick move across the map. And actually, the timing of this, if this is going to hit right as Battleby is starting to set up his third base, there may be an opportunity here where Battleby is not situated up that ramp with bunkers and all of his units kind of well positioned and very very easily defended is maybe right at the moment where battle b is potentially the most vulnerable yeah and his tanks are on siege an observer sees it battle b did scan his opponent's base and saw that uh the double forge was cooking he obviously doesn't know how far along one one upgrades are but i think strange with the observer just saw yeah that those tanks sieged up and he's like okay well mm. i can't attack into two or maybe at this point, even three sieged tanks. Uh, Battleby did make a little adjustment, by the way. Added the second engineering bay quite a bit quicker than you normally would have. 
No armory, so we won't be able to get into plus two with this. But I do like the little adjustment to his opponent. Strange, for his part, starts up that 2-2 very quickly. And I think he just wanted to see what he could hmm. get done with this. But I'm really worried about, like, Battleby's potential to just maybe kind of run away with the supply a little bit off of this great economic start he's got. Yeah. No, I'm 100% I'm with you. And I thought for maybe oh a God, minute... Oh, my God, missed the scan again. Mm, just barely. Oh, that's painful. Yeah, I, I thought for a minute maybe Strange was waiting for charge and his four gateways to finish up so you could get a big round of warp ins and then get aggressive and dive in on top of the siege tanks and everything. But he never made a warp prism. Doesn't have any proxy pawn or anything. There's finally a scanning gets the observer. There's the warp prism coming out now. So maybe he tries to make the same attack with plus two plus two, which I mean is a very significant lead. Don't get me wrong on the upgrades. That's a massive lead with it. He's going to have a full set of upgrades ahead. And he's going to potentially have Archons and everything. But this is also giving Battleby the opportunity to get more of tanks up. He's going to have a bunch of these ghosts up. I actually, I don't know if the economic advantage that you were talking about is just going to be a little bit too strong for Battleby. Or if Strange is actually going to somehow miraculously repeat the last game and make some magic happen in a situation that I wasn't sure was going to be possible. I think it's going to be really tough to attack into a sieged up Terran with this number of ghosts. Uh, we do only have one Archon at the moment, but there's gas enough for a couple more. Battleby sees the timing of the fourth base. That's obviously great information for him. Is that a Marine on the top side as well, checking the other base location? It is. Mm -hmm. Battleby doing a lot of things nicely here. Uh, that's a fair amount of bio that you don't want to just throw away, but here comes the attack from Strange. What do mines do burrow up? Gonna get some decent shots here. The bunker gonna help out a lot, and I think that there should just be enough here for Battleby, but the 2-2 upgrades are really good. Where is the Warp? The Warpism is super far back. There is a warp in of Zealous oh that could God. be helping out a lot in this fight, but maybe he doesn't SCDs. even need the help. The Colossus, the Colossus are staying alive through all of this, and Strange has broken through yet again. GG gets called, and Strange takes a 2-0 over Battleby. I actually want to make a quick note. Like, I was watching this, I'm not, I'm like double checking right now. I, I think he had five or six ghosts or something in that. I only heard one EMP go off. I actually don't think he got more than one EMP. I don't even think the EMP hit the Archons. I think he got no. caught a little bit off guard by that. I, I think you are right about that. I, I feel like even though he okay. was sieged up, it felt like he was very much caught off guard by it. Uh. He that was not what I expected to see when I looked at that fight. I, I thought we were going to see, and, and I think it was actually another similar situation to the previous game, where if he pulls SCVs into that, he can get just enough bulk to blast mm. through that front line and kill the Colossus again. That is twice where he lost to a, a different setup, not quite the exact same, but a very similar situation where he was just one, uh, maybe five, ten supply mm. more away from cleaning up that army and blasting through and I, I i know nobody wants to pull their scvs into a fight but sometimes you just have to you just don't have a choice it is rough and i did double check so what happened was he got the emp he got a couple of emps off on the back line of units but he missed most of the zealots which were either already on the front line and he wasn't emping those or they were units that were rallying forward so he emps the units on the back line they all lose their shields like the colossus and all these stalkers and the sentries and stuff but then the Zealots are the ones actually taking the damage. All the units in the back line are fine. More reinforcing Zealots show up. And all of those units, like all those EMPs didn't really end up doing nearly as much as I think Battleby was hoping for. I think that plus, you know, some of the stuff you were just talking about right now, like makes it really tough. But strange, man, really hitting a great timing there and catching Battleby off guard. Gets himself that 2-0, man. He, though, that same Colossus push basically at a later time makes it work. Yeah, uh, obviously a different setup with the 2-2, but I really did not think that that was going to work at all. And Strange just kind of ran at his opponent with almost the same thing twice in a row. And it worked so unexpectedly. And I, I just... <laughs> yeah. Good job for Strange. Great, great job. But, like, that is a series that I am pretty sure is going to haunt Battleby for a while. Uh, and and I hope he I hope he can still be pleased with his performance because it was magnificent. 
obviously congratulations to strange he'll be back on sunday with an opportunity to make the playoffs which is mm -hmm. very good for him um but i really want to you know battle be don't take it to heart like that was you played well uh and hopefully we'll see him next season and maybe maybe just maybe we'll see him in dallas i don't know I, it's obviously something we can't be sure about but that wraps up eu for now uh, and we are going to take a, I guess, six-minute break. And then we'll be back with the NA server. Don't go anywhere. This has been the ESL Masters Regional EU. And it is going to be ESL Masters Regional Americas. Starting with the round three for that one. Don't go anywhere. I am steadfast. I'm joined by Fear Dragon. And yeah, we'll stick around.
Welcome back, everyone. This is the, well, this is the ESL regionals now for the NA region. Uh, switching things up from the E region, we had six best of threes there. Uh, only had to say goodbye to one player, but unfortunately it was my my new, you know, StarCraft to crush Battleby. Uh, <laughs> of course, he will be back, but I have been really, really enjoying his play just in general. And hopefully he doesn't take that loss too much to heart. Still ends up with a really glittering resume from this one. But uh, we're going to be changing things up, first of all. Got to thank our sponsors here. Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, the U.S. Air Force, and ESL Shop. Uh, obviously, without whom we would not be able to, you know, do this whole thing. Uh, in addition, if you want to attend the offline event taking place in Dallas, uh, you're able to get your tickets now. That is happening May 30th to June 2nd, uh, wherever DreamHack Dallas is taking place. I'm not sure offhand. But, uh, Dallas. It, oh, well, Dallas, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't know what the building is, but you can Google <laughs> DreamHack.com. Uh, and speaking of which, you can go to DreamHack.com slash Dallas slash tickets, where you'll also probably find the information where you can buy the tickets themselves using the code StarCraft. You get 15% off. So do that if you are planning to go. I mean, it's, it's literally free real estate. It's free money. But <laughs> what do you think about these two players coming at us for this one? Max Angel versus Trigger. I know you're a big fan of both of these lads. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, to put it in context, there are four players in the North American region who I, I would say maybe you could say like five players sometimes. Five players who stand above the rest in terms of like what you expect for them or capable of maybe winning the entire regionals funny enough one of those players is currently sitting on one and one because just the way the math works out in the groups one of them had to be a little bit below or, uh lower but uh astrea trigger scarlet kelizer and special i would normally name as like those five uh specials currently sitting on one and one because of his loss to trigger who is going to be playing in this match so astrea and trigger are going to be kind of volleying to see who's going to be the player that makes it out of their group with an undefeated record here, which is already really sick. I think that this could very well end up be, this could very well end up being the finals of the North American regionals as well. Cause I think that both these players are unbelievably strong. Scarlet or special or Kelzer could always make for an upset and kind of, or not even an upset, but they could also make for a play and be in the finals as well. But this is just a really, really hype match to me. This is just PVP madness. There's two friends who've play with each other a lot. Trigger plays Australia all the time on the ladder. They literally have like Osu showdowns where they're playing for like mouse accuracy and stuff. Trigger was a few weeks ago or maybe it was a month ago or something now, literally staying at Australia's house and just like they were hanging out and having a good time. This is going to be a very fun match. I'm sure filled with like all kinds of fun little mind games and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, fun fact about that, that little trip, uh, trigger. So I live pretty close to the airport around, uh, well, where, where trigger was flying out of and he lives out in the middle of nowhere. So he was like, Hey, can, do you mind if I like stay over the night before? It's like, yeah, of course. Why not? Like that's, that's cool. We took him out for dinner, took him out for Boba. It was a very fun little interaction. My girlfriend and I, uh, and you know, sent him on his merry little way. Uh, he's, he's so polite. He's, he's anyone who's met trigger. Like he's, yeah, he's very, very neat. I like, I like trigger as a person a lot. He's, he's so young, but like the difference between him when he's like playing a game of Starcraft versus him just, you know, anywhere else is so juxtaposed. He's got so much swagger when he's playing and hopefully we'll see that right here. We're going to get into Eventually. it in just a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I realized I didn't set it up very well. <laughs> so we have spawning down in the bottom right for Basilisk. It is Trigger. And over here in the top left-hand side of the map, we have our blue Protoss player. He is Astrea, Max Angel. And yeah, Trigger, I love hanging out with Trigger. Uh, he is actually one of my favorite people to hang out with at events right now because he's one of the, he's like an old soul in some ways mm. weirdly enough he just has this taste for all of these things that 
you know, only 90s kids would get. And then Trigger would be like the Zoomer who gets all the 90s things. Like all, <laughs> all those memes. He's like, I, yeah, I know Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah, I listen to like Linkin Park and all these other bands and stuff from the 90s. And I listen to Backstreet Boys. I'm like, dude, you're listening to like Avon so like, oh, You were born in the wrong generation, man. Like, this is so cool. I actually enjoy bonding with him a lot. He's just a super duper fun very very cool guy and uh also a really fun sick sense of humor as well i like him a lot same you know i can say not exactly the same things about astrea i love astrea also but i love him for very different reasons but they're both just like such lovable guys astrea is like the cuddly teddy bear of the protoss race who you can't like yeah. i like hate astrea any percent challenge has no record posted because you just can't hate the guy. Like, it's not possible. Yeah. Anyone who's hating on Astrea, they've got a problem with me personally. They may not have met me, but they've done something <laughs> somewhere that makes me just like, dude, like, no. Like, you, yeah. he is just such a sweetie pie and such a, such a great personality. Uh, I'll also say, like, specifically about that, I know there are definitely a lot of people, as of course we do have PvP, the intro, beginning of the game, there's not too much happening. We'll see what happens after, like, we see the additional openings and stuff from these units and everything. is double adept for trigger, stalker sentry for Astraea. Cool. But Astraea, I think there's a lot of people who are very nice people, mm -hmm. but then they're also, like, to put it a little bit, like, meanly, like, sometimes they can also be a little bit blander. Like, they're very PC all the time and everything. Astraea also has, like, a little bit of a fun streak about him where he's, like, such a nice person, but also he's still willing to, like, have fun and poke like poke a little bit of fun at people and meme around and stuff and say like some slightly mean say seeming things but it's just like with such a big grin and smile on his face like oh i know you're kidding and you're just such a lovable teddy bear please stab me with your knife in the back i i love it and he's like haha it was rubber <laughs> <laughs> and you're like oh yeah. so cute um but like honestly super super wholesome lads uh, now, we do have to talk oh. about what has happened here. Double Adept versus no wall. no wall. This is super weird that he didn't go for the wall in here. And he is going to lose three pro... Oh, no, he's not. Psych. Get juked. That was sick. Man, sending the probe into the gas, guys. are dodging the shot. Very, very nice. I, I also... I was a little bit surprised also because the wall in for Estrella with his gateways and stuff happens on the far side away from the ramp mm -hmm. rather than... The area where I thought maybe like you kind of wall in so that the depth have to shade a longer distance around or something at least. So it's kind of like what I call the Roddy Bait Wall, where yeah. it looks like it's a really good wall or like place for a depth to shade on in, but then it's actually a trap. You just end up losing the depth. You're like that didn't make any sense. You didn't wall off. Like this, you didn't do what you're supposed to do in PvP. But no, it it didn't even look like that to me for Australia. This is just like a clean pathway for the depths to make their way in. Yeah, um, but with only getting two probes, as he saved that third one. I actually yeah. think I, I still like it a little bit for Astrea. Uh He is oh, down great. in workers a couple, but I don't know. I, I just love when like little stuff like that happens where it's like they jump into the gas and save the worker. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the good stuff right there. That's the micro I, I dream of doing one day <laughs> when I finally grow up. Ooh, got a cool move out over here from Astrea. Handful of the sentries, handful of stalkers. Two adepts also going to be joining the fray. And this is going to be at a very interesting time because Trigger is about to pop out with an immortal and a warp prism of his own. And this is where I feel like I get a little bit afraid. If Astrea overstays his welcome even a little bit over here, I think the warp prism will actually allow him to chase down Astrea's units with that immortal. Yeah, this is a scary situation. But we do see Astrea continuing to build units. He's gotten his own Immortal. It is going to show up. But I, I think that... I think you do land on a really good point. Like, the War Prism just gives so much potential. Trigger is going to be going for a Dark Shrine behind this. <laughs> which is... the War Prism away. Oh. Uh, I mean, as long as he's not taking the th third, it should be fine. Is there Shield Battery at the Natural? Probably not. Trigger's not a big fan of building uh, Shield Batteries. He, he doesn't like absolutely know that he needs Ooh, uh hallucination so yeah there, okay there is a shield battery at the natural but the sentries are not far enough forward to cover it right here this could be very scary immortal getting pushed into the fight that's a fake a fake immortal in the front and it feels like astrea for just a second believed maybe it was real because he was like <laughs> i can kill this immortal still oh very nice force fields well it actually only 
ends up getting one unit. Oh, this, the fight is still going on, I think, on the bottom side. Yeah, and he grabs the Immortal. Astrea does. That's a huge find. Great force yeah. fields. Now, there is a DT warp in. Do we have an Observer? We have two. There, there is an Observer or two out on the map right now. But I want to note that one of the Observers is still making its way back over to the main base. It does finally make its way over there. But did force out a recall on a couple of those units, which does force Astrea back as well. Because he lost so many units there. He did manage to find some of those like Immortals and stuff all with the force fields and everything. But Trigger still just did such a nice job of managing to make a defense happen. Where I want to note that Hallucinated War Prism sent four of stalkers uh four of trigger stalkers over the main base right as that push came in yeah. that looked like such a dangerous moment and trigger came out of that looking like he's actually okay he's still gonna be down a few workers he's still in a kind of weird spot over here right now but he has archons finished up he has or sorry he has archon ability for that to be made with the dark templar he's able to find a little bit of damage and he's actually doing a little bit of counter damage now yeah, uh, we will see the double adepts into the main base. They're going to be annoying to deal with here. Okay, Australia just picking up and getting out of there. We do have that one Archon that you alluded to. I don't know if it can actually help too much here. It's obviously going to break those force fields and allow the army to retreat out easily, but the guardi or the battery overcharge will make it so that you can't really stick around. It is still a low gateway count for Australia. He just now started two more. Trigger added on an extra gateway with intention of being aggressive here. And he's got that Blink Stalker upgrade. This is looking kind of scary right now. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of potential here, but the third Immortal really does make things a lot more difficult here. The fact that Estrella wasn't able to kind of break through on that first push-in before the third Immortal, before extra shield batteries and stuff finish up, I think that makes things a lot tougher. And you can kind of see that Estrella has still been able to be annoying with these two adapts. He's going to be able to focus far down. Maybe one or two workers. Ooh, nice warp in position. Oh my god. He almost, Trigger almost ended up saving all of his pros, but the pros go back to mining because they're very ignorant to the fact that there's danger about <laughs> Yeah, they do not have the greatest survival instincts, uh, no. workers in general. They, my workers have terrible survival instincts. Oh, okay. I was going to say that's a bold move from Trigger to just move right under the observer, but I guess he was expecting that the observer wasn't there. Uh, Trigger still gets three probes considering the fact that there was an observer in position. I'm a little bit surprised by that. This has already been a pretty weird game. Astrea does have quite a bit faster plus one weapons and his blink will complete very shortly. Their fourth Nexus timings are very similar, but I do, th oh man, they're both going so heavy in Immortals. The sentry change seems to have really made players shift harder into Immortals in this matchup. A quicker robotics facility and, and lots of little sentry Immortal pushes. We're seeing this kind of echo into the mid game with really high immortal counts relative to what we usually see in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, Immortals have definitely been showing uh, to be quite fearsome in a lot of these kind of fights and stuff, but I am really, really curious. Uh, we see that Shadow Stride is being researched here for Trigger. I feel like the game is kind of in an, an interesting stabilized spot where Astrea does have like a very notable worker lead, but both these players are grabbing their fourth bases. Their armies are like looking relatively similar in power level, I feel like. I mean, yeah. Trigger's a little bit behind maybe in the weapon upgrade that you were talking about, but I really do feel like this is kind of an even game, but then I see that and I keep thinking that and then I keep looking at the worker supply and I'm like, Straya is up like 15, almost 20 workers. And I think that gap is starting to close now as Trigger starts to re like remake some workers a little bit more quickly. But it's it's so funny because I my brain just can't quite wrap my head around like who's actually in a better spot right now well i think until the fourth base completed uh that worker count wasn't as impactful but now yeah. that it's done and now that astrea is mining from it i mean he basically has it instantly fully saturated not even basically he has it instantly fully saturated uh whereas trigger it's taking him a little bit longer to actually saturate that well actually i guess it's saturated for him as well but it's still a small economic lead for astrea mm -hmm. he does have what's the gas count right now it's six gases for astrea versus just four for trigger so that's that's kind of where the extra income is at this point where those extra probes are going and that is allowing astrea to go for things like the double robo colossus transition uh the second forge i still like astrea's position quite a bit more but mm -hmm. trigger's got cards to play yeah 
No, absolutely. I think both these players have a solid chance of uh, making some plays happen in this game. Like you said, Robotics Bay finished it up now. We are going to see double Colossus production here from Estrella. All right. Not going to be going into any of those disruptors. No, no, no. We are bringing it back and saying, I'm going to be able to deal with any kind of big charge lot swells and everything that you have. Which is just kind of funny when you look at the current compositions right now. Because you're like, well, Trigger has five Zealots. And then it's just a lot of Stalkers in the world. <laughs> it's just funny because whenever I see players making Colossus in PvP these days, it really is just about, yeah, I'm going to like massacre your Zealots really quickly. And then my Zealots are going to be really effective. But there aren't even that many Zealots to speak of for Trigger. No, no, uh, there's not that many at all. It's pretty much Stalker Immortal. But Immortals do struggle to actually get on top of Colossi once they have that mm -hmm. extended Thermal Lance. And the upgrades for Astrea are obviously going to be really beneficial here. We are going to see a fight breaking on out. Force Fields will grab one Immortal. And the Archons of Astrea allow him to kind of push forward a little bit. DTs on the left side do deny the fifth base. And at War Prism in the main base, uh, good positioning on the Stalkers will be able to deal with it. I think there's a DT in the side there still. Standard Thermal Lance finishing up. It's very rare to see just two Colossus made. As the War Prism does go down to a cannon. A little bit unfortunate right there. Uh, Trigger not really able to find too much more value. And finally, actually, they, those DTs might win the fight against that. Oh, yeah. They definitely win that fight. But it's going to be taking a few losses here or there. Another Immortal gets sniped off. These Colossus oh, really finding up. a lot of value. Just punishing the army as it's retreating. But, oh, this Ooh. turns into potentially a scary surround. Yeah. A big blink forward there from Trigger. Sights off both of the Colossus. And is this actually going to be enough for him to continue to push on forward? No, the Zealot reinforcements from Astrea catching all of those Immortals on the left-hand side. Yeah, but meanwhile, Trigger finds a lot of the army of Astrea on the top side. Oh, flanking Zealots coming in from Astrea on the top side as well, helping out a lot. There's still so many Immortals for Trigger. He actually retained his Immortal count really well there. And now he blinks mm -hmm. forward, kind of catches his opponent a little bit stuck on the ramp. And Trigger just took an amazing sequence right there. I don't even know how to call it a fight because it was like three <laughs> separate mini fights all in one. But yeah, that went very well for Trigger. Yeah, continued reinforcements for both sides from different angles really turned that into a very chaotic fight. But like you said, all of the Immortals being retained there for Trigger, he somehow managed to keep those alive. And now, if he can just turn his way through these Zealots, he is going to have a very, very strong edge in this fight. And those Zealots do end up disappearing quite quickly. Another Blink forward. He tries to snap up a Colossus. He manages to get it as well. Immortal still in the back line, really disincentivizing Astrea for making any more of these stalkers of his own. And the Nexus is going to end up falling. Trigger has the superior economy. He has a superior tech out on the map right now. And this is looking to be such a scary spot for Astrea. Yeah, that was really well done by Trigger. Uh, it was a super weird chaotic fight that I assure you was difficult to micro for both sides. But ultimately, it was Trigger who made the more impactful micro movements. The Colossus got sniped down so quickly. We are going to see the plus three weapons getting denied in the main base, and that's quite nice for Astrea. But he is really far down in army quality right now, as well as... Well, actually, as I say, that army supply is about to even out. Uh, but army quality is, is quite a big difference in this one. we got a lot of Zealots for Astrea, whereas, you know, Trigger's got a lot of those Immortals, quite a few more Stalkers... And I, I am quite impressed with how well the Immortals have been handling themselves. Now, we do have to note the upgrades are about to be... Well, they're already 3-2 versus 2-0-1. But they're going to shortly be 3-3 three, three upgrades. And if... I mean, without splash damage for Trigger, it is going to be really hard to overcome an upgrade disadvantage. We already saw a really good fight from him. But Astray is going to max out very soon once more. And that's going to mean these upgrades become highly impactful again. No, I think that's definitely going to be the case. I do like the trigger is finally mixing in a couple of disruptors. These DT run by is also going to be a little bit threatening because War Prism warps in successfully all these zealots and the DTs take care of the cannons. Trigger also hitting in the top right hand side. He's knocking out three different bases at once right now. That was very unfortunate for Astrea. Astrea accidentally clicked his own Nexus on that one. And that's why he didn't snipe the War Prism before uh. the warp in went through a tragic misclick really costing him hard and not able to defend his fifth nexus well i guess actually that was his sixth nexus not able to defend his sixth nexus he does ultimately get cleaned up 
but Trigger is really making moves in this last, I don't know, three minutes, four minutes, maybe even five mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah. Oh, he's finally got up another forge. He's started up oh. his three weapons. Oh, he might be getting caught from a couple of different angles over here. Surround with the Archons of the Stalkers. The blink forward over to the backside of his attack. The Immortals from Astraea are really trying to put in some work. The Archons also starting to overwhelm. The Disruptor for Trigger does get some damage done, but it does get picked off. And honestly, a good trade there for Astraea. Also finding one of the mining bases over there. Trigger's trying to fire back with some of his DTs of his own. Forces out a recall. But I think Astraea is, unless he, uh, unless he loses this base over here, which it looks like he may very well, Astraea is probably going to be happy with how the army trades went, but I think Trigger still is going to be okay as long as he can clean up back at home. Man, what is up with these NA PVPs this season and being <laughs> absolute bangers? We have gotten so many great PVPs already, and we are in store Ooh. for another one. Nice warp in there from Trigger. We'll deal with this. More Zealot runbys on the other side. Battery Overcharge will be able to keep that cannon alive. It just finished in time in order to survive and be healed up. We're going to see Astrea maybe try to put bite off a little more than he can chew. Pushing down the ramp. I don't know about this one. Battery Overcharge, I believe, has been popped on the bottom side. But there is, there is so many quality units in Estrella's army. Oh, I mean, I feel like unless the Disruptors get some big hits over here, Trigger can't really push in very easily into that army of Estrella. Estrella, especially if he gets any kind of reinforcing warp-ins. Oh, but it looks bottom like he side. warped in back at home to deal with any kind of run-by attempts. Oh, man. This is... God, this game is so wild. There's a big blink forward right there. Huge disruptor shot finding two of those Archons. And Trigger is able to get some really nice disruptor connections. Trigger's outmining his opponent quite significantly at this point. Astrea really took his licks, really took some big hits to the face, and he is recovering his economy. He's rebuilding one of these bases now, but he is in some big trouble. Disruptor shot will get targeted ooh, down. Ooh. Both of them getting targeted down, but there's a huge blink forward. One Colossus falls, two Colossus gonna go down, but Trigger is losing a lot to these Immortals and Archons, and the reinforcing Zealots from Astrea just turned that fight into kind of a massacre. It's really tough when you do that aggressive blink forward. It's really hard to actually focus fire down any units because you don't want to just overkill. But that meant that all of the Immortals and all of the Colossus were just getting low at the same time, but none of them actually dying. They were just doing all the damage. And so at the end of the day, Trigger was able to still somehow stabilize over there. A potentially big Disruptor shot over there almost ends up happening, but doesn't quite land. And Trigger is starting to actually get into be a lot of trouble now. Astrea with the nerves of steel right there. I would have started attacking that when I was much farther away, but Tr Astrea's like, no, 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 I need this number of Immortals in range. And he did the math and he manages to get the denial on that shot. That was huge. Now, these DTs are still running amok and they will also force Astrea to retreat. Trigger actually has the majority of his Stalker army here as well. This game is actually straight up insane. Ooh, nice Zealot Warpin gonna try and catch some of these Stalkers on the backside cannon depowered and that means that the dts will not be revealed as well as those zealots doing really well triggers multitasking both of their <laughs> multitasking is so impressive in this game both of these players have been losing so many workers and bases left and right the zealots are gonna actually be dealing with opponent uh, opposing immortals a strand man of losing one or two of these immortals after that recall but he does still end up getting the cleanup over there and saves the Nexus very importantly. He's only got 37 workers right now. Both these players are still trying to make as many workers as they can because they actually still have bases to mine with from, but they just need the worker counts and they still have the Nexus to remake things. It's just so awkward and so difficult. The Stalker run by also causing all sorts of problems because recalls on cooldown. Trigger is doing such a good job of utilizing these Stalkers to keep dragging Astrea or... Uh... Yeah, to creep dragon goes straight back home. Oh, ah! the friendly fire Nova. Not the biggest of Novas, but every unit counts. Their army supplies are not particularly big. And Astrea is now going to be able to click down this Nexus. 56 probes going down. Ooh, we are going to see the Disruptor. Another one. He whips the shot, pulls it back. Trigger starting to crumble a little bit under the pressure of this game. He's sitting up in supply, but a lot of that supply is still just the workers. And after losing one or two of these bases... The workers, I mean, they're still getting some mining, but there's definitely some oversaturation in a couple of these bases that makes it really difficult to find the same level of effectiveness. This supply is a little bit misleading. He's going to play forward. He's going to find a couple of these immortals. Two of the immortals already going down. And there it is. That is enough to overpower Trigger. Finding a critical fight there on that left-hand side. 
What a game number one to start things off for the NA region there. Trigger and Estrella. I mean, you hyped this series up pretty hard. And to say that it's delivered would be very appropriate. That is already <laughs> a hell of a game one. Both players matching each other blow for blow, shot for shot for 21 minutes on Oceanborn. It looked really, really good for both of them at many times throughout that game. And I, I think that's one of those games where if you asked which player, or if you asked each player, where would they like to resume from replay? And you didn't actually show them the replay, you could get seven different answers from each of them. <laughs> because there were so yeah. many different spots where one player was ahead, then the other player was ahead, then the other player, like it just teeter-tottered so hard. It really did. And it just kind of reminds me that both of these players are so good at taking hits to the face and just like punching back, basically. They're really, really effective at doing counter damage in order to equalize. Like as they're taking, if they're being attacked, then they'll attack back. If they're taking harassment, then they'll find some big army fight that they can force out while the harassment is going on. They're constantly doing these trades. And I think that's what caused that game to get so chaotic is that they where there's just this never ending flow of small skirmishes and small little fights or even big fights that were happening at all given time uh, points of time because the trigger no pun intended the trigger for one of these players to initiate another battle or to move across the map was that they were being attacked and i think that was what made that game so so much fun i'm i'm excited dave we get a game number two now yeah we do uh, and I think this might be the first time we're seeing this particular map today, which is kind of surprising because I feel like it's it's been one of the less offensive maps in the uh, of the new pool. And that's not to say we don't like the new maps. I, I'm actually a big fan of them, but we have seen a lot of weirdness. And generally speaking, when weird maps are presented at the beginning of a season, you usually see players stick to the more stock standard ones. So I'm surprised that this is the first time we're seeing Crimson Court. Regardless, though, here we go. Spawning up at the top right, it is Astrea. Down here on the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have the red Protoss player. He is Trigger from Basilis. That really was just such an even game for so much of it. In, but, like, not in normal even games where, you know, they have, like, similar stalker counts. They're both going for the same thing. One guy's upgrades finish. The other guy's upgrades finish. You're like, oh, 20-second upgrade timing difference. No, that was, like, they both had advantages that kind of counterbalanced each other for a very <laughs> long time. Uh, finally, Trigger was able to break the game wide open with that DT harass. But even... Even up until the point when it was like 26 probes to 52 or something, even then I was like, I don't know, man. Astrea's already pulled like three rabbits out of his hat this game. Like, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd managed to find a good enough fight to keep it going and rebuild that probe count. Yeah, I mean, truly, that was a absolutely wild game. With a lot, like you were saying before, I think there were so many different points in time where those players could maybe be thinking if X or A or B or Y or Z had gone a little bit differently, I think that game would have looked so different. I do want to quickly bring it back to something that we did see in the beginning of that last game, which we're kind of we're briefly remarking on. The lack of wall-in from Estrella, yet again, kind of showing its face again. Yeah. And he's going to stick with it. I wonder if Trigger goes for double adept again. Also, why is Trigger's cyber core so late? I was going to say he will not go for double adept because he has gone for uh, a one gate yeah. expand. He uh, yeah. is taking a page out of Max Pax's book and going for that high ground one gate expand. Uh, I also was like, I, I had to do a double take. I'm glad you were talking during that because otherwise I would have been the one that looked like the fool. <laughs> but instead, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see a thread on Reddit about how R Ruffy doesn't have passion for the game because he, he didn't see the... <laughs> Um, but the reality is, like, Trigger doesn't do this. He just does not do this. Like, I cast a lot of games of StarCraft II, and Trigger has... I don't know the last time he's gone for a low ground expand when he does this. Maybe it's happened once or twice. Maybe I have missed those those crucial games, but the only time he usually goes one gate expand is when it's, you know, a map like Site Delta or Amphion or uh, Post Youth. 
He usually doesn't go for this. This is quite intriguing. And I like that he's kind of mixing things up a little bit here on this map. And he's actually gone two sentries very quickly. <laughs> but they, they're they not that strong. They can't fight away from the battery. Yeah, I know that everyone is very excited about the sentries being able to do such big shield damage. But remember that after the shields are worked through, you still have to actually deal damage to the unit itself. Like the hull damage and sentries still don't actually deal that much damage past the shield so it does it does still require the battery it does still require a backup of like an additional stalker rallying out or something so yeah astrea does deplete the energy of the battery for whatever it's worth but he is returning home so i don't think it's gonna matter too much just nice little poking and prodding there well and the different sentries do between a shielded stalker and an unshielded stalker is even worse because of the armor that a stalker has mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're even doing minus one damage from the minus shield bonus damage. Like it's, they really do suck against stalkers once those shields are gone. Uh, Oracle, by the way, is going to find, no, not an opening. Nice job. Uh, Trigger's yeah. able to get the save on that one probe of the natural, but at least Estrella is able to get back into the main, finds a little bit of damage. Mm. But against a very quick expand like this, there's a reason Max Pax has made this his bread and butter for so long. You get a disgustingly strong economic lead off this. Yeah, I also, I just realized there's two shield batteries that triggers natural. Like, that's actually quite interesting, right? It's I know lot, that he had yeah. the forward shield battery, but was he actually really afraid of a continued rally of stalkers or something there, and he ended up getting a second one? I think he might have been afraid of uh, third and fourth stalkers showing up and yeah. was maybe just like, yeah, these sentries, they're kind of taking a beating. My first shield battery is out of energy. Uh, and that's the thing when you're when you have such a strong economy off of that one gate expand you can kind of afford to be a little bit more frivolous mm -hmm. i wouldn't say you want to obviously he he would have loved to have built no shield batteries but i don't blame him for building the second one actually in that particular scenario yeah i think that's totally fair and it's kind of just like nice at the end of the day that Astray was able to put on that enough pressure that he scared trigger into doing that maybe like oh. equalizing a tiny tiny bit behind the slightly later uh, uh, natural, but... Hmm. We have Astrea going for not two, not three, but four oracles here. He is going for a foracle <laughs> opener, which is something I don't get to say anymore because Haas doesn't play very much and Hero for has stopped going for as many crazy oracle numbers as he used to. Uh, so I'm just going to revel in that for a moment, but also be like, what? That is a lot of units that don't particularly fight in a straight-up engagement. Yeah, especially strange to see four oracles in PvP. Yeah. I really wonder, do you think he's going to try and just, like, pair them off as two different sets of that's, oracles? Yes, and just, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. Um, but he could potentially rally them together and still try and go for, like, maybe sentry snipes. You have a lot of mm. unexpected opportunities with this. Uh looks like a stalker got killed yeah trigger's stalker was <laughs> wait what the hell was it doing on the other side of the map and there it is there's the two oracles into the natural they will be able to grab five probes both players took their third nexus at about the same time so as a result of that astrea is now up a couple of workers in this game first time yeah really really nice play there he's making another oracle uh... hey he's making a fifth <laughs> oracle oh my god well... I'm just imagining this horrific scene where it's a Protoss player who has two oracles outside of each one of your bases. Oh my and the God. moment that you're a little bit undefended, that you just dive in with like two oracles onto one of those bases and start sniping off probes. Yeah, that just sounds that sounds horrible to play against. <laughs> uh, now, I feel like you can probably just push across the map, but I don't know. I, I don't think you can just absolutely do that. Uh, by the way, when you get to five pen five oracles, it is the pentacle, in case you were wondering. Okay. Well, can we get a hexicle? A hexicle sounds pretty cool. He you can get a hexicle. You can also get a septicle. That's a hex of a lot of oracles, man. You can get an octicle. Oh, my God. We're going. There's another way to describe this one. But we won't say it on broadcast. He's gone for the hexicle. I don't even know what you're referring to, Dave, so uh, I'm glad we'll discuss it off broadcast <laughs> later. Uh, we have a prism coming out here from Trigger alongside the Temple Archives finishing up, and plus some weapons is getting closer to finishing. The four gateways are coming on out. I wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of that move that you were talking about in like the next 30 seconds to a minute or so. 
But again, it's actually really hard to pull off when these oracles are still being annoying. And at home, there's all the stasis traps being thrown out. There's yeah. also potential that even if you clean up these two oracles, there's two more oracles behind it somewhere. <laughs> Oh, man, it, it's just it's oracles all the way down at this point. Uh, and behind all this, there's so much static defense. In addition to this mass stasis ward style, this feels like we're watching the equivalent of new Protoss mech or something. But like speed Banshee mech, he's building a seventh oracle. God, I love Astraea so much. He is my favorite. Not even my favorite player. He's just my favorite. He is truly just, you know, a unique Protoss flower who <laughs> blooms in his own way. Look at that stasis. The Archons oh. caught those big, fat Archons blocking half the ramp. Trigger cannot push up right now. And even if he does, do you commit further in over there? There might even be more stasis, stasis traps right beyond it as well. Yeah, you never want to run, run into an angry Stacy like that. Uh, we are going to be seeing the Archons waking back up, and here is the charge up the ramp. There is the cannons getting absolutely blasted. This Immortal Archon army is super strong. All jokes aside, uh, Oracles do not help out in this straight-up engagement, but the Stasis Ward will help out! And now the Immortals don't help out in this engagement either. What a Stasis Ward right there! And that might very well turn this fight on its head. And there come the Oracles! Raining justice from above! Oh my Oracle. god, this is so sick from Astraea. They actually deal quite a bit of damage, and there's not that much anti-air. The Stalkers do die pretty quickly, even to the Oracles, and the Immortals will also die very quickly. The problem is those Oracles are out of energy. The Nexus is out of hit points, and Estrella is going to end up losing that base, so he does manage to mount to defense. He is going to be up about 20 army supply, but that is basically where his supply advantage is right now. And now we're in a weird situation where I think Estrella has the better army. I think he still is in an advantageous position after all that fighting, but both of their economies are in roughly similar spots and i think there's an opportunity now for trigger to still come back in this game i actually i think trigger's in a terrible spot i think he's in such a brutal position right now plus two attack is finished versus no started plus two for trigger the colossus are going to be really good on the narrow corridors of crimson oh, not court not the, not the oracles Okay, well, they will get just a single Zealot caught there. Another decent Stasis Ward taking an Archon out of the fight. The main problem is, is there enough frontline for Astraea? And as long as he can keep those Colossi safe, he should be good in this game, in my opinion. Stasis Wards have been so cash money for him here. Yeah, they, I mean, they've truly been doing so, so much work. And he's going to be able to keep the base alive. He's a little bit supply block right now, so some of those reinforcing uh, gateway buffer units you were talking about are going to be a little bit late to the punch, but there's the unsupply block as the Nexus finishes on, or uh, sorry, more pylons and stuff finish on up. And Estrella is going to have his plus three weapons about halfway done after all of the fighting has finally ceased. Trigger, I agree with what you said. Like, I think that his firepower is lacking. The upgrades are also lacking. But I think he's He's staying in the game, and I think he's buying himself time to get up his own transitions. I think if he's able to get up those transitions, this game can re-equalize. I don't think Trigger's out of this game just yet. Not necessarily, but it is an, it is an uncomfortable game for him, for sure. He has uh, mm -hmm. probed up quite hard. Oh, actually does lose this one, or leave this one Zealot alive. Good job cleaning up the War Prism in the natural. And Trigger actually does take a probe lead, now up by 10. I, I feel like with five plus three, soon to be plus three Colossus against a disruptorless army that does rely pretty heavily on charge lots, surely that's just an like that's just a one-sided fight, right? I I do think you're right in a just straight up direct fight, especially at a choke point or something. Those Colossus should absolutely shred through. I think if Trigger can find a big roundabout kind of uh, engagement, yeah, big flank. maybe he can like buy time, but I think you're right. This is going to be the big time for a straight hit. He's up about 40 or like so army supply, and this is not the angle that Trigger wants to take a fight at. No, I, I, I really just don't think he can. He needs disruptors, and he needs them now. One disruptor getting one stasis ward. There's another one that just popped out. 
but this is going to be lost mining at this base. This is going to maybe force Trigger to take the engagement. Very nice blink forward, grabs the one disruptor, and Astrea will, or rather, Trigger will complete his plus two weapons, but Astrea is on 3 1 1, even still. And these Colossus, you can't really flank this army with that many stasis wards about. Yeah, it's so difficult. The Zealot oh. run bys and everything else that you'd want to go for don't really work out. Big blink forward there from, oh my god. Okay, oh. big blink forward there from Trigger with the Disruptor shot almost goes uncontested. The blink at the very, very last second does manage to get those stalkers out of the way. Yeah, but it still killed two Colossus, which is big. Disruptors counter Colossus super freaking hard in certain situations. We are going to see the Stasis Ward not getting that many units. There's a blink forward. We'll snipe the Disruptor before it can get its big shot off. This army supply is relatively close and Triggers continue to keep these Immortals alive. Very nice job triggering those Stasis Trappies. One more will get taken down by the Disruptor. And somehow, I know the supplies are still favoring Astrea. somehow Trigger actually holds. He's holding on for a little bit. He's going to try and rotate around. Disruptors still continuing to try and grow a number. He's been losing a lot of them. Disruptor kills off the stasis trap because I think he lost the Observer earlier on. Uh, thanks to like a revelation or something. But we're going to see Trigger able to at least hold the ramp for a little bit longer, especially with a shield battery overcharge. The mining is a little bit tough right now. The Oracles have actually been mostly just throwing down the stasis trap. Oh. haven't really been getting involved in the fight. Colossus goes down. We're starting to see a bit of a scary moment for Astrea where the Disruptor count is continuing to rise and the Colossus count has been whittled down a little bit. It's three right now. Oh, as I say that, actually, Astrea recognizes the Trigger kind of abandoned the base and that will allow Trigger to blink, or pardon me, Astrea to blink forward aggressively. He is going to... Oh, nice uh, Stasis Ward right there on the third base defense. This, this feels like Astrea should have been able to win this game so long ago, but Trigger is putting up such a resilient defense. He really is. And that Disruptor count has grown so much that it's actually gotten to the point it's scary to just blink forward aggressively onto these uh, Disruptors, to blink forward onto the Stalkers and the Immortals and everything. So it now really... Oh, okay. A little bit of friendly fire there with the Disruptor killing the Archon. But I think that the angle for this base is really what's doing trigger in the most if trigger yeah. had a different base and he is going to be taking that left hand side base i think that's actually going to be really helpful because this base it just feels so impossible to defend against when your opponent has blink stalkers and colossus that are just able to abuse that ridge so much yeah and kudos to astrea has done a great job of doing exactly that uh another oracle just got produced by the way so we're back up to the magic number of mm -hmm. seven and what i was just gonna say is those oracles could theoretically as long as they're stasis trappies defending this army they could theoretically go for that left side base and just try and gun it down but obviously he is Ooh. gonna come back here oh, oh revelation is really weird for australia because trying to push into the disruptors is very different from trying to you know push into like the defensive position getting some chip damage and then backing off yeah right now trigger kind of holds that high ground and he can actually shut down one of these important mining bases here for Astrea. This could be the start of something, but it's going to be so difficult. And Astrea, he's not going to really have to worry about reinforcements for Trigger's army. Trigger can't really reinforce this very well. No, he cannot. Perfectly measured blink forward right there. We've actually got a flank coming in from the Stalkers of Astrea. He will uh, dodge this one disruptor shot on the bottom side. Top side disruptor shot is good, but it doesn't matter. They're maybe not as devastatingly strong flanking against uh, mm -hmm. disruptors, but it does make it very difficult to keep that army together. And it's so funny that Astrea's game-winning fight that actually clinches him that game is a flank of his opponent's army as opposed <laughs> to the, like, six-minute siege or something of that, that high ground peninsula where he just staved off being flanked for so long. Yeah, I, I think you were absolutely right. Like, that was a game that Astrea had garnered a strong advantage in. I don't think there's any disputing that really, but Trigger really showcased why it was going to be difficult, especially with great disruptor control and like a lot of these small things he was able to do to try and buy himself time and space. I really just wonder if Trigger had been able to abandon that location earlier and taken like the left hand base sooner. 
I don't know if that would have been the right decision, but I wonder what the game would have looked like because I feel like that base became more of a liability than it really was paying off for, right? It became just the point of contention that those Colossus and Stalkers were continuing to get higher and higher value traits because of that stupid ridge <laughs> that the Disruptors can't really do anything about. But the Colossus and the Stalkers are going to continue to whittle away at all of those probes that try to mine from over there. It forces you to rotate around this very awkward angle constantly back and forth, back and forth. Uh, there's, I have so many questions about like how that game could have looked if small things had been different. But really, really nice job for Stray to close it out, but also really nice job for Trigger to hold on. Yeah, I genuinely did not think that that was possible. What Trigger did for like six to seven minutes. Like it, it, it looked so it looked so impossible like to my eyes i'm like no surely he dies now like there's five plus three colossus you know i know that colossus are not the be all end all in pvp especially against like immortals but i'm really imp like th this series is once again giving me newfound respect for these two <laughs> players because they're both doing things that are really cool and very difficult to achieve with really complicated armies and their styles are so different but the way that they clash against each other it's just straight up fireworks it is so much fun and of course just literally astrea going for seven oracles that can yeah <laughs> absolute <laughs> beauty like this is what i love about not just NA StarCraft, but specifically about players like Astrea specifically. It's so much fun. He's willing to experiment. He's willing to kind of throw out the normal playbook and kind of come up with his own. It makes for such fun games as we get to move into a game number three of this day. We get a, we get a third game from these two players. We sure do. As we have spawning down in the bottom left for Basilisk, it is Trigger. And up here on the top right-hand side of the map, we have our blue Protoss player oh. pausing the game. All right, we got a we got a small bug. Can ah. we restart. All right, we may be restarting, but yeah, almost. Regardless, third you game, may though. not says trigger. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the admin was just like, "Well, that's the official ruling." You oh, that's, a, your, that's awkward. Get your opponent's consent to restart the game. And then because Astrea actually left the game and the victory screen showed up for Trigger, it like counts as a victory and it's just like, Trigger's like, oh God, I'm so sorry, I don't want this. And they're like, well, I'm sorry, uh, hands are tied. You know, you said he can't do it and then he left. That's, uh, that's uh, you got the victory screen. I don't know what to tell you. This reminds me of a, this, it was like mostly a joke, but I remember there was a collegiate event, not even like a, collegiate starcraft like league or, or csl event or anything it was just a local lan event at my university i remember there was a tournament match where someone typed gg and for some reason his opponent instinctively just did f10 and like hit the surrender button instead of thinking that it was like the score screen like they just their brain went to autopilot mode so they forfeited and then there was like a little bit of a contention there because that one player was clearly very dead but they were like, but my opponent forfeited. I had a victory screen. So surely this counts for me, right? That's funny. Thankfully, I... thankfully they kind of like turn around like, okay, I'm not going to be that guy for like this local for fun StarCraft LAN event. But there was a moment that they considered it. And I'm like, oh man, don't be that guy. Uh, fun fact. This, this is actually a, th this is a really funny one to me. So there was a there was a player, and I, I don't want to you know get into too much, but he was a little bit, uh, let's say he was a little bit controversial, uh, and his name was Wasif Khan, also known as Combat X, uh, who is a very he is he had a controversial past, uh, very like BM, not not the gre the best manners on the ladder, but he actually went to a a, a tournament that was at a local university. And he was playing in it, and he was playing a best of three, and he was up against a guy, and he was up 1-0, and he had straight up won the game. Like, it was completely over. Um, but he typed a manner aggressive GG, and the rulebook states that if you type GG aggressively, or if you just type GG, that's a forfeit. So he just lost, 
And then it went to game three. He won anyways in game three, but it was yeah. still like, oh, that's really funny. That is that's really funny. Really funny. That's actually pretty amazing. It was a uh, it was a brilliant like um, mess around and find out moment. We'll say. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we're moving into game number three. We are finally ready. There's no more drag scroll bug there for Estrella. As he is up here on the top right hand side of the map. I already said his name. It's the blue Protoss player. He's Estrella, Max Angel. I hate when I do that. Like when I, I say when I trigger do. before I do the intro, spawning down in the bottom left for Basilisk gets trigger. I like how Mapu was like, oh, I, okay. <laughs> yeah, I like when I do it, but I don't like when I do it with Nyal because Nyal just is like, ha ha ha. You, I can envision his face where he's just kind of like laughing, that good old like Swedish <laughs> kind of laugh. He's like just chilling. <laughs> but Mapu, I can, I can like feel his vein popping a little bit. I was like, just, it, okay, in, introduce the players properly. Just, just do it. Stop messing around. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why, but well, I do know why. Um, as soon as you like did the ha ha ha, I thought of the Swedish chef, like instantly. Like, oh, hurdy, gurdy, 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 the players. Oh, <laughs> oh no, my God. Four, four, four. I know what you're talking I didn't know what you were talking about until you did that. <laughs> oh, man. First starters. Oh, oh Ooh. boy. We got a proxy pile on and a PvP coming on out. Uh, Astrea also. Went for a wall in this game for once. Yeah, yeah, that is notable. Uh, this is really interesting because after two super long PVPs, you might not be thinking, you might not be thinking 100% clearly where you're like, okay, yeah, I got to check for those minerals, make sure they're not mined out. This is going to be almost certainly a three-gate robo. At the very least, there's, of course, that robotics facility proxied, but Astrea with the read potentially going for his own defensive robo this is so good for astrea on paper yeah i think identifying that there's the missing pylon knowing that this is just a very common map to have those proxies on because of those little mineral patches that make things look so so tricky there's a little scout out there from astrea he sees all right the mineral patches are mined out let's go to the common proxy locations like you said, he's already kind of suspected what's coming on out. Adepts are going to meet in the middle of the map, potentially. Oh, I think Astrea was trying to use the Zelnaga Watchtower, the Hidden Vision area, to try and yes. ambush Trigger, but yeah. it didn't end up working out. No, it did not. Uh, both players are going to be opening up with the Quick Warp Prism. And that means, of course, they're going to try and ferry the Adepts into the main base. Uh, now, we did see Trigger opening up with a Quad Adept opening. Very nice. Uh, save right there. That was actually pretty close to those adepts getting in, so good job that he gets the block. This is really uncomfortable for Trigger, but it's not a guaranteed win by any stretch for Astrea because we have seen Protoss players, especially in Europe, players like Aerogfire, uh, you can know that the three-gate robo is coming, and you can still just die to it. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, it is still a micro fight. It is yes. a micro battle. Adepts are going to be making their way in. And remember, oh, when seal. you are also on the nice. defensive, that means that all of your resources, all your probes and stuff are also going to be oh, in no. the limelight for being attacked. Oh, that pylon for Trigger actually working against him so hard. And Astrea is going to be able to gun down so many... Or pardon me, Trigger is going to be able to gun down so many probes. I did it again. Yeah. Uh, Astrea needs to get some big damage on the other side with his own War Prism. Ay, 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 ay. This looks really good right now for Trigger. He will lose. Well, he's going to lose at least a couple probes. And that's actually, that's already almost enough to equalize. Yeah, only a two worker lead now. And keeps both the Adepts alive. And the War Prism is also still very healthy. Now, Trigger's trying to get some of his own counter damage again with the Immortal <laughs> now in the War Prism. But Immortal there for Astrea. This is... A weird game to say the least, but oh, the investment in the Stargate. This is why Trigger didn't have quite as many gateway units warped in, why he was maybe slacking a little bit further behind and say like the Immortal Count and stuff. He invested in the Stargate. That's actually going to be potentially massive because he can not only push back his opponent's uh, the War Prism. Sorry, forgot the word for it. <laughs> uh, can push back his opponent's War Prism. He could also potentially go for a lift up on his opponent's Immortal, which could drastically change the nature of the fight. Absolutely. And uh, if Astrea doesn't recognize this necessarily and is in an awkward spot with those immortals, we could see a lift up 
when there's a war prism right next to them and they're stun locked you can't do anything about that and that's really really awful obviously that's very unpleasant now we do see okay there we go the phoenix does get spotted and it's just one so recall will save that easily mm -hmm. uh astrea is actually significantly ahead in supply now he's three immortals yeah. to one well, uh, think about it the basically a lot of the production facilities for trigger have just been knocked out he really yeah. just has the gateways now but he lost his robos he's only now been making the phoenix out of his uh stargate so i do think that trigger is in a bit of trouble right now i think so too uh because those phoenixes they're really great in small numbers but once you start getting up to a more significant stalker count and let's say let's say he needs to use all three phoenixes to lift immortals they'll that'll be good for the fight until the phoenix lifts have to drop the immortals back down again like until those phoenix come back into the or uh, pardon me the immortals come back into the fight sorry it has been a long day folks it has <laughs> we are gonna see these phoenix start to get a couple of pickoffs just on the adepts and stuff but like you said there is still the threat of a couple of those stalkers even the sentries are going to be able to actually take away those shields for the phoenix quite quickly but looking for a couple of probe pickoffs, I think that is going to probably be his best bet. Oh. Also, find an opportunity to get his Immortal and the War Prism over there. They're still around. Wow. Is he going to be able to potentially find a pickoff there? No, it doesn't quite end up finding anything. Just gets two probes, which isn't bad. That's funny because he could have actually just used the Phoenix Lifts to pick up probes. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I, I, it was such a fancy move, but it's just like, aren't those, isn't that Phoenix lifting with extra steps? And it's like, oh, <laughs> when you put it that way, I guess so. Uh, still great micro with these phoenixes. Ooh, and he's going to be able to catch a sentry here. He already got one on the warp in. Going for another Ooh. one. Guardian shield helps a lot, and those sentries aren't light units anymore. There's actually, like, no anti-air in this army. Yeah, it's kind of light right now, as we have two more stalkers finally warped in over there, and that is going to help push these phoenix back. The guardian shield, by the way, like, it's reducing damage from the phoenix by four because the phoenix attacked mm, twice yes reduces twice for each but Ooh. oh war prism is it gonna be able to survive guardian shield helps out a little but not enough that is a very nice pickoff i mean astrea's still pushing out really oh he's gonna make another war prism but this feels like a uh i guess he can just back off and not be too afraid but i'm just so afraid of a protoss player that is pushing out on the map where he could get overrun and your opponent has phoenix and just capture units like this yeah, uh, this feels like one of those situations where maybe because the pickoffs have been so good in the last like minute or so, Astrea's just like, oh, well, I, I have to push out. I have to do something before this gets out of hand. Oh, recall will save the immortal. Yeah. Nice job. Uh, but Trigger is now flipped things around very hard. These Phoenixes have been worth their weight in gold. Mm hmm. I, I frankly was a little bit skeptical about the. Phoenix transition from more than just making like a like yeah, one yeah, like three, three or four Phoenix or something. Yeah, but he has been finding so much value from the kind of doubling down of Phoenix. Remember, it was on a very low economy, so five oh, Phoenix not is not one. a crazy number, but he is just still finding so much value from them. Yeah, I love that he has kept this immortal uh, and war prism in the top <laughs> right because it, it it forces stalkers to stay there. Yeah. That is actually really allowed those Phoenixes to find the value. I feel like without that, hmm. it would have been so much more difficult to actually get the kind of pickoffs and kind of trades that he has. He's kept, yeah, like two to three to four stalkers at any given time. And now Trigger's completed charge. He's got a third Nexus started on up. They both do, but it's a lot a lot faster for Astrea. However, I don't think Astrea can hold it against a, just a shove. Yeah, I, I think that that's what Trigger has to do now, right? Because he has invested into all these things that are really great, but he is still behind in workers. He hasn't really been investing as much into the worker count, even though he's been getting a lot of... This is with him getting a lot of pickoffs. Yeah. He hasn't been producing probes, so he has to go for some kind of big attack soon. He's well, moving across the map in a very interesting way, though, where he is... I feel like covering almost every single angle on the left-hand side he could go. He's going through every single path to try and make his way over there and that is a very nice pick off that is huge actually we are going to see the shield battery is not yet done these units will get pinned there's the lift on the immortals lifting the warping in units as well the charge lots pinning the army against the wall we do have a nice bit of positioning here thanks to the pylons but there's just so much stuff for trigger and he is going to be our first player into the playoffs for the na region 
Congratulations to Trigger and good and over Astrea as well. My man, uh, Trigger truly, truly doing a great job. And remember, that game started off with a relatively foreseen proxy robo that looked like it wasn't actually getting a crazy amount of damage done. Astrea looked like he was getting into a decent position. But the Phoenix follow-up there and the ability for Trigger to find value with those Phoenix, I mean... Talk about Team Basilisk, Roddy's got to be proud right now, co-streaming this uh, and watching that and just seeing how effective Trigger was with everything there. I mean, absolutely. It it was, even in the game that he lost, it was such an impressive showing from what felt like such a difficult situation for so long. I'm really impressed with uh, what we saw from Trigger today. Uh, they both played great, but Trigger yeah. had a little something extra. He had a little, little extra mustard on it, little little extra velocity with his play today it was he he just played so fast and clean uh but we're gonna head to a quick little break and it will be a tbz after it it's gonna be dolan versus cham stick around this is the esl regionals na
back. Welcome back, everyone. It is Steadfast, joined by Fear Dragon. Fear Dragon, how are you doing? I'm doing a wonderful, day. Thank you so much for checking in. I appreciate you as a friend who reaches out and checks in asks how I'm doing. How are you doing, Dave? Uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. I'm doing pretty Glad well. Glad to hear that. Anyways, guys, <laughs> the next match is going to be Dolan versus Cham. This is going to actually be a pretty fun match because Danger Dolan has been putting on a show. He's been doing a great job. In <laughs> mm -hmm. Very well it's, done. It's, an, it's, it's been a fun day. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it has been a fun day. I think we're both a little bit. I like felt something, you know, like I like put my foot like on the lake and I'm like, this ice doesn't feel right. If I step out onto this, I'm going under. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually legitimately looking forward to this, though, because I do think of both of these players as kind of coming in from very opposite ends of the spectrum in some ways. Mm -hmm. I think both of them have a lot to prove. Cham has, of course, been around for a little bit longer, has obviously attended and been somewhat successful at premier events. But when I think of Cham, I do think of someone who has this play style where he can just sort of bully his opponent by... I, th I think he got known to be like a bit of a roachy boy, for example, at many points in time in his play. And he would swell up these large amounts of roaches. I remember even like Scarlet would sometimes struggle against him because he would just do like these same kind of attacks over and over again. As Scarlet was trying all these mind games, and Cham was like, well, I just have my game plan. I'm just doing my game plan mm. and I'm really good at it. And I'm going to win with it. And I feel like Dolan's the opposite end of the spectrum. He is the player that will, as we see, Sparty, uh, stop spawning down or up here in the top right hand side of the map man i'm on <laughs> fire right now spawning up here in the top right hand side of the map danger dolan in the blue that that was the intro map Ooh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I, his yeah. opponent spawning down to the bottom left the southwest of crimson court the opposite of the top center or top right it is starlight twinkles cham there was no way I was going to slip that past him after yeah, that. You, you knew yeah. he was on alert. Yeah. Oh. I, you know. CC first. Indeed it is. Okay, anyways. I will finish my thought, and then I'll say that I haven't eaten anything for since yesterday. <laughs> oh, but, my God. Yeah. Uh, waking up at 3 in the morning and being up till now noon. Fun. I made great life choices, but you know who makes really actually good life choices is Dolan. Dolan is so good at planning out not only his life choices, I'm sure he has the next 50 years of his life plan, but he's very good at making build order choices. He's very good at coming up with dangerous build orders to planning mm. for a series and things like that. And I'm so curious. I don't even think I have a, an inkling of who I really give a major edge to stylistically. I think it's very cool to see a player who is on one end, they do great jobs with preparation and stuff, and the other end where a player is successful regardless of how much they're super preparing for a particular opponent. I feel like they're very good in very different ways, and seeing them clash to me is a very fun and exciting thing. I got there. You raised some real interesting points there, Rubby. I'm going to pat myself on the back, not because yeah. of my points, but because I finished my sentences. Yeah, I think Dolan is really handsome. Dude, he is a handsome man. He's a real, not gonna lie. He could legitimately be a model. Like, you know, like he's he's got that chiseled jaw. He's um like if if he started No, we're not gonna go there. He could be he could yeah. <laughs> he's an attractive young man. We'll just say that. Dolan's he has other career opportunities besides StarCraft too, yeah. we'll say that. If I went to the gym with Dolan, I would feel like ev everyone's eyes would be on us. And then I realized it was everyone's <laughs> I was eyes. Say, just on everyone's Dolan, eyes would be on us, but I'd realize they weren't on me. Yeah, exactly. You know? it was, yeah. It, it, everyone's just looking at Dolan. Yeah. And they're like, wow, what is this Adonis doing here at the gym? <laughs> and what's he uh, doing well, with that regular looking guy? <laughs> what do you do with that regular looking guy? You teach him how to actually get in shape? I'm like, yeah, maybe. Uh, Dolan, like you said, did go for the CC first, though. And. It's going to work out just fine. I mean, there's no real aggression or anything heading his way. Uh, not that like a 12 pool or anything would have been a problem. But yeah, he's going to be able to get up to a nice fast starboard afterwards. And I think I am always really, really interested to see when Dolan comes in with builds. I feel like usually they are around a two or three base kind of pressure. It is really just about finding something interesting or odd that exploits, exploits either some 
open gap in like the or like some kind of weakness in his opponent's play around that two or three base timing mm -hmm. or it's finding some opportunity where his opponent doesn't punish him for the two or three bases and then he gets an edge leading into the later stages of the game and it's not necessarily that i think dolan is bad with the late game but i feel like a lot of his late game setup is all pinned on just how well he's able to exploit his strategic advantages on build order choices in the early game. And then it's kind of like, okay, now you either have an advantage or you don't, or like you've lost an advantage. What can you do from there? Yeah, I, I feel like I would tend to agree with that, that he's, he always wants to come in with like a very specific game plan to try and eke out an advantage in that way. Uh, and here is one of them. So you talked about greed and you talked about trying to exploit things as <laughs> Dolan sees 16 lings barreling down at him and he shoots the neutral creature. <laughs> Tell the lings what you saw. Choices, my man. <laughs> oh man, and it, it chased those lings away. They thought they saw how effective those those flame cars were and they were like, we want no business with this. Um, but this is a very greedy build from Dolan. So we went CC first into fast third CC, into Cloak Banshee, and a very quick double engineering bay. This is before the second and third barracks. That is a really fast setup. Now, I don't think this is gonna be to try and take advantage of a one-one timing per se, although I'm sure he'll try and get a little something done with it, but it's more so that it sets up a ridiculously fast two-two timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's gonna be very, very nice. Cham is showing a due amount of respect to everything that he's facing off against. I mean, he's gotten up to like 58 workers and he's kind of still powering out a few more, but he got up the spore cars to try and deal with any kind of Banshee harassment. He's gotten up his Roach Warren and actually has been has been able to skip out on making any actual Roaches to help deal with the, the Hellions or anything. So kudos to Cham on identifying that and seeing that he can just really rely on those Queens for now. But I am curious. Yeah, I was going to say, when is he actually going to start firing up a couple of those roaches? It looks like the moment is now. I mean, he's at 66 drones. This is a this yeah. is a nice... Uh, hitting all the benchmarks very nicely. Hitting 66 drones by the six-minute mark, actually even a little bit before that. Uh, Dolan, his armory is maybe five seconds late, but it's pretty, pretty close to well-timed. Cham is also a player that likes to do this specifically, which is uh, build an extra spore crawler in the main base. He really likes to try and lock those Banshees out, but as you can see, if your Queens are not in position, it's going to be hard to hard to keep things safe under the best of circumstances. And that is quite a few dead drones for mm -hmm. a really greedy build out of Dolan. This is a great start for the Blue Terran. Yeah, and the Banshees both get out alive as well, so there's still the threat of them coming back in, one-shotting workers. And also importantly, they did get a good scout out on the hive tech and everything coming on out because they did manage to make their God. way all the way into the main base. They saw the infestation pit nearly finishing up. So he may be able to suspect that hive is on the way now. Go, go start that 2-2, go, go. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need that 2-2. Oh, he selected them for a second. There it is. Okay, that that does hurt Um, because he was... If it ends up being an aggressive roach attack from Cham, which it doesn't look like, he's gone well beyond the 66 drone timing mm -hmm. for this. Uh, and he's actually got a hive on the way. He's getting into lurkers. But even losing out on like 15 to 20 seconds, which is about what he lost out on, that can hurt a lot for your timings. Now, this is a this is a pretty nice find right here. It gets a couple of queens. Clears up a little bit of creep down the avenue that he's probably going to want to push. I don't hate yeah. that one bit. And uh, it is going to be a three base, eight racks. All roads lead to eight racks, as uh, my pal Sal mm -hmm. likes to say. This is uh, also a really nice map. If you're able to find that avenue that you were just talking about, he probably wants to push down this uh, angle. This is the area where we kind of saw, actually, as we were talking about, you know, the last PvP with a straight end trigger. If you can find your way down that ramp, you can get behind the mineral line of that high yield gas base, and you can actually find quite a bit of annoying pressure plays that you can do with your siege tanks and your marines and everything shutting down that base while you're pressing another one and making it very difficult for the marines or sorry the lings and uh, any roaches and stuff to actually contest it little bit unfortunate right there for dolan he picks off one changeling but misses the other and sees a huge number of marines as well as a couple marauders this is already a little bit of a tell even just seeing those marauders meanwhile we've actually got uh hellions diving in on the third 
They grabbed seven drones, which is not bad, and kind of opened the door for this drop to come back in. Getting a couple oh additional God. workers. Can he get the base? I think he... Do you sacrifice the Marines for it? No. Uh, now go back in. <laughs> I mean, he actually could. Uh, Cham just yeah, left it on its own, kind of. Oh, man, that changeling seeing the entire move out. This is not just a regular eight racks, by the way. This is a four tech lab. Very much reyung oriented heavy marine mm. marauder siege tank play. Cham, though, prioritized Vipers very hard with this. And so he is going to have a lot of energy. I'm sure, actually, if he even spent a little bit of time consuming, they're, they're maxed out on energy right now. There's no way they're not. Yeah, look at nearly those maxed yeah, out there we go. at this point. So this is going to be a very, very strong defensive setup here for Cham. And also has the Nidus Worm nearly finishing up, which could put in some really annoying offense. But here's that angle we were talking about. Knocks out the Gas Geyser. Banshee's actually getting a surprising amount of good damage done as the Viper's trying to duck some of the Siege Tanks, but it takes a while to kill. It does, but that's that's 40% of the Siege Tanks right now. That is very oh, yeah. scary. Lurkers are not burrowed up here. But Dolan doesn't necessarily want to push in. Tutu has completed. If he could have scanned and seen that the Lurkers were unburrowed, ah, they've got Adaptive Talons anyways. They would have been fine. Cool decision to actually prioritize the Adaptive Talons with what Cham has seen. Ooh, these Lurkers are going to be able to avis... Well... Ah, there's a lot of bio here. He's just going to click down the hatch. Oh, click... Oh, my God. Please kill it. Kill it. Kill it. No. No, Dolan. It was like... What? Ah one attack if dolan loses this game i feel like he is going to remember that moment <laughs> yes i think <laughs> you're probably hurts. right that oh really hurts god and he had to pull all the way back like he he had to pull back his attack on the right hand side where he was trying to kill off or kill uh, managed to kill off like the gas geyser and shut down a little bit of mining but now the mining is back there's a night storm going up inside his main base which a single marauder is attacking it's not enough I'm a without little stimming. That it's not right clicking down the it's not right clicking down the nidus. Yeah. Oh no. Oh, that is really rough. We see a ton of units getting in on top of this. Dolan's gonna try and drag and drop on top of this with a nice spread of bio. But I mean this is a lot of well set up lurkers. Ugh, trades right now, even trades favor Cham off of the better economy that the Zerg player has, but I think these are far better than even trades. Lurkers might get concaved upon here. We'd love to see actually a blinding cloud, but he doesn't even need it. The Lurkers still went out. And in the main base, that attack has not yet been cleaned up. Sham is getting some amazing trades off the back of this. Oh, and oh, we even have God. Hydras cleaning up the Banshees. Yeah, he just unloaded more. He's just rallying units in through the Nidus, and he yep. killed off two of the barracks that had the reactors on them. He might kill the reactor soon. That's it. That's too much. It's GG. And Cham takes the game in what looked to be like a, a kind of nice setup there for the offense from Dolan initially. He seemed like he was getting into a good ni nice spot. That was a nice map for that kind of push in and everything. He even found a lot of the damage on the left-hand side on that hatchery. Seemed like he was maybe going to be able to kill it. I don't think that Dolan will have to beat himself up too much about not killing the hatchery because I think that hatchery, it definitely impacted things a bit. But I don't know if it's what literally lost him the game in that sense. Oh, absolutely but, man, not. Yeah. That, no, there, there was... I, a lot of things that fell apart there pretty hard yeah i yeah i'm even thinking about small little things like the fact that that one marauder if it had just been right clicked on the nidus worm it would have killed the nidus worm so it wouldn't have been able to just continue to rally out more and more units and stuff could have eventually gotten the cleanup there maybe then he also defends the south location eventually it's just maybe there's a bit of a stabilization but things really snowballed really quickly they did uh yeah, it's Cham is a very strong player. Uh, you could see like he had got a nice little Ling run by in on the third at mm -hmm. one point. Uh, he just managed that situation way better than Dolan did, unfortunately. And Dolan, it was a really powerful timing that he set up, but the execution of Cham was just very clean, uh, relatively speaking. And yeah, abducting those first couple of tanks. He, he set himself up really well to deal with basically exactly what Dolan did with that quick adaptive talons, the quick vipers. Uh, you mentioned the counterattack potential with that Nidus Worm, which obviously meant that Dolan could not kind of extend the game. But that's... Yeah. That is a game, though, that you're like, uh, crap. Like, he just played better than me.
He just played better. It definitely was a little bit rough. Uh, but, you know, I do think that Dolan, again, is not someone that I ever really count out too strongly, even if he has, like, one bad game. I think that is kind of a nice thing about... It's, it's an advantage and a disadvantage when you are a player that is very good with preparation and build orders and build order choices. Sometimes, I think... The downside is you can win games really one-sidedly and then the next game you kind of lose and you're like, oh, couldn't really carry over that momentum because I sort of revealed one of my build orders which worked and then the next one didn't. Mm. But on the opposite end, sometimes one game goes by, it doesn't go super well, but then you can really turn things around in the next game because the map is different. You're able to exploit different kinds of aspects of it and find different openings. So I'm interested to see how map, uh, game number two is going to go. Yeah, me too. Uh, it is going to be Alcyone. And we're going to get into it. Spawning down on the bottom left for Starlight Twinkle. It is Jam. And up here in the top right-hand side, but attempting oh. for a moment to evacuate to a different location on the map, it is Danger Dolan. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a feels bad, man. So yeah. I talk about, sometimes I like overstate some of the stuff that happens in the early stages of a game. You know, like it's like, uh, I think for Christiana versus Lambo, I was like, oh, Christiana let his, his uh, probe accidentally mine right away. Like he's shook, you know? And obviously mostly that's, that's sarcasm. And mostly it's just like, mm -hmm. it sucks, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, having all your workers stop mining for any period of time in the first 30 seconds of the game, that is pretty big. That is actually a, a significant loss, as we can see on the, the WCS game hard, the income advantage. It's, hurts, it affects you yeah. in a lot of ways, both in the game and mentally. It definitely hurts. Uh, we are going to see a CC first coming out from Dolan again. So he's going to go down a similar route in that sense. And we'll see. If, I feel like a lot of the time, one of the cool things that Dolan does very well is he's very good at planning for a best of series. Trying to move past, you know, the whole mental damage that clearly is kind of exhibiting a little bit but i think one thing to keep an eye on is dolan is good at planning out a best of series where he creates a build order that he shows in game number one and then the follow-up game game number two game number three it looks similar to the same build as game number one mm. but has a variation so it if you're scouting it it will oftentimes look like you're facing off against the same thing but then a curveball gets thrown and he's able to exploit something. I think Dolan's very good at those kind of things. So I'm waiting to see if there's any kind of deviations that he has from that first game. Yeah, it's going to be really intriguing to keep our eyes peeled for that. We are going to see a reactor first off of this CC. <laughs> Zero and marine reactor first. Yeah, this this is a situation where we, <laughs> we don't see this. It doesn't happen. Like, I don't remember the last time it's happened at a pro match. But let's pretend that there's a 12 pool roach ravager rush coming. Dolan will find out about it when the ravagers are killing him. He is going to open up with a, bu a bunker. Okay, that that's some degree of safety. Um, but it, it is, is still a situation where if a, if someone like Cham had decided like, hey, I know that Dolan likes to come in with these really strong prepared builds. Let me let me just I, I'm up 1-0 in the series. Mm -hmm. Let me just throw spaghetti at the wall and try it. It would have worked. Yeah. I mean honestly, Cham is the kind of player who would do something like that too. I, he, I think he is too, to yeah. Do like that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a calculated risk that Dolan took, and it's paying off so far. He's not mm -hmm. getting punished for it or anything. So I do like the I can't argue with the results, and I like the choice in the end. So uh we do have Tech Lab being built on that factory, though. Starport also coming on Ooh. up. That is a really quick four gases. This has to be BCs. And I'm like oh, so? certain it's going to be two port BC, I think. Dolan uh, is going to start up. Oh, oh, he starts with a siege tank. That might just be for safety. But I'm pretty sure we're going to see a fusion core. There it is. Fusion core coming mm -hmm. on in. We're going to see a second starport. Yep. And we are going to be seeing double port bc well as far as build orders go this is one of the best you can use to steal a game against an unsuspecting zerg <laughs> captain dolan gonna be piloting his way to victory here if you can uh ma manage to muster it but single marine of the bunker is actually enough to scare off the zergling as the rest of the marines are poised around his main base in a nice arc 
as well as over at the natural. He just really wants to make sure that Fusion Core goes unscouted. But funny enough, little to Dolan's knowledge, there is in fact not a single <laughs> Overlord nearby to scout. So no, there is not. There's actually not. no danger of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is actually something that Cham does probably more than most Zergs, is he mm -hmm. will keep his Overlords very tight to the chest. Uh, he will keep them on his side of the map quite often and I use them force. to scout around for barracks or for proxy racks. That is a Six. lot of spores. He has read this completely. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if it's because he saw that there's still just one Marine in the bunker and there's like barely anything else. I, uh, I guess so. This is such an unbelievably good read. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, this does not it does not get much better than this. Uh it is gonna be Yamato Cannon with those first two BCs, but six spores is so damn good. I have to assume that Dolan has done this against Cham, or Cham has seen enough of Dolan's play or enough of just Terran in general's play to be like, yeah, this is this is what's happening. That is so many spores. They're a little early, obviously, but I'm not gonna critique them considering how perfectly they will deal with this setup. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it will be, of course, still important to be on point about where you actually have your queens and stuff, because the spores by themselves do not just deflect the battle cruisers. You do need to make sure that you have enough queens in position, try and push back the battle cruisers, try and absorb damage and stuff. And he's doing a great job of it. He's losing a couple of these drones, but he's staying so stacked on top of the drones, it's hard to actually right click them down. The battle cruisers are already in the orange hit points, and they already use teleport. So they have to walk home, or I should say fly home, but yeah. Yeah, this is a ridiculously good start for Cham right here. Uh, drone Losing three drones to a double port BC, even when you've built six fours, is so fine for the Zerg. Absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculously fine. Uh, it is going to be mech behind this. We've got a third CC already done. There's that Yamato cannon able to pick off a couple of queens. But that's not enough damage. Now, the Spire will complete pretty soon. Did he teleport a... Th There's a third BC. Did he, he Did he teleport? I swear I heard the, like, click. No? I do not know. Let's see. I uh, guess not. No, just in the natural. So Okay. It's the Phantom Click. It's it's yeah. your PTSD starting up from all the Terrans that you've been backing Terrans you've played on the ladder. Uh, good job from Dolan to not blink in with that next set of BCs because mm -hmm. if he had done that, uh, the Corruptors would have popped out and that would have been two dead BCs. Maybe he would have traded out, but the most important thing when you're going for these BCs is to keep them alive because they will continue to accrue value, especially against Mass mm -hmm. Corruptor. Y Yamato Cannon... Uh, each each BC Yamato's down a corruptor. You teleport out. You keep adding to your BC count. This can get real ugly for the Zerg very quickly. Dolan, he's on the back foot for sure, but there are ways to to make headway in this game, and continuing to build BCs is certainly one of them. Yeah, battle cruisers they really do just find ways to still somehow make magical victories happen, and I mean. We're at a point now where the Corruptor Town is just so low, but there are still more Battle Cruisers out on the map than there are Corruptors. So yeah. when you continue Yamato's on Corruptors, you really can keep that count quite low. That means that the Battle Cruisers start to bully their way around the map. They oh my God. shut down or cancel a gold base, for example. Dolan hasn't lost anything. Yeah. He has not lost a single thing because there's been no fights. There's another Corruptor going down. Cham has really misunderstood this after an amazing read. He did not realize that his, his opponent just continued to commit to BCs. This is so good right now for Dolan. He's getting amazing pickoffs. Corruptors continuing to go down now even to the actual just regular DPS of the BCs. I am getting really worried for Cham in this game. Yeah, I think Cham is getting really worried for Cham in this game. The Corruptor Cannon is also still yet again, almost even with the number of battle cruisers here on this side of the map. Right clicking down the hatchery, though, he's oh, not going to focus on those Corruptors. Oh. Eventually teleports out. I technically oh, can he could just Yamato it down and then teleport out. Oh my god. Yo, yo, yo! Hey, that's such a sick pick off from Dolan. Danger Dolan. Puts that hatchery in danger and takes it down. Now, there is a scary moment where those BCs are repairing. 
And obviously you gotta be very mindful that the corruptors don't dive them. This That's is fast. so good for Dolan. He still hasn't lost anything. We're going we're transitioning to swarm hosts. And not just a hand, like this is a hard commitment to swarm hosts. This is 13 swarm hosts gonna be out on the map. I am very confused by this choice. Now, there is always a risk that if you go so hard into the BCs, you start running into like Ravager and Fester as the super hard counter to BCs. But if he had kept building BCs, this would be very bad for Cham. And in fact, seeing those swarm hosts, I wouldn't even mind him committing to more BCs. But six yeah. BCs is still really, really good against this. I I am loving this situation right now for Cham or for uh, for Dolan. I'm hating it for Cham. Yeah, no, I, this is looking very, very strong for Dolan right now. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. The Battlecruisers can actually take out a lot of the Swarm Host Locust Wave as they're popping on out. Teleport coming out on one of the Battlecruisers. It comes out a little bit too late, but he is going to be able to clean up a majority of the Corruptors in the air. The Roaches and Ravagers trying to get damage done on the ground, but a lot of them just end up actually falling, or a lot of them are getting pushed back. 12 workers fall, but Dolan holds on to his base, and I feel like you have to remember always swarm host supply is so inflated that yeah. even with cham maxed out right now dolan is holding on and he's continuing to build up a very scary looking army yeah the only thing i'll say is that dolan's economy is way worse than that of cham's now we are going to see corrosive yeah. vials trying to get in here oh siege tanks do siege up locusts are starting to find a lot of value in the natural and many many scvs have gone down dolan is now down over 30 workers and counting. Ugh. This might be a situation where he wins every battle and loses the war. I think you may very well be right. We're going to have to see now, especially with more Corruptors finally being added on. I was thinking there was maybe a moment where the battle cruiser count would be high enough. You could actually either just teleport in on top of the Swarmos or teleport in on top of your opponent's like base, snipe off the Spire and just start basically trading i was gonna say base but, trade yeah 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 i was thinking that might be the moment but i don't think that that's really gonna be as possible anymore right because now it's 11 corruptors to six battle cruisers I, I think the corruptor count is actually high enough now and the swarm hose just found every siege tank on the right mm. side they were not covered by hellbats they were not covered by those bcs dolan is he, he it started so well for him so well for him but sham was able to get the job done nonetheless couple of cool moments where Ravager's corrosive vile BCs as they were trying to Yamato. Mm -hmm. And Sham, he just stayed calm through all of it and takes the game and the series. Very well yeah. played from Sham. Truly, truly well done. And I have to say, like, really penning it back to Sham's unbelievably good read on just seeing the number of units at the front door for Dolan and suspecting maybe it's just like a little bit of a reputation thing maybe it's like what you said a little bit historically dolan has been doing this i know that he didn't play any other zergs in uh dolan didn't play any other zergs in the kind of uh group stages thus far he played trigger and epic so i can't think of any reason he would have seen like the broadcast of matches for ept north america and thought this is what he's gonna do but regardless of the reason cham had such a great read on that at least initially Got a little bit hectic and scary later on, but the initial read prevented him from taking an immediate loss. He was able to recover from any kind of damage he took and did a great job just following it up with what I thought was a little bit of a scary thing to do with the Swarm Host, but worked out perfectly. So, you know, I'll eat my words on that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Whenever I see a Corruptor count that's that low relative to the BCs, it feels so scary. But yeah. the BCs didn't have any upgrades. It was 2-2 two, two on the Roach Ravager, the Swarm Hosts. Uh, the tank count never really got that high. I'm really curious, like, I, I would be really curious to see what would have happened with that same push. If instead of six BCs, there were eight BCs, and all the Yamatos land on the Corruptors before the Swarm Hosts can get right on top of the base. Because if the, if the Locusts are getting gunned down by eight BCs, as and like the, let's say there's even let's say there's even like five corruptors left but there's not enough to actually really contest the bcs that first swarm host push gets smashed and then i feel like dolan is in so much more control he, he takes his fourth base he's on a ridiculous bc count i don't know i, I would have really liked to have seen 
how that could have been different, but kudos to Cham for taking that one down. We are going to head to a quick break. Five minutes, we'll be back with a potentially very scrappy ZBZ coming ahead. It's going to be Eric versus Eggs.
Welcome back, everyone. I am once again steadfast for our penultimate series of the day. It is going to be a ZVZ between a couple of players from South America, Eric and Eggs. This is going to be a pretty interesting one with, I think, a lot of aggression. Yeah, it's kind of funny because this is going to be that Latin American showdown. It's almost a return from the days where before we were Americas, it was just North America. And then there was Copa America or Latin American kind of region. And it's so now just the two Latin American players facing off against each other here in an important match. Eggs and Eric, both, like you said, aggressive players. I think Eric has been the more accomplished player, especially lately. So I think a lot of people will look at this and give him credit or assume that he'll just kind of have an edge. But I do feel like the ZVZs in the Latin American region gets so weird and so scrappy especially when you watch like those old copa america matches eggs also has beaten eric the last or okay i can't say beaten them because yeah, there yeah, one time yeah one of them's tied, a little weird yeah they tied in like a one of the series or something for like some finals but he has won the last three series outside of that tie against eric and this is basically for all the matches that they played in 2023 and 2022 so I think that Air Egg still has a very, very solid chance at beating Eric in this one. I really do think that this could go either way on this. Yeah, I'm definitely of the opinion that I think Eric is the stronger player, but you can't deny winning even even with you know three two ones and a two two in the finals of a tournament. I don't know how that possibly came to pass, but it's very funny I to look at on the regular. Like, I'm guessing one started from upper bracket. Yeah, upper bracket, and they start up 1-0 or something. Yeah, and that, then that a, almost the way Ligulak records that is that they don't mark that as like an actual extra game one. At, nor should they. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's correct to do it that way. Uh, we are going to be starting things off on Golden Aura. Is this also the first time we're getting Golden Aura today? I think it might be the first time we've seen Golden Aura because I, I feel like I usually do remember when we see Golden Aura. Yeah, it usually sticks out as a map where I'm like, hey, you can't can't attack up that ramp, can't attack yeah. up that ramp, that ramp can't <laughs> can't at, leave the ramps alone. And meanwhile, I'm like, Monkey Brain is like, oh, but there's a siege tank. Get the siege tank. <laughs> yeah. Sixteen. Thankfully, we won't have to up. deal with that yeah. in ZVZ at least. But <laughs> no, it'll just it'll just be roaches moving up a ramp into other roaches. Yeah. But I did actually look up that uh, that event that they tied in in that finals, and Eggs was the one that was in the winners bracket. So Eggs did ah. technically defeat him in that as well. Okay. So Eggs technically on a four series winning streak against Eric. Yeah, he tied two two to win three to two. Yeah, exactly. Don't you don't you love Upper bracket, lower bracket maths. It is so janky. And that, those are the kind of setups that really like just leave such a bad taste in players' mouths. And I know the fans are like, Meh, but it you got to give an advantage somewhere. And spawning down in the platinum esports colors saved it. It is eggs. And up here in the top left hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player. He is our Brazilian, Eric. Aha, I got you there, Mapu. You thought I, you thought I was about to say his name there. You you zoomed in on Brazilian. <laughs> uh, Representing Cranky Ducklings. Brazilian I just, I just love messing ducklings. with Mapu. Mapu is the most fun to mess with. <laughs> mm. I like it. It's, it's definitely... How funny would it be if he just now refused to cast the game? Like, you just, like, put the camera in the corner and he's like... <laughs> And he's he done just, that before, I think, at a home story cup. He just, <laughs> yeah, he just, yeah, exactly. He just went off to the corner. Said, the I'm way, not going to observe the, the game. The way he did the slow pan, as though he just like, he just literally left it on the side, and as though it started drifting on its own. That was <laughs> that was actually skillfully done. That was an artful, artful meme right there. Um, yeah. Something kind of cool here we're seeing out of Eric is specifically what he pioneered himself. And has kind of taken the Zerg build order nerds, myself included, by storm. Uh, and that is the Extractor Trick 15 hatch. So he was the player who came up with it. He used it to defeat Dark in back-to-back -back weeks in the ESL Open Cup. 
mm -hmm. and then took his ball and went home and said, I'm not playing dark no more. What are you, you crazy? <laughs> I have a two series <laughs> win streak against him. Why would, I, why would I ever play another series against him? Um, but yeah, it was a lot of mind games came out of this. It kind of revolutionized Zerg versus Zerg play for a little bit, and then Zerg versus Terran play, and then Zerg versus Protoss play. It's kind of slipped back into less common play, but it's it's cool. Yeah. It really is fun when such a basic form of a build order where it's not, oh, we have this timing attack or some cool build order play style or something that comes out 10 or 12 minutes in, you start to see the deviations or some kind of innovation there. It's, no, this is the first minute and a half of the game. Something that has been mapped out, played out thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times and someone comes up with a way to innovate it. Like, that is truly an impressive feat. Yeah, because the knock-on effects for the rest of the game are madly profound. Um, you get your, your hatchery 10 seconds earlier. You get your queens 10 seconds earlier. Uh, it costs you a couple drones. Obviously, you have to... Uh, in terms of opportunity cost, you wouldn't be mining with as many drones right away. And the bigger thing now is, is that in order to mitigate that, people are taking later gases. Mm -hmm. which is meaning that your link speed timing is now delayed a lot at the time. Hmm. But it's Speaking still... link speed. Yes. We have a double gas opener here from Eggs. After going gasless, it did get scouted by Eric. And now we've got a full wall at the front representing a two-base build while building link speed. This could be a couple of things coming in from Eggs. It could, of course, just be... Uh, like plus one roaches, but it could also be muta play off of a lane flood. Could even be plus one carapace. There's so many things that this could be, and it's going to be really difficult to read for uh, Eric. A lot of mind games at play here. Yeah, this is going to be very difficult and annoying to scout. So Eric, we're going to have to keep an eye on where those overlords are when he's going to actually catch wind of something. Drone is making his way over to the third base, and an Overlord for Eric will spot out that third base timing, which I think is at least a little bit helpful. But it's just continued Ling production right now, and Queen is continuing to push back those Overlords. It's going to take even longer to actually see the Ling Flood moving across the map because they're going to try and circumvent these. Actually, no, okay, never mind. Goes underneath the Overlord, so it does get seen. <laughs> Well, the good thing for Eric is he was already building roaches off of 43 drones. Uh, he does get caught out a little bit here, but with a few more roaches popping out, this should be just fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very nice Ravager Morph right there. Uh, even just forcing the Lings to spend a little bit more time on that is obviously good news for Eric. More Lings flooding across, but behind this, it is a transition into roaches. And this is already, I would say, very well defended here from Eric. Even if that trades pretty well and he gets a queen, which he does, knocks the queen count down to two, roaches are not the craziest in terms of larva intensity until you have like 66 drones. Uh, this is fantastic, actually, for Eric. He's mm -hmm. got a much faster plus one missile, which is a better quality upgrade than the plus one carapace. He's got the layer. He's got a small worker lead. I like everything about this. And Eggs, as has just been scouted now, is only on Hatchery Tech. This has to do massive damage. And as soon as he saw that there was only Hatch Tech, fires up three spines. Great read from Eric. Yeah, this is going to be really, really tough for Eggs. He, like you said, he has to get a ton of damage from this. And it's not even that he just has to get a ton of damage. There is no running away. Because like you said, no roach speed for Eggs. Eric is going to have his own road speed soon, so if you overcommit and you find you can't do anything over here, you're going to get chased all the way back across the map by speed roaches. That you are. He didn't even really need the spines here. Corosa Bile actually landing on a few of Eggs' own lings. Of course, the plus one carapace for Eggs nullifies the plus one missile, so the lings do not get uh, two-shotted anymore. They go back to being three-shotted, but... Eric has that defender's advantage. He read this setup very nicely, and now there's that road speed completing. Eggs has absolutely been held, and this attack has been squashed. He's going to try and drone out of it, but Eric just feels so far ahead right now. And if he just goes with 1-1 one, one Roach, actually, I don't, I don't even know if this is possible to hold. It's going to be certainly very, very tough, because Eric is already sitting at nearly double the supply right now, or army supply, of Eggs. And if both of these players are just making non-stop roaches, but one of them just has a 1-1 upgrade advantage, then, well, 
in theory, Eric should even be able to overcome any kind of defender's advantage with the faster reinforcing roaches. Like you said, it's going to be very, very tough for Eric or Eggs to try and make this defense happen, but we'll see what he can muster because he certainly isn't giving up just yet, despite the roaches moving across the map. This is quite interesting because Eric got himself a little bit supply blocked, so he starts a plus two missile. He's actually got a ton of gas in the bank for a situation like this. It's electing not to go for Ravagers, uh, but he's just going to go for it. Yeah, and I think he's got too much. A little link counterattack in the main base will distract, but he is losing overwhelmingly at the front, and Eric is just going to be able to blast through with this 1-1 one, one Roach counterattack. There's no Roach speed on the way, nor is there enough Roaches to deal with this anyways. And we are going to see a game one victory for Eric. I just want to also say that, like, not only, of course, did Eric win the game, he didn't lose any drones to that Ling run by. Oh, wow. Like, that's not impressive. a single drone went down. That was kind of amazing. Yeah. That is very uh, impressive, actually, because it looked like it was going to get some value. Even with like the plus eight one or carapace. 10 Lings there. Yeah. 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 It gets into an exposed mineral line. You're like, ah, that should, should find at least two drones. Like, if it's just the drones fighting, even with the help of a queen, it's usually going to be a couple. But it goes to show that uh, Eric was up to the task of multitasking against that. Eggs, he went for that very committed attack. It really didn't get anything done. And Eric just uh, calmly swatted it away and wins on the counterattack. Even, <laughs> even with him not committing super hard to that counterattack and getting supply blocked, that should tell you how far ahead he was after he defended that attack. Yeah, he absolutely was. Talking about just how he defended the attack as well, I think you were pointing this out, though, is that there were multiple possibilities of what could have been coming out there from eggs, and Eric still just kind of identified at least a safe pathway of making a handful of those roaches relatively early on. So the time that he technically saw exactly what he was facing off against with the lings making their way through the center of the map, that would have been too late to start reacting and start flooding out a ton of roaches. So... He picked a really nice middle of the pathway build and it worked out just really, really well for him. Yeah, it certainly did. And uh, as a result, he finds himself up one to zero. And yeah. that they're, these players are both at one one, right? So neither player will be eliminated. Oh. Neither player. I was like steadfast. You just said that he was up one zero. How could <laughs> they both be one one? <laughs> yes. In the round ramen, both of these players are sitting at a 1-1 one, one score, which means yes. there's no elimination and there's no like advancing the playoffs for either one of these players. Um, Eggs did have a pretty fun bracket of playing Nina and M. Canning, two just disruptor lords, basically, of North America. Uh, lost to Nina and beat M. Canning, whereas I believe it was Eric ended up losing to Cham in a ZBZ, oh. but then beating Foxer in yes. uh, ZBT. We cast that uh, that M Canning series versus Eric and the ZBT versus Foxer. That ZBT versus Foxer, if you're going to watch one game, I mean, it's probably going to be one of the PVPs, but if you're going to watch a T <laughs> ZBT, that one was so freaking close and uh, really, really came down to the wire. A cool tech switch from Eric barely edged out the game for him there. But we got to get into this one because we got something spicy coming up here, spawning up at the top right with what appears to be an 12-11. Uh, it is Cranky Duckling's Eric. It's 12.56 right now for me, though. Mmm, a 3.56 uh -huh. for me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Starting down here on the bottom left-hand side of the map, we have the red Zerg player. He is Eggs. And... Platinum Esports, and uh, yeah. He's going for a 17 hatch, which is a little oopsie because he made his extra drone. Oh, is he? He uh, has hat minerals for it. Oh my God, that's so late. That's like, that's legitimately about 12 seconds late from when he should have built that. I'm confused because he, it wasn't like he wasn't selecting the drone. He had the drone. He, he was like he was clicking it, it around. He had a hundred mineral. He built up until a hundred minerals. Was he waiting to see? No, there's nothing he could have been waiting to see, right? No. Like, I guess maybe Ling's moving across the map. No, Ling's for a 12 pool wouldn't have been done. That That is really, really bad for... Oh, I got to put this score. That is really bad for eggs for a lot of reasons here. Uh, one, you don't get the queen production started up right away. So that's going to be 10 seconds later. Uh, two, you don't get the armory on the setup. Although it looks like Eric is going to be trying to sneak around with these Ling's. 
but the armor won't kick in until about the 210 mark. So these lings are still going to be able to find value. This is really rough right now for eggs in terms of trying to defend this hatchery. The, the only thing I'll say is this might look like a pool first, but why would you... I... Yeah... It's a little bit unfortunate, but now the drone pull is going to happen. The hatchery is already at lower than 50% hit points, and not that much time has actually been bought so far. He still needs to buy more time. Four links have finally popped. A few more links are going to be popping out of that natural soon, but the fight is already taken, and a couple of drones have already fallen. Four drones going down, and there's still so many links left over for Eric. Yeah, this already evens out the worker count and ling speed. This was not a uh, ling bane all in. This is, in fact, a speedling expand behind this. Eric already evening out the worker count. His opponent, oh, oh no, God. he doesn't get the wall up. He went for the quick bane ling nest. That means there's no ling speed on the way. Now, this shouldn't end the game, but it can still find a couple drones here and there in addition to what it's already found. Yeah, even just forcing all these lings right now for eggs to chase him around. Continue to find a few little pickoffs here or there. Even if you don't find drones, you're actually softening up the ling count, which in and of itself is also giving you a little bit of a defensive advantage of knowing my opponent isn't actually being offensive with their lings. They can't really get anything done right now. Oh, and even getting one drone right there, that's what, like 8% of the economy? Slow that's so Slow much. lings making their journey across the map right now, Dave. Yeah, this is an all-in. Uh, and he doesn't have lane speed. This is so committed. How many queens do we have right now for eggs? Or pardon me, for Eric. Uh, just soon one, but he's about to be at two and very soon after three. Uh, oh, and there's a spine. Yeah, this this ain't working. Two spines. Uh, yeah. Well, there's one spine done. Yeah, Second spine true. in production. The, the thing is, he it, like the only way he could lose is right now, before the additional queen comes online, before the spine crawler could finish. There, yeah. This is just not going to work. Yep. Lings are going to have a hard time busting through the queens before really most of the banelings are taken care of. Even if they did manage to run by after killing off those queens, the lings don't even have speed, so they will get very, very easily caught. And that is going to be a total shutdown on the aggression. Eggs is now stuck on one base. He's trying to drone up behind this, but I don't even know what the tran... Yeah, I don't think Eggs knows what the transition is. Eric takes the 2-0 victory there after a, uh, a very, very effective 12-11. Yeah, uh, not a not a common build to say the very least. Uh, it would have been tough to defend that in the best of circumstances, mm -hmm. but having your hatchery ten seconds late, ah, uh, that it makes things a lot worse. Uh, now, interestingly, eggs. Actually, I'm looking at the build order here. He actually had a quicker gas and pool, which makes me wonder. Was this supposed to be... I, I want, Okay, this might not have actually been a mistake from Eggs. This might have been a really hardcore mind game that ran into a really brutal hard counter uh, because he went for a 17, 16, 15. And I, I think he might have been trying to go for his own counter all in or maybe like counter timing. But yeah, that just that just sucks a lot. Really unfortunate there, but that is going to mean that Eric ends up coming out victorious there in the end, two to zero, and he is going to be in a nice, comfortable spot there. One match or oh, one game away from potentially advancing on. Eggs is still going to have a shot, but is now going to be one game away from uh, getting knocked out. But guys, we're going to be moving to a short break before we move into our final series of the day. It is going to be special versus Maples coming up right after the break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, everyone. I am Steadfast. I'm joined by Fear Dragon for our very last series of the day. This is going to be hopefully a good one. Uh, it is going to be a match that I honestly wasn't really expecting to see at this stage because I kind of thought Special would be at 2-0 two, two maybe. But uh, Trigger put up a hell of a performance. He actually has already qualified through into the playoffs. First one to do... Oh, pardon me, to do so. Defeating the champion of the region. The multi-time champion of the region, in fact, to do so. But we've got this match in front of us right now. And that is going to be Special versus Maples. This has been going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating one to see. Just because Special is, I think without a doubt, a heavy favorite coming into this. And it's kind of alluding back to what you were saying. It's already a surprise to even see him sitting one and one, but it makes a lot more sense when you do look at the player he had to face off against of Trigger. And even I think Epic actually putting up a really, really strong showing against Special. But now I think Special versus Maple Special should really be the heavy favorite. And wow, all right. Uh, this is a surprise, Steadfast. I don't know if you've noticed this, we were in this lobby, and uh, for those who don't know, just because Maples is maybe a little bit of a lesser known player, he is a Protoss player. And I don't mean like he's sometimes a Protoss player, I mean he's always a Protoss player. Maples has chosen to play as Terran for this series. Yes, he has. And it's, we even like double checked, it's like Maples race is like, yep, ready. And that is allowed in the rules. Just to be clear, you can race pick map to map even uh wow okay i really d <laughs> i really don't know what to make of that uh but we are gonna get into it here it is alcyony to start things off i mean my instincts are it's got to be like proxy two racks marauder or something right like there's no way he doesn't cheese but like is it going to be just a straightforward two racks reaper proxy or is it going to be something with a little more mustard on it is it going to be like the cuckoo three racks reaper where you don't even get your orbital oh he picked he switched back to protoss oh my god at the last second wait did he really i don't even know if it was at the last second or what <laughs> but he did switch back to protoss at some point during the lobby i'm on the loading screen we can see it we can we can indeed yeah. i'm just i'm you know, it's possible that he thought he, like, was kind of just gearing up and getting ready for the series. Yeah, yeah, and he didn't and notice he has, the... It's like yeah. someone says, like, okay, check your race. He's like, yeah, it's fine. And then you realize after, it's like, oh, wait, okay, never mind. I'm, I'm not fine, actually. Yes, yeah, that that is the likeliest scenario, I would say, uh, is that he just didn't realize and he wasn't doing yeah. anything sketchy. Uh, <laughs> because that would be really <laughs> funny to do literally a last-second race switch. Um, Dude, that's that used to be my my strategy in Brood War lobbies, like back in the day in the '90s, <laughs> like l late '90s, early 2000s. I would definitely be the player that'd be like, "Yeah, playing as uh, playing as Terran right now," and then race switch to Protoss the last second in Cannon Rush. Oh, dude, that was that was the dream. There's a lot of things you could do. Switch to Zerg in four pool. So many things you could possibly do Matthew, there. We didn't we didn't introduce the players. What do you? Why are you zooming in, man? Why are you zooming? What are you doing? No, you you can't do that without us. <laughs> we control you, okay? No. Oh Starting my up God. here on the top right hand side of the map, we have the red ter Mapu, Mapu. Are you gonna disrespect the players like thank you? On the top right hand side, we have the red Terran player. He is special. He's representing a team hyper one. And his opponent spawning down in the bottom left for Team Gosu. It is Maples. Affectionately known as Mape the Ape. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, I, he special, left. Yeah, he left. Hyper one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He left random hyper one. Okay. Liquipedia, update it, please. Ah, uh, how could you? Now they might actually. They do have some ardent watchers. They uh, they work tirelessly there at Liquipedia. No, I, I absolutely, deeply appreciate those Liquipedia editors. They even actually. For those who don't know, they even do monthly rankings of like the most contributions and stuff mm. to Liquipedia each month. It's pretty cool. Cynical yeah. Death Cyn is uh, almost always... Cynical Death is number one. <laughs> yeah, almost always topping the charts. I, I don't know if I've ever seen him not. Yeah. Nice little pick off on the probe over there as it did get uh, trapped in by the Supply Depot wall. So special 
getting a nice snag there. But the probe also seeing, you know, timing of the factory and the double gas opening over here. And Maple's going to know, I mean, not super atypical or anything, that this is going to be just one of those builds where Special can get a little bit more in his face a bit earlier on. Yeah, that will certainly be uh, something he has to worry about. And Special... Special is one of the players that I believe lamented the old Cyclone. He actually really liked doing pushes uh, kind of orchestrated around the old Cyclone. By the way, that's a lot of damage, actually. Oh, man, Ooh. Special is going to lose the Reaper. All right. That ain't so bad for Maples really to start off. That, I mean, that was very, very cute, especially when your opponent's trying to go for, like, this double Reaper plus Cyclone opening and stuff. You're looking to maybe get a couple extra little kills here or there, but... Now, one of the Adepts doesn't even end up shading forward, so it is going to be able to try to deal with the Reaper. It does still find a probe here and gets a full scat out, so this Reaper is still very much so paying for itself. Might even get a second probe. Oh, no. that Adept came in like Superman, just flying in to save the day. That was cool as hell. That was... Yeah, I mean, I, I still think that at the end of the day, even though that started off really nicely for Maples... I still kind of like how it all turns out in the end for a special where he gets both of the adepts or sorry uh, he gets he gets the full scout he loses two of the reapers sure but he also kills off one of the adepts with the cyclone he can put some pressure on and stuff it's actually I don't I don't hate this for special no I I, I agree I actually like it a decent amount as well it is going to be a quick banshee opener here from special I had uh I had Roddy's stream open for just a little bit he's doing the co-streaming and he was saying, I don't think special, or I don't think Maples is going to see the, the Banshees of Special coming. And sure enough, Special is <laughs> opening up with a quick Banshee here. Now, I don't think we're going to see Cloak for this. The, there's already enough gas to go for it if he wanted to. So this might end up just being a potential, like, kind of push forward with a bunch of Marine Tank and Cloakless Banshees and just trying to set up a really strong position we actually see, never mind, this is going to be a single Banshee into Raven for realsies. A uh, little bit of a... Oh, no, it's just a, a tiny frictional supply block. The depot is finishing up right there. But actually, Maples has a maybe a real supply block. It looks like a real supply block. Smells like a real supply block. Oh, and this smells like a dead stalker. And Blink finishing three to four seconds later. Ugh. Oh, that's so unfortunate. Very painful. Uh, are there any shield batteries in the main mineral line? Because one single Banshee can get a lot done if you have no units in position and no shield battery, and both of those boxes are checked. Oh, he just warped in oh, offensively, no. too. Oh, this, looks, this looks so scary. That really might hurt. Well, SCV taken out. That was building the bunker and not actually re-starting uh, that just quite yet. There's the reaction as Pro's getting pulled away, but it's still going to be, I think, another four or five seconds before Stalkers can even be warped in defensively. We're seeing a load up into the Warp Prism with some of those Stalkers as Maples, I think, just trying to get some counter damage done, but so much lost mining time in the main base right now. And five probes is significant damage already for just one Cloakless Banshee. Like, this is absolutely mm -hmm. paid for itself for special here. The Stalkers in the main base will try and find something. Siege Tank in a good position. Oh, Interference Matrix used on the War Prism. Oh, Blink no. was just used as well. That is such a good find for Special. That might be all four Stalkers going down here. Good job from Maples to get the War Prism back in and save one of those. He, he killed got the Raven. Raven, actually. He got the Raven. Yeah. That's so, something. Yeah. It, it oh, got, no. Oh, no. Losing the War Prism. That's so unfortunate. I was going to say, this is a really bad spot. And I thought, oh, there's like one small thing you know you've been knocked down five pegs but at least you climb back up one by killing off the raven but then losing the war prism you get knocked back down two or three more i was gonna say oh. that's another three pegs off the top there that's that one hurts uh and i think he even lost some of the stalkers in the natural that were kind of poking around there special yeah. getting in towards that stim combat shields plus one weapons and uh, i mean this push is just gonna be so scary Maples obviously is on a decent economy right now in terms of the worker count, but when you lose this many units after investing into them relatively early on, I mean, it's just really hard to make up this kind of army, army size differential at this point. And I feel like this push coming out of special, it's just going to be so strong. 
Yeah, I mean, I would even venture so far as to say like 56 workers is a little bit light for what you want. If you're going to be on this three base economy, just trying to flat out units and you don't really have power units, you don't have a warp prism or anything. It's really just going to be pure unupgraded, like, a, you know, soon to be upgraded with plus one weapons is gateway units. Now, the next warp prism over here, if this can move out at the same time that specials doing his move out. I really like the potential for him to do some big damage. You maybe have like force additional units to pull back home for special or special just commits. Then you still manage to just like recall back some of those units and mount a defense somehow. There's still a potential here for Maples, but the chances are going, you know, lower and lower in percentages. Now, I will say spotting this double drop is actually huge. Mm -hmm. That is really nice for Maples. Uh, special, oh, Blink scanning is... the third base. Blink is available. And we are going to see actually a missed target on the medevac, which means a few more units do unload. Special still manages to force his way into the main base. Maples, a little bit of missed execution. Nope. And look at those warp and zealots getting absolutely murdered. That is not the warp in location you wanted. And shield battery overcharge is only doing so much. These bio forces are starting to run a little bit dry in hit points as the stims and everything have been adding on up. But... That was eight workers worth of damage, plus a ton of actually well traded out gateway units that just died for not really that much more than just a handful of bio units. Like, Special's gonna be very happy with those trades, and he's continuing the aggression. Still, he has another one of these double medevac drops. He's not even going for the big push out. He doesn't need to. He has confidence in his macro, and he still is just continuing to find damage with little bits of pressure. Yeah, and Maples is adding on Immortals, but that is not. That, that's like nice supply, but it's not amazing supply. It's not like Colossus or Disruptors or, I mean, any any advanced tech that's meaningful splash damage. Uh, he doesn't even have non-meaningful splash damage. He's just on Stalker, Immortal, Zealot. And when you're already kind of behind, it is really difficult to take effective fights against Marine Widowmine, even with the, the newly kind of nerfed Widowmines. Cyclone will get taken out, and the War Prism will survive, but that is not going to be so great here for Maples in terms of uh, losing those Zealots. Does clean up the drop in the main base, and Maples yeah. is actually kind of staying toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yeah, a little bit, in the sense that he's not following further behind right now, so yeah. I'm definitely with you on that, and I think that is nice. The Dark Shrine did get spotted out, so Missile Turrets are already starting on up, but... Looks like Mabel's is just going to opt to go for Archons instead of actually using any of the DTs, expecting that that was not only, you know, spotted, but I think Special, with his drop, tried to right-click down the Dark Shrine. So it's like, if you weren't sure if this was spotted, if, if like, they saw <laughs> yeah. it but they didn't really see it, that's a good indicator that they're just right-clicking it down. <laughs> yeah, usually that means they knew it was there. DTs are going to come in nonetheless. Oh, Missile Turret. Oh, no. It got to safety. And then it didn't. Couple of SCVs yeah. going down to the DTs, but nowhere near enough. Yeah, frankly, I, I think maybe one or two of those SCVs were just fall into the Siege Tank friendly fire. I, I think so, else. yeah. Yeah. More uh, SCVs are going down, it does seem like, thanks to the Zealot run by, but yeah, that she just sees the army as front door and says, nah, uh, uh, special is going to take game number one, looking quite strong doing so. Yeah, he took good trades pretty much at every opportunity, like you said. Mm -hmm. Uh, even with some of those drops getting cleaned up momentarily, it still just looked so comfy for Special. He never really looked in danger in that game, and he's going to be happy with a 1-0 victory, or 1-0 yeah, lead so I far. Think, I think the uh, it's worth mentioning that, again, a lot of that was Special maintaining a lead that he held from just the Banshees catching Maples at the absolute worst time. It was... Maple's not only trying to deal with the Banshee stuff, harassment and stuff, and he ended up losing like eight workers to it, but it was because the Banshee popped in right as Maple's had done an offensive warp in with all three of his warp kates. He didn't have anything to buy time. He didn't have a shield battery or anything else that would have helped out. And so it was kind of a calculated risk of like, you're just saying, well, my stalkers are getting ready to be aggressive. You're not expecting a Banshee at that time. So it is a little bit unfortunate with the timing and how far behind he fell. But then it was after that that really secured everything is that Maples kind of fell apart with his aggression. He lost his warp prism. He lost a ton of his stalkers there. The interference matrix catching the prism so that more of the stalkers couldn't escape and losing more stalkers than the natural. Like 
everything kind of snowballed from there, it felt like. But it all began with just really unfortunate Banshee timing pop into his main. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh... It, it was extra unfortunate. Now, Maples did a decent job of holding in the mid game uh, mm -hmm. off of such a significant disadvantage, but it ultimately wasn't enough on its own. And because you're not advancing the tech, because you're not building more probes, taking a fourth base, you're kind of in this weird situation where you're on the defense, but you're still all in. And basically your only way back into the game is A, take such a devastatingly one-sided fight that you can go across the map and win the game, or B, take a very good defensive fight that then opens up the door for you to, you know, start teching up, to start building a new base, to do all the things that will let you compete in the next stage of that game. Yep. Well, with all that being said, we're moving into game number two, as we're going to be starting down here in the bottom left-hand side of Post Youth, top of the blue Protoss player. He is Maples. And spawning up at the top right, he is the Red Terran player from Mexico. It is Juanito, the Dorito special. Spam this Dorito to help out Juanito. Mapu zooming in on Dorito instead of on special. People are going to be confused. Now don't... they're going to think his name is Dorito. Mm. His name could... His name very well could have been Dorito at some point because, you know, especially <laughs> through so many names. He has gone through a gamut of names. That is incredibly true. Uh, special, by the way, seeming to... I, against Maples, I actually really like the double gas opener just for the safety it provides. Like, I don't think one Rax Expand is particularly risky these days, but... It does make defending a little bit more difficult if your opponent does something crazy like proxying uh, two gates in a forge or even just proxying a second gate on the map and, you know, chronoing out units. I I'm I'm fond of specials build order choice. He knows he's the favorite. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he definitely knows that as well. And just playing around that like you're kind of talking about. Factory is going to be popping on up. There is the full wall in just to say, well, you can't really see exactly what's going on. So what if I did proxy the factory and I'm doing some kind of hellion drop? I'm bringing them back or all kinds of... Actually, hmm. I mean, we're not seeing that right now. It's a good map for it. <laughs> I was I was literally just looking at the map and I'm like, well, you could just run between the natural and the main. There's no like force... You can't like force field or body block the ramp or anything. You just move between the two mineral lines like that. I actually don't lo hate the idea of a, a proxy like Hellion Drop or something. Yeah, and you can build the proxy in such a perfect location that's so far away from the main ramp, but is so close to the natural yeah. mineral line. Like, you just put it in that bottom side where the base oh is. My God. You're so right. I'm vetoing this map as soon as we get out of this game. I, it's actually really... I oh. hadn't thought of it either, but it's really surprising we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, right there. Just yeah. uh, bottom side. You theoretically even could put it at the like debris field that kind of uh sections off that other base we do have the twilight council being scouted by the way by special obviously he's going to be happy to get that information it is a a deviation of the build though did not open up double reaper in this game it will in fact be the single reaper oh maples oh i hope he does not shade forward oh no okay, okay. i'm sure he saw the like the little crumple on the ground even with the adept shades mm. limited vision that, that's still enough to see that yeah uh, you're absolutely right. The Reaper is not going to be able to make its way further forward. The Adept tried to intercept the Reaper. It may still end up accidentally intercepting it. No, the Reaper hops up to the high ground at the perfect moment. He's able to evade that Adept for now. But we do have a Robo coming up behind this. A uh, Blink upgrade also being researched here for Maple. So a pretty stock standard looking setup as he is going to be oh. getting into just three gateways for now. That is a really funny little Widowmon right oh, there. Oh. This is... Wait, what? Oh, okay, okay. I, I saw him turn around and it like broke my brain for a second, even though I knew what it was <laughs> as it was happening. Well, actually, hang on. He's... Okay. I, I thought he was going to go in a little bit later with the Wood of Mine at the front, but it is going to be a six Marine Mine Drop, I assume, in the back. And he's going to maybe try and run into the main mineral line with that Wood of Mine and just tax mm. his opponent's multitasking. Oh, well. Yeah, he uh, saves well, the mine. That's yeah, not bad. Yeah. 
Yeah, Widowmine will uh, be able to get out of there alive for now. He does find a nice little opportunity to drop in over here, like you were saying, over at this natural. It's worth mentioning, four gate blink. There's going to be a fair number of stalkers popping on out soon, but blink is not finished up just quite yet. And he's trying to find the medevac. Ends up losing a stalker in the process. Is now losing a handful of these pros. Pros being pulled off the line to help fight. And he does eventually clean things up. But Widowmine also gets cleaned up over there as well. Liberator are going to be following up this aggression. But there is going to be a very dangerous time here for Special, where he's going to have been using all of these units to try and put on this pressure and try and take out economic damage on his opponent. But four gate blank soccer aggression is not something to, you know, take lightly. It is actually something that can very well end games. Yeah, it's really strong. And there's only one siege tank out at the moment. There will be another one in a moment behind that. Uh, can he blink stalkers to the right side and find an opening? Okay, well, Special's not going to check it regardless. Just going to retreat out with that Liberator. Uh, I will say that this is simultaneously a very big main base. A lot yeah. of surface area to cover. But also, because the bases are so close to one another, you can tuck those tanks in pretty far back. Yeah. And exactly to your point, you're already seeing one sea tank that was maybe covering a little bit past or just like a little bit past the entrance of the the main ramp and it's also covering a bit of the left hand side so you're already seeing that special is able to try to situate himself a little bit better for the angle that those stalkers try to blink in from there looks like maple's gonna try and rotate around and special is he gonna catch wind of this is he going to try to reposition he already has one sea shank ready position oh that is a big blink into the main base, eating a lot of damage on those Stalkers. Maple's going to try and do his best Max Packs impression and War Prism Micro with the Stalkers, but struggling a little bit here to get those important saves will be forced out. And I would say even with the loss of that Siege Tank, that was still very good for Special. Six Stalkers and a, uh, an Adept going down for four Marines and a Siege Tank. Oh, that is brutal. And... We're down to 39 workers, two workers being made at a time there for Maples. And he does have a third base about halfway finished up, even teching up to the Temple Archives. But he invested so much into going for that four gate blink stalker aggression. And I don't just mean in terms of actually going for the attack. I mean, the actual stalker losses are going to be brutal because now he's down to just nine stalkers. He's going to have a harder time actually dealing with any kind of counter aggression. So he's eventually going to have to start respecting that or play very greedy. It's a tough spot for Maples, and I think he has to make some very difficult gambles at this point to try and pull himself back in this game. Yeah, and I'm not even sure. I feel like the, the gamble he's kind of going for is going to be Storm. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like you, you're you probably going to try and just hope for some really huge storms to get you back into that game. But Special is just going to have such a significant advantage that I feel like the bio numbers, as long as he doesn't basically have everything completely clumped up underneath those storms, I, I feel like he can almost just kind of weather them a little bit with yeah. this big stim combat shields plus one weapons attack coming on. And if special gets here actually quick enough across the map, he'll hit just before storm. Actually, hold that thought. We got to drop into the nat or in, yeah, the natural. And this is where having so many of those stalkers oh, no. go down really hurts because he didn't even have enough stalkers to afford oh, having anything back at home. There it is. Yeah. GG gets called before the attack even makes its way across the map. Special claims victory in game number two, takes the series two to zero, and is uh, going to be in a much more comfortable spot in his group now. Yeah, that one. Oof, that one was a rough one for uh, Maples there. And you might be wondering, like, oh, why did he tap out? Like, he still had army. It's like, well, Storm was delayed. He knew the attack was coming. He knew he was kind of on a, a Hail Mary type of play with that Psy Storm. And Special calmly, methodically takes it down. Will put himself to 2-1. and one. And the next time he's playing, it is going to be for a playoff spot. Indeed he is. That's something to look forward to. And, uh, you know, Maples is not going to be out of it just yet. That is a very tough match to have in round three is facing off versus special but he's going to be playing at an elimination point in his next series but uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing more of him as we still got a couple more days of great starcraft coming our way for finishing up all the kind of group stages for the ept regionals yeah yeah this is going to be pretty cool to see uh i will be back myself tomorrow uh do you have any more days for the regionals 
I am going to be back on Sunday, I believe. Ah, very cool. The do or die Sunday for Europe. The, the closing out Sunday for round five. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that all of everything finishes up then? I think it's Asia, Europe, and North America. So oh, 12 wow. best of threes. That is going to be. I'm going to make be... sure that I eat that day. <laughs> unlike both of my other days that I've been doing this. That is quite a day. Uh, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow. I believe alongside... Well, we'll confirm it before I say, but I'm, I I will be alongside another commentator. Hopefully, uh, you know, I won't be having food poisoning to <laughs> overnight. Hopefully, we'll feel a little bit better. <laughs> but yeah, great day of games. Uh, we're going to be, well, we're going to be calling it for now. We will see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much for tuning in. I am Steadfast, and I've been joined by Fear Dragon. Stay safe and enjoy the matches tomorrow.